Billy, formerly known as the Crown Prince, had just arrived at Ambrosia Nightclub looking for Damon. Bubba had sent him. He walked in and sat down at the bar. He asked the bartender, Where's your boss? Billy was acting like he still owned the place. Damon, who'd been sitting at a table in the corner, stood up and came over. He smiled. Nice to see you again. What do you want? Billy glowered up at him. Bubba sent me. I have to talk to you about something. Damon sized him up. He wasn't sure if the guy was being serious, so he kept his guard up. Last time you came to my club, you attacked my men. Billy nodded. That's right, I did. I don't like being disobeyed. I told them to behave, but they didn't. What? Do you have a problem with that? Damon nodded, but he supposed that they were even. After all, he'd forced the guy to kill his own friends. Tell me, why did you come looking for me today? Billy raised his head and looked Damon in the eye. Bubbo wanted me to give you a message. If you're willing, he wants to form an alliance. Otherwise... Otherwise what? Damon asked calmly. Billy's eyes glinted fiercely. Otherwise, things could get messy. Myerson isn't big enough for the two of you. Damon stood up and said casually, I don't form alliances with dogs like you and Bubba. Billy knew that Damon was insulting them, so he smiled coldly. Do you really dare to refuse his offer? You think that's wise? You should be grateful that he's giving you another chance. In my opinion, you're the dog. At this point, the negotiation had completely collapsed. Damon grinned. Looks like you like being Bubba's errand boy, huh? Billy glared. You're making a mistake. Wait and see. Your days are numbered now. After saying this, Billy turned around and was about to leave, but Damon reached out and grabbed his shoulder. Why do you want to leave? This used to be your club. You should stay. It only makes sense. You still dare to provoke me? Billy was stunned. He hadn't thought that Damon would cause more trouble. This guy really didn't know what was good for him. What do you think? Damon stared at him with a fierce look in his eyes. I was going to let bygones be bygones, but then you came back here looking for trouble again. Damon twisted Billy's arm and smiled sinisterly. Let's teach this guy a lesson once and for all. Bruno, who was beside them, couldn't help but roar in anger. Damon waved his hand, and his employees ushered the few customers out of the club. Then they locked the door and a group of Damon's men surrounded Billy. Although Damon had bested him in the past, today the prince was not afraid. Last time he'd been drunk, and Damon had tricked him. This time, however, he was ready to fight. He laughed loudly. Ha ha ha! Very good, this time it will be a fair fight. Billy still didn't believe that Damon would dare do anything to him. After all, Bubba had sent him here, and the man's reputation was infamous in Meyerson. No matter how powerful you are, I will make you pay. You won't bother me anymore after today, Damon growled. He walked towards Billy. One of the prince's men stepped forward and tried to push him away. Unexpectedly, Damon reached up and grabbed the man's hand. Then he tripped him. Immediately, two of Damon's men came and restrained him. The lackey tried to break free, but Damon's men quickly took out knives and stabbed him. The prince roared angrily. His thug was rolling on the ground in pain. You're going to die, Billy shouted in rage. He charged towards Damon like a tiger pouncing on its prey. This was the moment that Damon had been waiting for. When Billy was sober, he was indeed fierce. However, Damon was fiercer, and he was also faster and stronger. Before his opponent could touch him, Damon had already struck him in the stomach. Billy felt as if he'd been struck by lightning. His internal organs seemed to have shifted positions. Then, Damon slapped him in the face. He felt as if he'd been struck with a hammer. His entire head felt like it was going to explode. Damon grabbed his hand and twisted, breaking the man's wrist. However, despite suffering such a severe injury, Billy didn't make a sound. Cold sweat beaded on his forehead. Billy's men were in trouble too. The prince hadn't expected Damon to actually attack him today. Usually, people stood down after hearing Bubba's name. He supposed he should have known better though. This hadn't intimidated Damon in the past. Unfortunately, because he hadn't expected to fight today, he'd brought only a few people with him. He'd planned to just leave if the negotiations broke down. He hadn't thought that this bastard would be crazy enough to attack him again. It was as if the guy wasn't afraid of Bubba at all. At this moment, Damon's men, who had been hiding in dark corners, rushed out and surrounded Billy's men. No one could escape. The audacity! No matter how angry Billy was, he had to face reality. Damon and his men were a lot stronger. At this moment, he was surrounded. Furthermore, Damon was brutal and merciless. Although he and his men were all good at fighting, they were outnumbered. Even a fierce tiger didn't stand a chance against a pack of wolves. 
Knives flashed and blood sprayed everywhere. Seeing the miserable states that his men were in, Billy saw red. He wanted to help them, but he didn't have the strength to fight Damon. In a short while, he was lying on the ground, injured as well. He growled. What's wrong with you? Only cowards ambush their enemies. Damon puffed his smoke and smiled. Look who's talking. You ambushed Wilder and his friends at the gym. Damon could be noble and just, but he could also be cruel and merciless. Billy was at a loss for words. If he fought back, Damon would crush him. The rest of his men were being beaten. After they finished with their enemies, Damon ordered his men to throw Billy and the others out. If they were lucky, they'd live. As for Billy, he had many broken bones. Afterwards, Damon's people cleaned up the club. As they worked, a young fellow named Sam asked worriedly, Since we beat up Bubba's guys today, won't there be problems? After all, Billy was Bubba's right-hand man. Bubba was the king of Meyerson, and he was a legend in the underworld. As for Damon and his gang, they weren't on the same level. They were just dabbling in crime, and they weren't career criminals. Now that Damon had beaten Billy for a second time, Bubba was sure to have a grudge against him. He wouldn't let it go so easily. If the crime boss came for Damon, it would be bad news. However, Damon didn't seem concerned. He smoked a cigarette and said, Sam, let me tell you, we're just trying to run a business. We don't want to cause trouble, but if anyone dares to provoke us, we will make them regret ever being born. Damon wouldn't forgive the crown prince for what he'd done. Even if Bubba hadn't sent him back here today, Damon would still have found him. They had unfinished business together. If Damon hadn't settled the score, people would look down on him. No, it was better to fight fair and square. When Sam thought about this, it made sense. He made up his mind. It was better to die with dignity than to live life as a coward. Some things were more important than life. The following days were peaceful. Drew had been the one behind all the trouble, and now that Park Corp was finished, he was out of the picture. He, his uncle, and his father were all being investigated and sentenced. Even Mr. Goodbest was going to jail. Bubba was implicated in the mess as well, so he didn't have time to bother with Damon for now. As for the Crown Prince, Billy, Damon had beat him up again, and he didn't dare to come looking for revenge. Although the problems with Drew had ended, Drew and Hans had spent a lot of money trying to sink Damon's company. A dark cloud hung over Everbright. It was going to be difficult for the company to recover from its fall. After everything calmed down, Damon could finally relax. He didn't have to waste time worrying about what his enemies were up to. Early Sunday morning, Avery came to meet him. She called to ask him to come downstairs. When Damon saw her, she had a pink bicycle. Her hair was tied in a ponytail and she was wearing a white dress with a hint of lace. She looked playful and sexy. Damon couldn't help but notice the fair skin of her neck and legs. She was beautiful in the sunlight. Even with the sunglasses on, Avery couldn't hide her stunning beauty. Since falling in love with Damon, Avery looked even more attractive than before. To please him, she put extra effort into her appearance. Her figure was perfect, and her skin was flawless. She wore sunglasses because she was afraid that others would recognize her, but she still attracted attention everywhere she went. She stood outside the building, waiting. All the men who walked by turned to stare. This woman was too stunning to be real. She was a natural beauty. However, Avery wasn't smiling. She had a distant look on her face. None of the guys who found her attractive dared to go up and hit on her. Which among them stood a chance with this goddess? The answer was soon revealed. When Damon appeared, Avery's icy expression melted and she broke into a beautiful smile. Her smile was charming and shy. It was sweet and happy. Obviously, she was in love. Avery ran over and buried her head in Damon's arms. Ignoring the envious and hopeless gazes of the surrounding guys, she gently asked, What took you so long? I came as soon as you called, Damon replied helplessly. He'd even put his shoes on as he walked. Was he not fast enough? Avery's face turned red. Actually, she'd been waiting only a minute or two, but to her it felt like an eternity. However, she was too embarrassed to say what she was thinking. A whole day without seeing him was torture. Avery took his hand and they went to the cafeteria to eat. After that, he asked Damon to come shopping with her that afternoon. She wanted to buy some clothes. Avery was a careful woman. She realized that Damon hadn't bought himself many new clothes during the past two years. In fact, he'd never liked to go clothes shopping. He did it only out of necessity. If he could have it his way, he'd happily continue wearing his worn out Adidas sweats. Unfortunately, people would judge him for it. Fiona bought most of his wardrobe for him while they were still together. 
but now Fiona was gone, and the clothes that she'd bought for him were also starting to look a little worn. They didn't have holes in them, though, so he could still wear them. Pookie, can you take me to Weston Mall to stroll around? Avery asked. Weston Mall? I don't know that place. Why don't you lead the way? Damon replied. She was stunned. If she remembered correctly, the brand Damon usually wore was sold only in a shop in Weston Mall. So how come he hadn't heard of the place before? She could not help but ask. Then where did you buy your clothes? Avery waited to hear how he'd respond. She already knew that Fiona had bought most of his clothes, but she wanted to hear him say it. He didn't know what to say, but Avery was smart, and she guessed the answer. She smirked. Fiona bought them for you, right? Damon helplessly admitted it. Avery frowned. She suddenly felt angry. Usually, she wasn't a petty person. Moreover, she had always been very open-minded towards Damon and Fiona. However, hearing him admit that he was still wearing the clothes Fiona bought for him hit a nerve. She was afraid that they would remind him of his ex. She was afraid that one day, Fiona would come back and they'd rekindle their relationship. If that happened, Avery would lose him forever. She wanted to buy new clothes for him. That way, when he wore them, he'd think of her. Avery and Damon were going clothes shopping. Fiona had purchased most of Damon's wardrobe, and when Avery discovered this, she was upset. She didn't want her boyfriend thinking about his ex anymore. Weston Mall was near campus, so Damon rode Avery's bike and she sat on the back. The spring breeze gently blew her ponytail. As they rode, she hugged Damon tightly. She felt his heart beating, and it filled her with joy. When they arrived at the mall, Avery dragged Damon to the men's clothing section and bought five or six new outfits for him. No matter how open-minded she was, she still didn't like the idea of her boyfriend wearing the clothes that his ex had bought him. Damon didn't protest, he just tried things on in the fitting room. After donning the new clothes, he looked radiant. Avery's eyes lit up when she saw him. Even though she hadn't seen him many times before, she blushed when she saw him wearing his new threads. She thought that he looked very handsome and stylish. He was the most charming guy she knew. Watching him, her heart beat a little faster. After they were tired of shopping, Avery and Damon sat down on a bench in the mall. She gently leaned her head on his shoulder and looked up at him. She hugged him tight as if she were afraid that he'd disappear. Suddenly, she remembered something. She took out an exquisite handmade bracelet from her bag and gave it to him. The bracelet had a heart on it and the name Avery was embroidered across it. Looking at the bracelet, Damon could only imagine how much effort she'd put into making it. Only someone like Avery would go through the trouble. It was a symbol of her love. Wow, did you make this? He couldn't help but ask. He was amazed that she could make something so beautiful. She smiled shyly. Yes, I did. It took me all week. Then she asked with anticipation, Do you like it? Yes, Damon replied. Help me put it on. After walking around for a while, the couple began to get hungry for dinner. Avery had already made reservations for them at a restaurant. Damon hadn't expected this. She brought them to a rather romantic restaurant and they enjoyed a delicious dinner. Afterwards, Avery said that she was tired and she didn't want to go anywhere. She looked at him expectantly with her big, beautiful eyes, like she was hinting at something. He smelled her sweet perfume, and he felt her body pressing against him. His heart skipped a beat as he suggested, How about we get a room and rest? We've only been on a couple of dates. It's sort of soon, isn't it? She replied with some hesitation. However, when she saw his eager expression, she changed her mind. Okay, let's do it. But we have to take things slow, okay? Of course, Damon's mind was already running wild. Fiona had said something similar to him the time that they'd gotten a hotel room, but in the end, they'd gone all the way together. Besides, it wasn't like this was he and Avery's first time. The two of them found a hotel nearby. The hotel was next to a river, and their room had huge floor-to-ceiling windows. They had a great view of the city. Night had fallen, and the city lights were so bright and beautiful that it was hard to describe in words. We don't have to stay here if you don't want to, Avery said. I'm not tired anymore. It's already past eight o'clock. We may as well just spend the night, Damon replied casually. Okay, she lowered her head shyly. Yes, let's stay here tonight. After saying this, she was silent. At this moment, they were alone together. They both felt a little awkward as if they were anticipating what would happen next. Damon longed to be close to her again. He couldn't stop thinking about what they'd done together that night on the bridge. Damon had never done anything like that before. Now the thought of being with Avery again was incredibly tempting. Thinking about what might happen later, Damon became very excited. Avery saw him looking at her, and naturally she knew what he was thinking. 
Although she also felt eager, she continued playing hard to get. She pouted her lips at him and teased. But you have to take it slow, okay? That's what we agreed on before we got here. Yes, of course. He quickly nodded his head. Shall we watch TV? Avery suggested. She wanted to ease the tension. He nodded. Then he remembered that the University League basketball tournament was currently underway. It was probably being aired on the local channel. He quickly turned on the TV. Sure enough, the basketball tournament was in full swing. Meyerson University was playing Capital University. Avery didn't care what they watched. While Damon watched the game, she snuggled in his arms. She felt very satisfied. When they tuned into the game, it was already the fourth quarter. The competition was very intense and the score was 56 to 50 for Capital University. Meyerson University was losing. In general, people weren't optimistic about Meyerson's chances of winning the tournament. As a newcomer to the league, Meyerson's team was at a disadvantage. Capital University had a strong team. They had even made it to the finals last year. The team's core lineup was basically unchanged, so the consensus was that Meyerson University didn't stand much of a chance. However, they were only six points behind. They'd managed to hold their own, and this was pretty impressive. Theo and Xander were the strongest players on the team. They'd clearly improved a lot. Damon had coached them as well, which made a difference. With Damon's guidance, Theo and Xander's skills had reached the next level. Now they were the core players on their team. They were tenacious and unyielding. One minute remained in the game. Xander and Theo suddenly sprung into action. Xander scored three points in one go, and Theo scored two more on the rebound. The score was now 55 to 56. They needed one more basket to win the game. There were only 30 seconds left. Capital University had the ball, and they were trying to run down the clock. Finally, only 10 seconds remained. Capital took a shot, but the player missed. Only five seconds remained. Meyerson needed to score to win the game. Theo took the ball and passed it to Xander. Xander dribbled down the court. At this time, it was all up to him. If he scored, his team would win. If he didn't, they would lose. The opposing team's defense was tight. Xander hesitated slightly at this critical moment, but he still managed to pass the ball to Theo. Theo suddenly took a step back and evaded the person who was covering him. Then, he unexpectedly changed direction and turned around. He dodged the last person in his way and slam dunked. He'd executed the move perfectly. It was miraculous. Meyerson University won the game by one point. The buzzer rang, signaling that the game was over. Meyerson University had won. The cheerleaders ran onto the court. The Capital University players looked unhappy. When Damon saw this wonderful play, he could not help but applaud. Avery didn't care about basketball, but she was happy because Damon was happy. She pursed her lips and gave him a sweet, wet kiss. Afterwards, a reporter interviewed the players. Capital University was interviewed first. The team captain faced the camera and said helplessly, I thought we were going to win today, but the other team made some amazing plays. All in all, those guys are lucky. Skills are important, but luck also plays a role. The captain thought that his team should have won. They were a better team than Meyerson. Although he admitted defeat, he blamed it on bad luck. Next, the reporters interviewed the Meyerson team. Theo was interviewed first. He had just won the game. It was extremely exciting. At this moment, they replayed the clip of his final slam dunk. It was a skillful move and it could definitely be considered the best play of the year. The reporter asked, Theo, your basketball skills have improved by leaps and bounds this year. What's your secret? Capital University is a strong team, so they pushed us to do our best. We had to be outstanding to defeat them. Theo grinned into the camera. Just now, Capital University's captain said that your team got lucky. What do you think about that? Theo was stunned for a moment. Then he shook his head. No, I think people have the wrong idea about Meyerson University. In fact, we are a very strong team. You may think that I'm just talking big, but it's true. Some of the best, strongest, and fiercest players in our school aren't even on the team. If they were, no one would question us. Hearing this stunned reporter, What do you mean? Are you saying that there are basketball players at Meyerson University who are more skilled than you? But your coach said that you're the best of the best. It's hard to imagine that there are stronger players than you out there. I'm not joking. To be honest, the person who I'm talking about is my idol. He trained me, and that's why I improved so quickly. Remember my winning basket? Let me tell you something. He taught me that move. I was able to pull it off, but when you see him do it, he moves effortlessly. He's the strongest basketball player that I've ever known. He's better than my coaches. 
and he's even better than the pros. He's amazing. It was hard to imagine what kind of player could receive such high praise from Theo. The reporter didn't believe him, so she started interviewing Xander instead. He was the other star player on the team, so naturally he was also at the press conference. Is what Theo said true? The reporter asked. Xander nodded. That's right. The best player at our school isn't here today. If he came, the game would have been a shutout. He's our idol and neither of us can beat him. Since Xander confirmed his friend's statement, the reporter finally began to believe them. Because Theo and Xander were some of the strongest players in the league, it was hard to imagine just how skilled their idol was. Then why didn't this player participate in the tournament? If he's really as amazing as you guys say, he would be the star of the court. Xander thought for a while and then slowly said, Because his talents are not only limited to basketball, he's also achieved great things in the business world. I'm sorry, he wouldn't want me to say his name, but he already is quite famous in that respect. Xander looked a little helpless as he said this. It was awkward to admit that someone who only dabbled in the sport was more skilled than he was. How could he not feel helpless? But in the end, it didn't really matter. All Xander could do was try his best and keep practicing. Maybe one day he'd be as skilled as his idol. Naturally, Damon and Avery knew who Xander and Theo were talking about. Furthermore, Avery recognized Theo's winning move. She'd seen Damon use the exact same move on the court before. At that time, Theo had even asked him for guidance. Damon hadn't expected his friend to pick up the move so quickly and use it in actual gameplay. When Avery heard Theo and Xander praising Damon on camera, she felt proud. Theo's success was further proof of Damon's skill. The man beside her was powerful, both on and off the court. Not only was he skilled at basketball, but he was also skilled in bed. Avery thought about what had happened that night on the bridge, and she smiled to herself. It was really wonderful. Every time she thought of that night, she blushed and her heart beat faster. She yearned to do it again. She thought about what might happen next. She and Damon were spending the night together in a hotel. Desire filled her, and she pressed her body against his. Feeling her snuggle closer, Damon turned off the TV and gave her a hug. It's late, let's go to sleep. Avery knew what was going to happen next. She wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him passionately. This was taking it slow, right? Pookie, I might be going to LA in a few days. I signed a contract with Tony Music Entertainment. If I'm not here, will you miss me? Damon nodded. He'd spent so much time with her lately that he'd almost forgotten about Fiona. Avery blushed. She bit her lip. Oh, and while I'm gone, you're not allowed to flirt with other women, okay? Let's make tonight unforgettable. Don't worry. Damon hugged her. Come on. Show me how much you're going to miss me, she teased. She was getting impatient, and she beckoned him toward her. Damon pounced like a tiger. Damon and Avery spent the night at a hotel together. When they woke up the next day, the window was wet with morning dew. It was spring and flowers were blooming. Avery stretched lazily. When her hand grazed Damon's perfect body, she immediately felt awake. He was still sleeping, so she snuggled closer and wrapped her fair and beautiful legs around his. She hugged him tight, as if she were afraid of losing him. When she thought about last night, she blushed and her heart beat faster. Even she herself didn't know what had overcome her. Damon had ignited a fire within her. She pursed her lips, wanting to kiss Damon as he slept. Unexpectedly, just as her lips touched him, he rolled over and hugged her. He pulled her close and kissed her back. Avery was so enraptured that she almost couldn't breathe. She closed her eyes and allowed him to do whatever he wanted to her. Later that morning, the two of them finally got out of bed and washed up. The day was Sunday. Avery asked Damon if he had any plans. If he did, she would come along. He didn't have plans, so he suggested they go do something fun. Avery had lived a sheltered life. She never dared to go to places like bars. However, with Damon by her side, it was a different story. She wanted to experience new things with her sweetheart. She wanted to see a new side of Meyerson. They went back to campus and Avery got her little Buick. She drove them to a bar called Nightlife. This bar was quite famous in Meyerson. The main thing was that Damon owned it now. In the past, the Crown Prince had been in charge of the place. However, since Damon bested him, this place was under his jurisdiction now. As one of the famous bars in Meyerson, many big stars hung out there. Avery was a star herself and she kept her sunglasses on to disguise her identity. When she pulled up at the bar, she saw that the parking lot was full of luxury cars. She went to park at the curb by the building front, but a security guard with a buzz cut shouted loudly, Keep driving, keep driving, this isn't a parking space. Did you hear me? Keep driving. 
so Avery had no choice but to park in the lot across the road. After that, she and Damon walked back across the street. Suddenly, a Toyota sped through the nearby intersection, running the red light. The driver didn't show any sign of slowing for the pedestrians. Instead, he honked the horn wildly, indicating that they should get out of the way. Avery was so scared that she screamed and instinctively hid in Damon's arms. Damon put his arm around her waist as he glared at the Toyota in anger. The driver for the Toyota was very overbearing. He kept honking and honking. At the same time, he stuck his bald head out of the window and cursed. You bastard, do you want to die? Damon was just about to go and teach the guy a lesson when a police car drove by. The bald man quickly ducked his head back into his car and stepped on the accelerator. Damon didn't chase him. The man was just a coward who liked to bully others. However, when Damon inadvertently glanced back at the Toyota, he saw it turning into the bar's parking lot. He watched as the Toyota pulled up at the curb where Avery had tried to park earlier. However, this time, the security guard just nodded politely. He let the bald man park there. This was absurd. Why was this guy getting preferential treatment? After the man parked his car, he got out and went around to open the passenger door. A woman wearing heavy makeup got out. She turned her head and caught sight of Damon. A look of surprise flashed in her eyes, and then she smiled disdainfully. Was that Lily? Damon wasn't sure at first, but after he took another look, he recognized her. The smile on her face was still as beautiful as before, but something about her had changed. She ignored Damon and proudly walked into the bar with the bald man. If Lily remembered correctly, her ex-boyfriend had beaten Damon badly. It had happened back when they were both still in high school. Her ex had beaten him up and thrown him into the lake. However, here he was in Meyerson, unharmed. Lily was slightly surprised. Had he come back to life? However, there was probably an easier explanation. Damon must have recovered from his injuries and come to Meyerson for work. The thought that Damon was a student at Meyerson University never crossed her mind. He was brave and fierce, but he wasn't very clever. All he could do was fight. No, Damon had probably come to Meyerson to work construction or something like that. Lily hadn't done well on her SATs, so she hadn't gone to university. Despite this, she still considered herself to be above a loser like Damon. She dated Noah for a while, but then he dumped her. After they broke up, she came to Meyerson to work at a call center, but later she used her looks to get a job at a bar. That's where she'd gotten to know Tyler Jackson, the driver of the Toyota. In the past, Tyler had worked for a gangster named the Crown Prince. He'd run a casino and a place that gave high interest loans. He was very powerful. Since he'd started seeing Tyler, Lily had stopped working. At least she didn't have to waste her time slaving away for minimum wage anymore. Every day she drove around in Tyler's car and hung out with him and his friends. It was undoubtedly a superior lifestyle. At this moment, when she saw Damon, she thought about what a loser he was. If she'd stayed with him, she never would have amounted to anything. Tyler and Lily walked into the bar. After they were gone, Avery went over to the security guard who'd stopped her from parking in front of the building. Hey, didn't you just say that this wasn't a parking space? Why are you letting that guy park here? The guard looked at Avery like she was crazy. He didn't care what she thought. Who did this woman think she was? Damon walked over, smoking a cigarette. Hey, my girlfriend asked you a question. Why didn't you let us park there? The guard smirked. Screw off. Who do you think you are? I'll give the parking spot to whoever I want. Damon was annoyed. He wanted to tell the man to say that again, but Avery pulled him away. She was afraid that he would be at a disadvantage if a fight broke out. After all, bars like this usually had gang connections. Although she knew that he could fight, she was afraid that something bad would happen to him. When they went inside the bar, they saw countless young men and women flirting on the dark dance floor. Although Avery was in her 20s, it was the first time that she'd come to a place like this. She blushed and held Damon's hand tightly. Lily and Tyler were standing near the dance floor. They were drinking and chatting with a group of people. Tyler squinted his eyes from time to time and looked towards Damon and Avery. He recognized Damon from outside and he wasn't happy with him. Additionally, he found Avery very attractive. Compared to her, Lily was just a plain Jane. Even though Avery was wearing sunglasses, she couldn't hide her beauty. Tyler was practically drooling over her. Lily also noticed Avery. She knew that he'd arrived with Damon, so she smirked. Her ex was in trouble. Tyler had his eye on Avery, and he always got what he wanted. Although Lily and Tyler were together, he often picked up other women. She'd gotten used to it. Now she just wanted to see Damon get humiliated. He was going to lose his woman again. As expected, 
an opportunity arose. After Damon drank a couple beers, he went to the bathroom. Avery was looking around curiously and she saw Tyler. He nodded to his friend who smiled slyly. Then he took his drink and sauntered over to Avery. Hey, beautiful, are you drinking alone? Avery glanced at him and turned away, not wanting to be bothered. He laughed. <laughs> You're some character. Damn, I like it. Hey, all my friends want to get to know you. Do you want to meet them? Avery looked in the direction that he gestured and he saw a group of guys leering at her. She frowned and said coldly, Go away. Why are you being so rude? Tyler's expression changed instantly. How dare you reject me? Do you know who I am? Avery hadn't expected him to flip so quickly. She was shocked. What do you want? What do you think, damn it? He swore and went to make a move on her. Avery was so scared that she backed away. She didn't want this sleazebag to touch her. At this, the guy became even more interested. Hey, calm down, darling. Let me buy you a drink. Go, leave me alone. She used all her strength to push him away. Tyler was angry now. How dare you? No one says no to me. Damon returned from the bathroom in the nick of time. Seeing him, Avery ran over screaming. Help me, get this guy away from me. Damon quickly walked over to the man. Tyler wasn't afraid and said rudely, What are you going to do? You can't touch me. Damon punched him in the face. Get lost. He'd beat up everyone in the bar if he had to. He really hated people like this. Avery quickly hid behind him. She was panicking. However, Tyler was on the ground. Naturally, he was furious. I'm going to kill you. He jumped to his feet. Lily and the others were watching from across the room. Damon was in trouble now. Tyler was going to kill him. She crossed her arms over her chest and waited to see Damon get beaten up. Tyler was furious. Damn it, let's take this outside, now. Damon didn't listen though. One of Tyler's friends came at him from behind, but he turned around and kicked him in the stomach. The guy collapsed on the spot. Lily, who had expected to see Damon get beaten up, was stunned. Although she knew that he had been brave and fierce back in high school, she hadn't expected him to act so bold here in Meyerson. Besides feeling surprised, she also felt that she had underestimated him. When the rest of the guys saw Damon disobeying Tyler's orders, they all became furious. A few of them picked up bottles and rushed towards him. Avery was so frightened that she cried out in alarm. Be careful! However, Damon wasn't afraid of these people. Seeing them rushing toward him, he picked up a bottle and threw it at them. Damon knocked one of them out on the spot, and he fell to the floor unconscious. The guy behind him tripped over his friend in confusion. The remaining men rushed over, but Damon picked up a stool and swung it at a guy's head. His opponent fell to the ground with a miserable cry. The other two guys tried to grab him, but he knocked them out too. They fell to the ground on his left and right. In no time at all, Damon had taken care of Tyler and his friends. Lily looked at him in surprise. Until now, she hadn't known how good he was at fighting. Since that was the case, why had Noah beaten him up so easily before? Without a doubt, Damon had exceeded her expectations tonight. Tyler also hadn't expected Damon to defeat his men in just a few moves. He was a strong fighter. However, Tyler and Lily weren't worried. Tyler was the leader of a gang, and he had a lot of power and influence in these parts. He had at least a hundred men under him. No matter how strong Damon was, it would be difficult for him to win if Tyler called in reinforcements. Therefore, the gangsters laughed. Ha <laughs> damn, is that guy a black belt? No wonder he dared to bring such a beautiful woman to a place like this. Damon looked coldly at Lily. He felt as if he were looking at a stranger. Then, he turned to Tyler and said domineeringly, Kneel down and beg for mercy. Perhaps I'll go easy on you. The gangster looked surprised. Was this some sort of joke? Was this guy actually asking Tyler to kneel down and beg for mercy? Was this a mistake? Lily was the first to speak. She pointed at Tyler and said fiercely, Damon, when did you become so bold? How dare you speak in such a tone? Do you know who he is? Damon pretended to be puzzled. Lily stuck out her chest proudly. Listen carefully. This is Tyler, and he's the leader of a gang. How dare you challenge him? Tyler realized that Lily knew Damon and asked curiously, Who is he? She looked at her ex with disgust and then said sweetly, My dear, he is just a piece of trash. We went to high school together. He's a nobody. Damon had just beaten up Tyler's friends. Tyler realized that Lily knew Damon, so he asked her about him. She told him about how they'd gone to high school together, but she didn't admit that they dated. That would be too shameful. Tyler nodded his head in agreement. You're right, that guy is a piece of trash. Then, 
they heard the sound of footsteps approaching. The bar's security guards were coming to see what all the commotion was about. A group of men wearing black barged in. The leader of the guards was the same man who had stopped Avery from parking out front. His expression was extremely ugly. What's going on? Tyler put his arm around Lily and pointed at Damon. That loser is causing trouble. Do you want me to deal with him or will you? The guard replied. Hold on, let me explain. Lily smiled wanly. Damon, why aren't you begging for mercy? Do you want Jenkins to break both your legs? Jenkins, huh? I'd like to see him try. Damon smirked disdainfully. The guard glared at him. You're asking for it. Before he could finish his words, Damon kicked him in the face. This is payback for what happened earlier. Jenkins went flying across the room. Lily screamed in fear. Ah, hurry up, you bunch of losers. Teach the piece of trash a lesson. Although technically Damon owned the club now, none of the security guards knew this. When they saw Tyler being beaten up, they rushed forward. However, without exception, Damon knocked them all down. At first, Avery was a little afraid for her boyfriend, but after seeing him deal with his opponents so swiftly, she relaxed. However, she was still concerned that this group of hoodlums might pull out weapons. You're useless. You bunch are really useless. How can you call yourselves men? You can't even beat up a piece of trash. Seeing that the guards couldn't defeat a loser like Damon, Lily became furious. Tyler was also angry when he saw how well Damon could fight. He was upset with Lily for making a scene and he scolded. Shut up, you're just making things worse. Hearing this, Lily was stunned. After that, she didn't say anything. She was afraid that Tyler would break up with her. Without him, she'd be nothing. Avery heard Lily being publicly humiliated and she couldn't help but laugh out loud. Since Lily didn't dare to comment on the fight anymore, she scolded Avery instead. What are you laughing at, bitch? If you continue to laugh, I will come over there and shut you up myself. She started coming toward Avery, but Avery wouldn't stoop to her level. She hid behind Damon. Lily went to grab Damon's hand, but just as she touched him, he pushed her away. She pointed at him and shouted, Don't lay your hands on me, you piece of trash. You'll regret it. Wait and see. How dare you push the girlfriend of a gang leader? You're in for it now. At that moment, as if in response to her threat, countless motorcycles pulled up outside. Everyone in the bar heard the roar of the engines and headlights shone through the windows. In the glare of the lights, everyone's expressions looked even more ferocious. Lily cheered, they're here, they're here. Tyler smiled vulgarly, damn it, now neither of you will escape. Tyler's friends had called for backup. By the looks of things, it had arrived. Provoking their gang was simply asking for trouble. Sure enough, a group of people arrogantly walked into the bar. When they did, the whole place fell silent. The young people on the dance floor looked over and saw the group of extremely imposing thugs. The man in front was at least 200 pounds and over six feet tall. His chest was bare and it was covered with scars. He looked like the devil. Seeing backup arrive, Lily cried out excitedly, Damon, just you wait, you're in trouble now. The security guard said, Tyler, did you call these guys? However, the guard didn't look happy. Tyler looked at the newcomers with a blank expression. Obviously, he didn't know them. Judging from their demeanors, they definitely weren't messing around. Damon didn't know who they were either. Avery hid behind him and nervously tugged his sleeve. The leader strode over and nodded to Damon in front of everyone. Boss, sorry we are late. Did these bastards insult you? I'm sorry that happened. Damon was curious about where these thugs had come from. The man scratched his head and explained, Oh, right, I forgot to introduce myself. I work for Bruno. My name is Dusty. One of my friends saw you come in and recognized you. He called and told me that a bunch of ignorant scumbags were giving you trouble. When I heard about it, I quickly gathered all my men and rushed over. Leave the scumbags to us. Who dared to mess with his boss? Anyone who did would discover the true meaning of pain. Damon had heard of the man before from Bruno. Bruno was loyal to him, and he had many men under his command. He always had Damon's back. Avery, who was behind him, heaved a sigh of relief. Since these were Damon's men, she didn't need to worry. At the same time, she began to wonder how her boyfriend knew these guys. Tyler and Lily's expressions turned ugly. Were these thugs here to help their opponent? What was going on? Tyler cast a puzzled look at Lily. Didn't she just say this guy was a loser from out of town? Why did he suddenly have so many underworld connections? Lily's face was pale. Since when did Damon know people like this? Was this still the same loser who she knew from New York City? What had happened to him? 
Dusty turned to glare at Tyler. Bruno's been wanting to teach you a lesson. Now that the Crown Prince's reign is over, you're not welcome here anymore. Bruno was planning to let you be for a few more days, but then you came looking for trouble. Tyler's heart skipped a beat. When he heard Bruno's name, he felt a little scared. Lily hid behind him and didn't dare to come out. Who dares to attack our leader? You have a death wish, Dusty shouted. While this was happening, another group of gangsters riding motorcycles arrived. Although they were not as fierce looking as Dusty and his men, there were a lot of them. A man with a buzz cut holding a knife jumped off his bike and walked into the bar. Tyler saw him come in and he was very happy. Ziggy, you're finally here! Any later and I'd be dead! Ziggy spat on the ground and walked over with his head held high and his chest puffed out. However, the last time he'd fought Damon's men, he lost. He'd even been badly injured. Now he walked with a limp. Behind him was a large group of men. They were all members of the Hell Riders gang. Since Damon defeated Ziggy at the old junkyard, the gangster had disappeared without a trace. Damon hadn't expected him to secretly join the Hell Riders. Initially, Ziggy had planned to join forces with the Crown Prince in an attempt to get back his territory. However, Damon had ruined that plan too. An instant later, Dusty's men were surrounded by Hell Riders. Dusty's expression changed. He turned to Damon. Boss, don't worry. The rest of my men will be here soon. We will deal with these troublemakers. You should leave now. What's wrong? Do you want to run away? Tyler mocked. He wasn't afraid anymore. You think you stand a chance against us? You're outnumbered. We're going to kill you. Ziggy turned and shouted. Yeah, you don't stand a chance. Lily pointed at Damon. Get that guy. He attacked our friends. Damn it. Ziggy cursed. When he finally recognized Damon, he was so scared that he almost fell over. He looked like he had seen a ghost. Damon, on the other hand, smiled. I didn't think you had the balls to show your face around here again. So you're a member of the Hell Riders now, huh? Ziggy's eyes widened and he stammered. It's, it, it's, it's you. Are you surprised? The gangster's legs went limp. He still remembered Damon's terrifying power. He'd hoped that the Crown Prince would defeat him and make a comeback. Unfortunately, the man turned out to be useless. Ziggy had experience dealing with Damon. He knew that the guy was not only fierce, but also smart. He was a student at Myerson University. He was more cultured than the average gangster. Ziggy knew all about this guy. Of all the people in the world, why had Tyler gone and provoked him? Ziggy was so scared that he began to tremble. He sat down on the ground. Seeing this, Tyler was furious. What the heck are you doing? What the hell are you afraid of? In the past, Ziggy was a powerful gangster, but now he is being scolded by this puny loser. Ziggy was so scared that he couldn't speak, but he couldn't exactly say this out loud, could he? How would he survive if others found out about this? His mouth even started to twitch. He knew he was acting crazy. Ziggy knew Damon's identity, but Tyler didn't. Tyler ignored him and ordered, Surround that guy! You're asking for trouble. Do you know who he is? Dusty threatened. He defeated the crown prince. Don't you know our boss? He was trying to stop the battle before it started. If this guy really defeated the crown prince, he could only be one person. Tyler looked at Damon with fear in his eyes. This guy was the new boss of the territory. He had money and many loyal men. Even Bubba had suffered huge losses because of this man. Tyler's gang couldn't compare. The most they could hope for was to pay off Damon's men to leave them alone. Because Damon liked to keep a low profile, not many people knew who he was. After defeating the Crown Prince, he'd gone back to his life as a student, so he remained relatively anonymous in the criminal underworld. Although everyone had heard of his reputation, few people recognized him. However, now Tyler understood. No wonder Ziggy had gone crazy when he saw Damon. It turned out that this was no ordinary guy. However, Tyler was the leader of a gang and he'd seen blood before. Since he had already offended Damon, it was too late. He had nothing left to lose. He laughed arrogantly. <laughs> Damn, you think you're so great just because you defeated the crown prince? Don't be so proud of yourself. Sooner or later, Bubba will take you down. Let's see how long you last. No one had ever offended Bubba and lived to tell the tale. Besides, Tyler had a lot of people on his side at the moment, so he wasn't afraid. In the worst case scenario, he could just run away and never set foot in this part of town again. What could Damon really do to him? Unfortunately, 
Tyler underestimated his opponent. At this moment, Dusty received a phone call. After he hung up, he smiled hideously. You think you're pretty awesome, huh? Just you wait, you'll see what happens. As if in response to Dusty's words, cars began pulling up outside. The sound of their engines shook the entire bar. A security guard rushed in from outside and whispered something to Jenkins. The man's expression changed dramatically. He looked at Damon in shock as if he had just heard the most ridiculous thing in the world. It turned out that dozens of cars had pulled up outside. Nearly a hundred men jumped out of the cars, and they were all armed with weapons. They'd blocked all the doors to the bar. Seconds later, a group of burly men rushed in. Dusty was overjoyed when he saw them. Come quickly, our boss is over here. The leader of the group was a man with a big beard. He also worked for Bruno. Everyone called him Knuckles. When he realized that Damon knew his boss, he quickly came over and greeted him. Sorry I'm late, are you alright? The entire room fell silent. So this young man in his early 20s was indeed the new boss of the territory. These people had rushed over to protect him. Those who knew the stories about him quaked in their boots. Lily, Tyler, and their friends were all shocked. Now that Knuckles had arrived with over a hundred people, Tyler was terrified. Compared to this, the Hell Riders were nothing. Tyler's men edged away from him. They weren't going to throw their lives away for him. Except for the few core members of the gang, none were very good at fighting. Jenkins also shrank back in fear. He wanted to call the police, but he didn't have the guts. Lily, on the other hand, was in even worse shape. She was so scared that she was trembling. She stammered, but she couldn't speak. No one was more shocked than she was. In her mind, Damon had always been a loser with no money. She didn't think him clever either. He was handsome and he knew how to fight, but that was all he had going for him. Lily had humiliated him many times before and she'd wanted to do it again today. Unfortunately, the guy who she had always looked down upon was now a crime boss. Lily didn't really know what this meant, but her boyfriend, Tyler, did. He was a gangster himself, and he'd heard the stories about Damon. What made Lily even more nervous was the fact that she had offended her ex. She couldn't take back what she'd said. What should she do? Would he kill her? No, she didn't want to die yet. She wanted to hide behind Tyler, but she realized that this was pointless. Then, Dusty came over, pulled Tyler into a corner, and began to beat him up. Lily watched her boyfriend get beat within an inch of his life. Thinking fast, she went over to Damon. She began to plead. Do you remember the past? We were once together. I was your girlfriend. Please don't hurt me. Lily's pride no longer mattered to her. She just wanted to get out of here alive. When Lily realized how serious the situation was, she swallowed her pride and begged Damon to spare her. She hoped to awaken his memories of the past. That way, perhaps he'd take pity on her and let her go. Of course, if she could reignite his feelings for her, that would be even better. She'd left him because she thought he was a poor loser, but it was different now. He'd become a fierce crime boss. Additionally, he was a lot more handsome than Tyler. Lily remembered how well Damon had treated her back when they were together. She thought if she played her cards right, she could get him back. However, Avery, who was hiding behind Damon, wasn't pleased. This woman was two-faced. How dare she try to cozy up to Damon now? Avery knew all about what had happened between Lily and Damon back in high school. She shouted, Who do you think you are? How shameless! Go away! Damon was hers. He was her most precious treasure, and she'd never allow another woman to touch him, especially not Lily. How dare you! Lily's expression instantly changed. In any other situation, she would have jumped on Avery. But today, she had no choice but to lower her head. She gave her ex a pained look. Damon, have you forgotten about our past? Do you have the heart to watch this bitch bully me? In an attempt to win his sympathy, she even squeezed out a few tears. Damon watched her performance with a smirk on his face. After a few seconds, he asked, Are you finished? But... She felt that something in his expression wasn't right. Sure enough, he looked at her indifferently and then gave her a cold smile. We don't know each other anymore. Don't talk to me. You said yourself that I'm a piece of trash. What? You made your bed. Now lie in it. With each word he said, Lily's expression became uglier. In the end, she finally just sat down on the ground. She didn't have anything else to say. It was over. It was all over. Avery looked around for Jenkins, the security guard. Earlier, 
She'd wanted to park out front, but this guy had stopped her. He looked very unhappy at the moment. Avery went over and stood proudly in front of him. It's Jenkins, right? Next time, are you going to let me park out front? Yes, ma'am, you can park wherever you want. He shrunk away fearfully. He realized that he'd made a huge mistake, and he hoped that this ferocious young man would forgive his ignorance. As Jenkins thought of this, he felt anxious. However, Damon had no interest in dealing with any of these people. All he'd wanted was to show Avery a good time tonight. He hadn't expected something like this to happen. Thus, he was in a bad mood now, and he just wanted to go home. Dusty read his mind. Boss, take your lady home. Leave this to us. We'll make sure that these people never bother you again. Damon nodded and led Avery out of the bar. After they walked out of the door, they heard Dusty roar, Anyone who isn't involved, get the heck out of here. We have business to attend to. All the customers who'd been watching this unfold quickly ran out of the bar. Then Dusty waved his hand. Okay, men, let's teach these punks a lesson. Lily, Taylor, and Jenkins, as well as many others, started screaming, one after another. What would happen to them? It was no longer Damon's concern. These people had brought this upon themselves, especially Lily. Although Damon was an open-minded guy, he remembered how Lily and Noah had plotted against him. They'd even wanted to kill him. No matter what, Damon wouldn't let it go. Lily would pay a heavy price for what she'd done. Damon returned to his studies at Meyerson University. Avery went to LA to work on her music career. Damon was happy to see her following her dreams. Time passed quickly. Unknowingly, half the school year was over. Soon, Damon would be done third year. In the blink of an eye, he'd be a senior. Bubba didn't cause him any more trouble for the time being. After all, Bubba was implicated in the Parker family's legal trouble. After Drew went to prison, Damon's life became a lot less stressful. Although Everbright's share price had dropped, Astronet was growing rapidly. The number of users on the network had reached new heights. If Astronet went public one day, it would be a force to be reckoned with. Izzy, on the other hand, didn't come looking for Damon again. Although she helped run Silly Goose, she was still a student at Harvard. She had to focus on finishing her degree. As for Veronica and Fiona, Damon didn't hear from them. He didn't know how Fiona was doing in DC. Was she excelling at music as she wished? Was Veronica still a top student at the University of Berlin as usual? Were all the German men still falling for her? Has Fiona found a new lover? Has Veronica found a boyfriend? Damon didn't know the answer to any of these questions. Fate has destined these people as passers-by in his life. They'd once played starring roles, but in the end, they'd drifted away like dandelion fluff. Damon missed what he'd lost, but more importantly, he cherished what he had now. Nancy and Robert hoped that Damon would come to LA for a vacation that summer. When Damon got their invitation, he felt somewhat moved. Now Avery was working with Tony Music Entertainment. She spent most of her time in LA and Damon missed her a lot. If he went to California this summer, he could spend time with her. It would ease his longing for her. However, Damon wanted to go home and spend time with his parents too. His sister, Selena, was preparing to write her SATs. After she finished, Damon planned to bring his family to Meyerson for a vacation. Damon's parents and sister had never left New York City before. Now it was time for them to enjoy themselves. However, Damon got some surprising news one day after running into Gwen, Maddie, and Tara, Fiona's former roommates. He finally got word of Fiona. The three girls were on their way to the cafeteria. Tara kept pestering Maddie. She wanted to know how Maddie's boyfriend, Mitch, was doing. She'd heard that he found a good job. Furthermore, he was working for a trendy new tech company. Even more shocking was the fact that Mitch was already a senior executive there. Tara was stunned when she heard how much money he made. However, Maddie didn't know how to answer her roommate's question. Even she herself didn't know exactly what Mitch did. Gwen's eyes scanned the cafeteria, looking for handsome men. Then she noticed Damon standing nearby. Her eyes lit up, and she took the initiative to greet him. Hey, handsome, long time no see. Gwen would never forget the shock she felt at seeing Damon's face up on the huge screen in Times Square. Now he was standing in front of her. It felt a little surreal. Damon smiled when he saw the three girls. He greeted Gwen. Hello. Although Fiona was no longer around, Damon knew her old roommates, so it was only natural for him to say hi. The other two women's eyes lit up when they saw him. Tara smiled and took the initiative to greet him as well. Hey, handsome, you look good. What are you up to lately? 
Did you find a new girlfriend yet? They still didn't know that Damon and Avery were together, and he wasn't going to be the one to tell them. I'm just about to eat. What about you guys? Us too, Gwen replied. She gave him a long, hard look before continuing. It's been so long. Do you miss Fifi? Her question embarrassed him. Did he miss her? Of course he did, but he had already moved on. Now he was with Avery, so it wouldn't be right for him to say that he missed Fiona. He knew he should just forget about his ex. Gwen was perceptive and she understood relationships. Thus, she smiled sweetly and offered, If you miss Fifi, I can give you her contact details. As soon as Damon heard these words, his eyes lit up. You have her contact details? Gwen nodded and smiled. Yes, after she moved, she changed her number and deleted her social media accounts. At this point, Gwen paused and blinked innocently. I have her new number, though. Do you want it? Fifi probably told you not to tell me, though, right? Gwen was stunned for a moment, but she answered truthfully. No, she didn't explicitly say that. So, Fiona had been in contact with all her old roommates, but not Damon. The realization hurt a little. Perhaps she was worried that her mother would find out. However, the idea that his ex was still friends with Gwen, Tara, Maddie, and the others made him feel uncomfortable. Although he was with Avery now, at times he still had unrealistic fantasies about getting back together with Fiona. After hearing Gwen's words, these fantasies were destroyed. A feeling of disappointment overwhelmed him. Gwen felt a little bad when she saw Damon's expression. She realized how painful this must be for him. After thinking for a moment, she explained, My understanding is that Fifi didn't give you her new number because her mom didn't want her to. Besides, she probably knew that we'd give it to you eventually anyway. Tara quickly added, Yes, yes, yes. She never told us not to tell you. I think that secretly she was hoping we would. Damon knew that the two young women were just trying to comfort him. He smiled, but he didn't say anything. Gwen hesitated for a moment. Then she took out her phone. How about I give you her new number? Put it in your phone. Damon quickly shook his head. Forget it, there's no need. Since Fifi hadn't told him, he didn't want it. Furthermore, he was with Avery now. He had to sever ties with his ex. He didn't want to be disrespectful. But Gwen didn't care whether Damon wanted the number or not. She told him anyway. He didn't put it in his phone or write it down, though. Seeing this, Gwen felt both disappointed and relieved. She was disappointed because Damon and Fiona had been a great couple. It was sad to see their relationship end. If they couldn't make it work, what hope was there for everyone else? At the same time, she felt relieved. Gwen was a jealous person. In the past, she had often compared herself to a roommate. As such, seeing Fiona's perfect relationship fail was somewhat satisfying. After chatting with Damon for a while, Gwen said, If you're free sometime, let's go out to eat. Thanks for helping me in New York last time we met. Then she playfully winked at him. After parting ways with the three women, Damon kept thinking about the phone number Gwen had just given him. His memory was extremely good. Even though he hadn't really been listening, he still remembered the number. He couldn't get it out of his head. Should he call her? This question lingered in his mind. If he called her, it wouldn't be fair to Avery. It would feel like a betrayal. However, he still missed Fiona. He admitted that he was fickle, but at the same time, he really wanted to know why she'd left him like that. She hadn't even said goodbye in person. Thinking of this, Damon went to sit by the lake. It was late spring, and the surface of the water sparkled in the afternoon sun. From time to time, Damon spotted couples walking together or kissing each other. Sometimes a pair would sit down on a bench and feed the ducks. These people were blissfully in love. Damon thought back to when he was in love with Fiona. Had he been as blissfully ignorant as these people? Unfortunately, in the end, his relationship didn't last. He fumbled in his pocket and took out his phone. He hesitated for a moment before finally dialing Fiona's number. The phone rang a few times before she picked up. He heard a faint female voice on the other line. Hello? It was her. Although her tone carried a touch of coldness, it also sounded sweet. She sounded exactly as he remembered. It had been a long time, but he was finally hearing her voice again. At this moment, Damon's heart felt as if it had been torn out and violently thrown against a wall. All his old feelings for her surfaced. Who is this? Fiona asked when Damon didn't speak. Hearing this, his heart sank. He still remembered her old phone number. Although he hadn't meant to, he'd memorized it. It hurt that she didn't recognize his number. 
However, perhaps she just hadn't been paying attention. Damon tried to comfort himself. When he heard the familiar voice on the other line, he didn't know what to say. Um... Sir, if you have nothing to say, I'm hanging up. I'm quite busy. Perhaps his long silence was creeping her out. Maybe she thought he was some other guy calling to confess his feelings to her. Anyway, she didn't seem to recognize his voice. Damon ran into Fiona's old roommates on campus, and Gwen gave him Fiona's new number. Damon knew he shouldn't call her, but he couldn't stop thinking about it. He wanted answers, so he dialed her number. However, when she picked up, he didn't know what to say. All he said was, um. She didn't recognize his number or his voice. Or perhaps she did, but she didn't want to talk to him. Perhaps with passing time, her feelings for him had faded. Maybe she was over him. Hadn't her feelings for Darren disappeared like that too? If that was the case, Damon had overestimated how important he was to her. Thinking of this, he began to doubt whether she had ever truly loved him. Maybe it had all been a game to her. Since Damon remained silent, Fiona asked again, Who is this? Then Damon heard a male voice in the background. Who's calling? Oh, I don't know. It's weird. Whoever it is hasn't spoken the whole time. Maybe it's a prank call. Then she hung up. She sounded so familiar, yet so unfamiliar. Damon held his phone in a daze. At this moment, he felt extremely disappointed. Before Fiona hung up, he distinctly heard a man with her. He started to think about it, wondering if the man who he'd heard was her new boyfriend. Who else would it be? Fiona was the kind of woman men went crazy for. She was outstanding and beautiful. Of course she had a new guy. That was only natural. For a moment, intense emotions overwhelmed him. He felt a little dizzy. Only now did he realize that he still had feelings for his ex. Naturally, he wasn't going to let this ruin his life. However, when he thought about Fiona being embraced by another man, he still felt like he was suffocating. He had a hard time accepting it. He knew that this wasn't fair to Avery. However, he couldn't stop thinking about it. He even had an urge to go to DC and find Fiona. However, this was wishful thinking. He didn't really want to see her. Even if he did go find her, what would he say? He already had Avery, and Fiona very likely had someone new too. Maybe what she'd said in her letter was right. Maybe five or ten years down the road, they'd find each other again. Perhaps then, things would be different. However, he urgently needed to find a way to stop this unbearable yearning. Otherwise, how could he completely devote himself to Avery? Damon thought about all his memories of Fiona. He remembered how they'd walked by the lake and sat together watching the scenery. He remembered how they'd gone running together on the mountain behind the school. That night, as Damon lay in bed, he thought about the women in his life. He thought of Fiona, then Avery, then Veronica. When he thought of Veronica, his chest felt a little tight. Strictly speaking, he thought of her as a goddess, and it didn't seem right to fantasize about her. She was even more important to him than Fiona or Avery, but she was currently an ocean away. Perhaps he'd never see her again. This thought made his mood even worse. He didn't know what she was doing at this moment, but he missed her a lot. He hadn't spoken to her since he'd left. After all, she was far away in a foreign country and she probably had better things to do than chat with him. As he thought about this, he remembered Astronet. Why hadn't he thought to connect with Veronica through the app? He could log on and search for her. Astronet was popular in Europe, so she probably used it. If he added her, he could see her posts and chat with her. So he got his phone and went on Astronet. Damon rarely logged onto his account. He had one of the first accounts ever created on the site, so he had a special status. He noticed that he had a lot of unanswered message requests, so he went through them one by one. As he was doing this, one user suddenly attracted his attention. The name on the account was Frost Angel, and the user had sent him many messages. I sent you a gift. Do you wear it? When you're lonely, do you ever think of me? However, the thing that really attracted his attention was the profile picture. The picture showed a woman with beautiful hair sitting on a bench. She was gazing into the distance and she seemed a little lonely. Damon realized that the woman was Veronica. He even remembered the bench in the picture. It was the place where he'd met her in Berlin. She and Allison had been sitting on this bench when he ran into them. What gift was she talking about? He didn't know. She'd taken the initiative to add him on Astronet. He was secretly excited. However, the messages were more than a month old. Damon clicked accept to add her as a friend. He didn't expect her to be online right now, though. 
Did he send her a message anyway? What time was it in Europe? Before he could send a message, a dialog box suddenly appeared displaying her profile picture. Is this Damon? It's Veronica. Hi. Wow, she was actually online, and she was even taking the initiative to message him. His heart skipped a beat and he quickly replied, Yeah, it's me. I just logged on. Oh, it's already past midnight in Meyerson, right? Shouldn't you be sleeping? Although Veronica had a cool demeanor, she had a warm heart beneath it. Damon felt touched when he saw her message, even if she was just being friendly. Don't worry about me, I'm a night owl. What time is it in Germany? He asked. It's morning, she quickly replied. Damon asked her about her life. Was she still studying in Berlin? Did she like it? Was she at the top of her classes there too? Damon did most of the asking and Veronica answered his questions. However, her responses were rather quick so he didn't feel like the conversation was one-sided. After asking many questions, he ran out of things to say. Looking at the time, he realized that they'd been chatting for more than an hour. It was almost two in the morning and his phone battery was dying. So he messaged, it's pretty late here, I need to sleep. Thank you for the chat, I'll say bye for now. Let's talk again soon. Just as he was about to log off, Veronica suddenly messaged, wait, is everything okay? What's up? Oh, nothing, I just heard that you and Ava are together now. Is it true? He'd been thinking about this ever since she heard the news. Damon was surprised that she'd asked about it. After all, she'd always been aloof and independent. Normally, gossip didn't interest her. Damon wondered if she felt conflicted about his and Avery's relationship. It wasn't surprising that she knew about them. After all, Liam had been the first to find out, and he and Avery talked frequently. Liam had a big mouth, so he'd told everyone the news. Thus, everyone in their circle now knew. Although Veronica was far away in Berlin, word had still reached her. Just because she and Damon hadn't talked recently didn't mean that she didn't chat with her old friends. Naturally, Damon and Avery's relationship was a hot topic lately. He looked at the message. There was no point in denying it, so he typed, That's right, Ava and I have been together for a while now. Oh. Veronica sent a one-word response. After about ten seconds, she sent another message. Then, congratulations. Do you know... After hearing that you were with Ave, the first thing I thought of was that party back in high school when you confessed your love to her. Oh yeah? You still remember that, huh? I re Oh, of course I remember. Sometimes I wonder why she rejected you back then. You've always been such a great guy. At the time, I wondered what she was thinking. She's usually so smart. I didn't expect you two to really get together all these years later. Damon felt honored when he read her words of praise. Then she sent another message. But Damon, now that you're with Ave, I'm curious about something. What about you and Fifi? That's over. We broke up a long time ago. Damon felt an inexplicable wave of bitterness wash over him. He couldn't help but think of the phone call earlier today. Are you really over Fifi? If Fifi knew about you and Ave, what would she think? Do you think she'd be sad? Was Fiona sad? No, she didn't miss him. Damon typed a response. No, I'm not worried about what Fifi thinks. I tried calling her today, but she treated me like a stranger. I'm not sure that her feelings for me were even real. Then, he described what he'd heard on the phone today. I don't know, Veronica replied. Clearly, she didn't believe it. Are you saying you think that your whole relationship was a lie? But that doesn't seem right. Veronica was a perceptive woman. She had a good sense for these kinds of things. In addition, she used to live on the same floor as Fiona. As such, she'd heard things about Fiona and Damon's relationship. At least from her perspective, their relationship was real. If it wasn't, Fiona was a really good actor. Damon and Veronica were chatting on the Astronet app. She asked him about his relationship with Avery and his breakup with Fiona. Damon told her about his call to his ex and his misgivings about their relationship. It was very late and he was already a little sleepy, so he said goodnight to Veronica. That night, he had a vivid dream. He dreamt that Avery, Fiona, and Veronica all confessed their love to him. The four of them were all together, and the women weren't jealous of each other. When he woke up, he was disappointed to discover that it had only been a dream. His stomach was rumbling, so he got up and went for breakfast. When students finished 12th grade, they had to write their SATs. It was the day before Selena's exams, so Damon called to chat. He encouraged her and told her not to be nervous. He told her not to worry about getting high marks. She just needed to stay calm and do her best. No matter what grades she got, her family would support her. Selena felt quite relaxed. After chatting with her brother, she even did some housework with her mother. 
She didn't seem anxious about her upcoming exams. The weather in New York City has been mild lately. The sun was shining brightly and a light breeze blew. On the morning of the first day of exams, Selena walked to school with a spring in her step. Although her brother had aced his SATs, she didn't feel any extra pressure to succeed. The exam period was always a nervous and busy time for students. Fortunately, it quickly passed. After Selena finished, Damon called to ask her how it went. Not bad. Her tone sounded relaxed and he felt at ease. Damon still felt a little nervous though. He was worried that she wouldn't get the score she wanted. Although her grades were usually good, her performance in the SATs was very important. Sometimes bright students performed poorly on their exams and then regretted it for the rest of their lives. Selena dreamed of going to the same university as her brother, so hopefully her grades were good enough. They would have to wait until the grades were released to find out. As Selena anxiously waited to hear her results, the weather gradually became hotter. University students were on summer holidays too. During this period of time, a few things happened. The number of Astronet users officially surpassed 600 million. Theo and Xander's team defeated Capital University, but they lost to the Michigan Institute of Science and Technology in the semifinals. However, this didn't prevent Theo and Xander from becoming the pride of Meyerson University. After all, they had led the school team to unprecedented success. Now, they'd even attracted the attention of NBA scouts. Perhaps they'd even have a chance to go pro. Damon's third year of university had come to an end. Students sold their textbooks and people packed their bags and went home for the summer. Although the senior students were happy to graduate, they also felt a little sad to be leaving campus. People were singing Ryan Gold's once popular song, Time Flies. The lyrics perfectly described the bittersweet feelings of the graduating students. The third year students also had complicated feelings. They would be going into their last year after the holidays. Many of them had to make big life choices. Before long, they'd be leaving campus too. Some wanted to do postgraduate studies and others were starting careers. Students from well-off families were planning graduation trips. Theo and Xander had their own goals. Quinn had a career working for Damon. Hector was the only one among them without plans. He had always been a big gamer and he was a little uncertain about his future. However, many people felt this way when they graduated from university. Not everyone could become a legend. Before long, Selena's SAT scores were released. She and her friends met up at school and went to the computer lab to log on and check their scores. When she and her friend Amy walked into the computer lab, they saw a sea of people. Countless other students were here for the same reason. Selena and Amy stood at the door of the computer lab, waiting for someone to get off a computer. While they were waiting, the girls suddenly noticed an old computer in the corner. The computer was dusty and it didn't look like it worked. Amy casually asked the supervisor, Excuse me, why isn't anyone using this one? Is it broken? No one has used that since we got the new models, the supervisor replied. Furthermore, because it hadn't been used for a long time, he wasn't even sure if it still worked. If it did, it would definitely be very slow. It might take half an hour just to turn it on. Seeing the supervisor hesitate, Amy smiled sweetly and asked, Why don't we turn it on and find out? It can't get any more broken, right? Besides, all the other computers are in use, and who knows how long we'll have to wait. The supervisor shrugged his shoulders. The lab was indeed busy today. All right, then, you guys can try. But as I said, it hasn't been used for a long time, and it's very old. If it's slow, don't blame me. Thanks, we'll give it a go. Amy quickly nodded, and Selena followed suit. The computer was indeed very slow. When the girls turned it on, they could hear it whirring inside. Despite this, it seemed to run normally. The supervisor said, It's your lucky day. Looks like it works. Amy nodded and suggested to Selena, Why don't you check your grades first? Selena shook her head. No, you check. Amy thought for a moment. She didn't want to argue, so she sat down and logged on to her student account. After all, if Selena checked her grades first and found that she did well, Amy might not have the courage to check her own. After the page loaded, she read her score. She got 690 on reading and writing and 675 on math. What a relief. With grades like this, she shouldn't have any problem getting into the university of her choice. She'd done better than she expected and she was overjoyed. After Amy checked her scores, she moved and let Selena sit in front of the computer so she could check too. Selena logged onto her account. Soon after, her grades appeared on the screen. She got 780 in math and 785 in reading and writing. 
that was a score of 1,565 out of a possible 1,600. She'd done as good as her brother Damon. It was an amazing achievement. In other words, she was upholding the family tradition. She'd aced her SATs too. When Amy saw her friend score, her eyes widened in surprise. Then she put her hand over her mouth and exclaimed, Oh my God! Had Selena aced her SATs too? It seemed inconceivable. Amy couldn't believe her eyes. Selena's pretty face flushed red. She couldn't believe this was happening either. Although she'd been confident about her performance, she hadn't expected to do this well. What shocked her even more was the fact that she'd actually done as well as her brother. She was overjoyed, and she couldn't wait to tell Damon. He would be proud when he heard that she'd aced her SATs too. Amy's exclamation attracted the supervisor's attention. He said in a dissatisfied tone, I warned you that that computer might not work. He thought that she'd cried out in surprise because of a problem with the machine. Hearing this, Amy stomped her foot and rolled her eyes at the man. Come and look, the computer doesn't have a problem. If there wasn't a problem with the computer, then what was it? The supervisor was curious, so he came over and saw Selena's score on the screen. But, 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 he stammered, unable to speak. Finally, he cried out in shock. Holy crap, you did great, congrats. His words quickly attracted attention from all the nearby students. Who's shouting? What's all the fuss about? Is that for real? Don't try to trick me. Let me take a look and see. Wow, she's a genius. When the other students saw her score on the screen, they started whispering to one another. Then, they started to discuss the surprising turn of events. Before long, the whole computer lab was in a huge uproar. Everyone was looking at Selena with admiration. The supervisor smiled. Miss, you're really amazing. I haven't seen anyone do that well on the SATs for three years. You're a genius. You're really amazing. The other students in the computer lab praised her as well. Wow, I've never known anyone to get such a high score. That's amazing. And she's beautiful too. Wow, what a girl. Hey, genius, can I take a selfie with you? Give me your autograph too. The people who knew her and her brother teased. Wow, I guess everyone in your family is a genius, huh? Selena smiled faintly. Yeah, I couldn't let my brother take all the glory. Amy, who was beside her, watched her friend being worshipped and couldn't help but feel proud. Not many people could say that their best friend was a genius. Selena winked at the other students. Then, she and Amy gathered their things and quietly left the computer lab. Everyone watched them leave. People were still stunned. News that both Walker siblings had aced their SATs quietly spread through the neighborhood. It made for a great story and it was a topic of discussion among countless friends and neighbors. Damon was one of the first people to receive the news. After hearing it, he was in a good mood. To celebrate his sister's glorious achievements, he gathered Quinn, Theo, Xander, and a few other friends and took them out for dinner. They went to a restaurant downtown called Caesars. After they finished eating, they went out clubbing and they stayed out until the early hours of the morning. When Mr. and Mrs. Walker heard the news, they cried with joy. The neighbors all came to congratulate them, and the living room of their house was soon full of people. Everyone praised the walkers for raising such amazing children. Selena would get into a top university as well. It was incredible. This was truly a family of scholars. Relatives who had previously been cold to them now took the initiative to cozy up. Mr. Walker's younger brother came over to say hi. He hadn't come to visit in years. Selena was not very friendly to him. Although the Walkers had some relatives in town, they rarely saw them. In addition to a brother, Mr. Walker also had an uncle who lived nearby. Mrs. Walker's older brother lived in New York too. However, the Walkers had lived a tough life, and their income was not stable. Therefore, these relatives didn't want anything to do with them. They were afraid that the Walkers would ask to borrow money. Mr. Walker's brother was named Cecil, and he worked for the IRS. Although they were brothers, Mr. Walker's relationship with Cecil could be described as distant. Mr. Walker's father had worked for the IRS too until he retired. His youngest son had followed in his footsteps. Mr. Walker's father had wanted his eldest son to work at the IRS. After all, Andrew was smart and capable, so he would have been a good fit. At the time, Cecil happened to be unemployed and he knew that working for the IRS was a good job. He heard that his father wanted to get his brother a job there, so he applied for the job too and ended up stealing it out from under his brother's nose. After that, Andrew was unable to find steady work and he went on to live a poor life. He was disappointed by how heartless his brother was. Cecil didn't have kids, so he didn't need the job as much. 
When Damon started high school, Mr. Walker tried to borrow money from Cecil to start a college savings account for his son, but his brother wouldn't lend him a single cent. He even mocked Mr. Walker, saying that saving for his son's college was useless. Damon was going to end up just like his father. He wouldn't go to university. They'd be lucky if he even got his high school diploma. When word got around that Selena had aced her SATs too, people started coming out of the woodwork. Mr. Walker's brother, Cecil, who they hadn't seen in years, came to visit. The brothers were practically strangers to one another now. However, Cecil came to the house and congratulated Selena on her performance. Although Andrew disliked his brother, he found his visit comforting. It showed how impressive his daughter's achievement was. Her future was bright, and that was all that mattered. The news of Selena's test performance spread like wildfire. The faculty of Bridgeton High School became even more proud of themselves. They'd been hoping for something like this for a long time. Finally, they had a top scorer at their school too. Now they could lord it over their rival, Jefferson High. They'd finally made a comeback. A lively celebration began. After the SAT results were announced, the school year was officially over and the summer vacation started. Nancy and Robert called early one morning to ask Damon to come to LA with them. Because Nancy was worried that he wouldn't come, she went to campus to talk to him in person. If he refused her offer, she'd do her best to convince him. In short, she wouldn't give up until he agreed. It had been too long since she'd seen him. Although they'd been reunited, Damon spent most of his time studying at Myerson University. Even though Nancy missed him dearly, she didn't want to embarrass him by showing up on campus for no reason. What if she disturbed his studies? However, he was on holiday now, and he didn't need to go to class anymore. So naturally, Nancy had a plan to keep him by her side. When she invited him to LA, Damon was quite moved. Apart from being touched by her generosity, he was also enticed by the fact that Avery was also in LA. If he went there, he might have a chance to see her. However, Damon had originally planned to bring Selena and his parents to Myerson this summer. However, he wanted them to stay in the house that he'd bought them. That way, they could spend time together and enjoy themselves. After hearing Nancy's invitation, Damon decided to bring his family to Myerson for a vacation first. After that, he would go to LA for a while. However, when he called home and invited his parents to Myerson, his mother rejected his offer. Although it would be great to spend time with their son, they were used to living in New York City. They didn't want to leave. Furthermore, Mrs. Walker hated traveling, and she was afraid of going to an unfamiliar place. So Damon's original plan didn't work out. Thus, he called Nancy and agreed to go to LA with them. Hearing this news, Nancy was very happy. That day, the Brokertons drove to Myerson University to pick up their son. Then, they all boarded the plane to California. As usual, when they got off the plane, a convoy was waiting to pick them up. They drove to their mansion out in Malibu. When they arrived, William, the butler, was outside waiting for them. The rest of the staff lined up behind him to welcome the Brokertons home. Damon stayed in his childhood room. It was where he felt most comfortable. However, Nancy had had the room renovated, and it was no longer the same as before. It was still warm and comfortable, but it was more age appropriate now. While Damon was missing, Nancy had preserved the room to commemorate her son. However, now that he'd returned, naturally there was no need to do this anymore. The decor had been more than 10 years old, and it seemed out of place. With Damon's approval, Nancy renovated and redecorated. This trip, Robert didn't intend to let Damon laze around. He wanted to integrate his son into a role at the company as soon as possible. Damon wasn't used to this life, so Robert wanted to ease him into it. Mr. Brokerton planned to introduce his son to his associates. He wanted him to make connections. These would be the foundation for his son's future. By spending time with Robert, Damon would be able to see how extensive the Brokerton's connections were. They visited people in the government and military. They also visited some of Robert's many business partners. Mr. Brokerton made plans to bring his son to the home of an old friend the next day. The old friend was from Las Vegas. It was said that he was one of the most powerful people in the city. His name was Harris Cardiff, and he was a good friend of Robert's. The visit was scheduled for noon the next day. The morning before the visit, Nancy called Damon to her side to chat. Honey, how was your relationship with your girlfriend? He knew that Nancy was referring to Fiona. When they were first reunited, Nancy met Fiona. At that time, to gain her son's trust, 
She'd even tried to curry favor with his girlfriend. However, that was a long time ago and things had changed. Thinking about it again was painful. Damon shook his head and explained, We broke up. You broke up? Nancy was stunned for a moment, then she frowned slightly. Why did you break up with her? She saw a flash of pain on her son's face, but then he forced a smile like nothing was wrong. It's not important. It's all in the past anyway. Why are you asking? Nancy scanned her son's face. She was good at reading people. From small changes in his expression, she gathered that not only had they broken up, but it was also likely that he'd been dumped. She saw the traces of pain on his face. If her son had dumped Fiona, he would have reacted differently. Fiona dumping him was the only explanation. Immediately, anger surged inside her. Most mothers thought that their children were perfect, and Nancy was no exception. In terms of character, education, and family background, Damon was definitely a catch. How dare that woman dump him? That was going too far. Her favorable impression of Fiona was gone. However, she hid her feelings. All she revealed was a look of slight surprise. She comforted Damon. Don't be sad. You deserve better. Later, we can start looking. Later? He was stunned. Judging from her expression, it seemed like she'd been prepared for this. Sure enough, she nodded and explained her plan. Do you know Harris Cardiff, the man who your father is bringing you to see later? He's Robert's best friend. These days, he's been staying in L.A. for work. Well, he has a daughter named Victoria. Don't you remember? Victoria? Although he had an amazing memory, he didn't have any recollection of her. He guessed that even if they'd met before, it was probably when he was very young, so he didn't remember. Nancy saw his confused expression, so she explained, Victoria is only a day younger than you. She was born in the same hospital. You two were childhood sweethearts. Damon looked like he was listening attentively. Nancy smiled and went on. She is studying at Stanford University. Not long ago, she came to LA to visit her father, and I got a chance to see her again. I'm not lying when I say that she is very beautiful. Damon's expression froze. What does that have to do with me? He patted his shoulder. I just wanted you to know. Actually, your father always secretly hoped that you two would be together one day. Really? Damon felt a little awkward. He didn't want to disappoint Robert, but he already had a girlfriend who he loved. Nancy nodded. Yes, your father would be thrilled if you two dated. He's even disgusted with Harris, and he supports the idea too. He promised to let you meet Victoria when you go to visit. The Cardis and the Brokertons were both very influential families. They were basically on par with each other. Furthermore, Victoria didn't have a boyfriend. Her father was very protective of her, and he wanted to see her with the right guy. Now that Damon had returned, Harris and Robert had been cooking up a plan to bring their children together. If Damon and Victoria started dating and eventually got married, it would bring the two families closer. It would definitely be a strong alliance. But Damon's expression turned ugly. He wanted to tell Nancy that he had a girlfriend, but after thinking about it for a moment, he decided not to. He was worried that she would react like Fiona's mother Karen had. What if she did something bad to Avery? No, it was safer to hide his relationship from her now. As for Victoria, after he met her, he could simply say that she wasn't his type. He didn't think that the Brokertons would continue to force the issue unless they wanted to drive him away. Naturally, Nancy didn't understand why he was so conflicted. She saw his hesitation and soothed. Honey, just go and take a look, okay? It could be fun. I'm not lying to you. Victoria is not only beautiful, but also well-educated. You two would be a great couple. Damon could not stand to hear her beg, so he just nodded and agreed. When he did, Nancy broke into a gleeful smile. After breakfast, Nancy brought Damon shopping. They went to a high-end boutique to buy clothes. The designer was not famous, but the clothes were of excellent quality. This design company didn't cater to ordinary people. For this reason, it remained relatively unknown. Not many people could afford to shop here. The prices were sky high. This designer served the most elite people in LA. When Nancy and Damon arrived at the store, they saw that it was decorated magnificently. Many beautiful women stood outside waiting to get in. They formed a neat line. A brand new red carpet covered the sidewalk out front. The atmosphere was very posh. Nancy planned to have some outfits custom tailored for her son. Although Damon was wearing the new clothes that Avery had bought for him, the quality and style couldn't compare with the clothing from this label. The clothes sold here were very fashionable. Nancy wanted her son to look his best for his meeting with Victoria later. No matter what, he had to make a good impression. She walked into the boutique and started looking around. 
The boss personally came out to welcome them. Even though the designer was used to meeting big shots, she definitely considered Nancy a top customer. She didn't dare to offend her. The designer took Damon's measurements and her employees buzzed around helping. Some bought drinks while others took notes. They recorded all the details. Damon felt like a king. All the staff were serving him alone. So this was how rich people lived, huh? Even though in the past he'd been the boss of a company worth billions, he still lived an ordinary life. Ah, <sighs> this was just too extravagant. A woman with delicate features assisted with the measurements. As she worked, her beautiful face turned bright red. She thought Damon was really handsome. After they finished, Nancy asked, Is that all you need? It shouldn't be difficult to make him a whole new wardrobe, right? The assistant shook her head. She glanced at Damon with her big, beautiful eyes and said, Madam, it will be no trouble at all. Your son has a perfect figure. Damon was tall and strong. When she measured him, she felt his rippling muscles beneath his clothes. Her heart beat faster and her imagination ran wild. Nancy was very satisfied. I want 10 new outfits made for him. Oh, and we need something he can wear today as well. Do you have anything in stock? She had a plan. Damon was meeting Victoria later and she wanted her son to look his best. The designer who was standing nearby nodded. Yes, madam, come back to the fitting room, please. We will see what we can do. Nancy was no ordinary customer, so the woman would do anything to satisfy her needs. Nancy brought Damon to a designer boutique to buy him new clothes. While he was in the fitting room, Robert called to say that Harris had rescheduled their meeting for tomorrow instead. It was almost lunchtime, so Nancy and Damon returned home and she cooked him his favorite dishes. The more he ate, the happier she felt. That night, Damon was invited to a dinner at a private club called The Parlor. Quincy Montbarker, the son of a prominent local family, had invited him. After Damon arrived in LA, Robert brought him to visit many important people. Before long, Quincy heard the news and he immediately called up his old acquaintance. He invited Damon to the parlor for dinner and drinks. An auction was also being held there today. It was a charity auction. If Damon was interested, he could take a look. Since Damon had nothing to do, he agreed to go. He wanted to build his own business empire one day, so he needed to make connections. Since Quincy had made the effort to invite him, naturally he would go. He'd met Quincy only once before. They met at a club called The Castle. At that time, Hans had been there too, and Damon had gotten into a fight with him. He and Hans had been enemies since they first met back in Berlin. Damon hadn't expected the guy to hold a grudge against him for so long though. Hans was friends with Drew and Andy, and he'd conspired with Drew to cause trouble for Damon. Their meddling had caused Everbright's share price to plummet, and it still hadn't recovered. Damon and Hans were mortal enemies now. As the saying went, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Furthermore, Quincy was going out of his way to be nice, so naturally, Damon wouldn't turn him down. At this point, it seemed like the guy was a good person. He was friendly and he seemed generous. He would be a good person to know. Quincy was happy to hear Damon agree to his invitation. When Damon arrived at the club, Quincy spotted him from afar. He came over with a group of people to welcome him. Although there was no red carpet, it was still a grand sight to behold. Quincy laughed and hugged his new friend. I'm glad you made it. Let's go. I've been looking forward to seeing you again. And finally, here you are. Let's have a drink. Damon smiled. You're too polite. I'm honored to be here. Quincy was speechless. Come on, loosen up. We're friends now. Come, come, come. Let me introduce you to some friends. If you have time, we should hang out more. Then he introduced Damon to the people around him. In the beginning, one of them knew Damon's identity, but they were still curious. Quincy was a powerful guy yet he welcomed this newcomer so warmly. Although he was usually approachable, he rarely showed such enthusiasm. Whoever this stranger was, he must be very important. After hearing that Damon was Robert Brokerton's son, people understood. Those who knew about this family were shocked. They no longer found it strange that Quincy was being so friendly. However, they were curious as to why Damon's surname was Walker and not Brokerton. However, when they heard the whole story, they felt relieved. Until recently, Damon had been an ordinary guy. He'd taken his adoptive father's last name. This was understandable. After all, he'd lived with his adoptive parents for more than 10 years. However, this didn't prevent Damon from being a Brokerton. After all, Nancy and Robert were his birth parents. To the truly wealthy, bloodlines mattered. Blood was thicker than water. Even if Damon's surname was Walker, he was still a Brokerton by birth. 
After hearing his story, no one dared to look down on him. Quincy and Damon walked into the club together. The place was not as luxurious as Damon had imagined. However, it was elegantly decorated. It had thick carpets and velvet drapes. Potted plants were spaced around the room, and the lobby had a water feature. The place was already bustling with activity. It seemed that today's charity auction was going to be grand. When Quincy led Damon and the others into the club, everyone turned to look. He was from a prominent LA family, and he was very charming. Currently, he was in line to take over his family's business and become the true head of the household. No one dared to look down on him. Naturally, he was the center of attention. Many people fawned over him. However, although Quincy treated Damon as an equal, he didn't introduce him to anyone other than his close friends. It seemed a little disingenuous, but Damon decided to let it go. He looked around the room. It wasn't his first time experiencing the high life in LA. Everyone here was someone important. They were all dressed to the nines. Damon also noticed that there were many high-ranking dignitaries present here tonight. In addition to this, there were also many celebrities and socialites. However, compared to the dignitaries, the celebrities were not important. Even so, it was still pleasing to the eye. Looking around, Damon saw a familiar face. It was Hans, his old enemy. Last time they met, Damon had just won big on a horse race. Afterwards, he'd gotten into a fight with the guy. At this moment, Hans was surrounded by a group of handsome men and beautiful women. People were trying to curry favor with him as well. Hans was dressed very stylishly, and he looked pleased with himself. He was the son of one of the most powerful families in LA. Everyone wanted to know him. His family wasn't just wealthy, it was also very powerful. The moment Damon saw Hans, a fierce look flashed in his eyes. He followed Quincy and chatted with his new acquaintances. Suddenly, he smelled a whiff of perfume and a gentle but cold voice spoke into his ear. Can you let me by? Damon turned around and saw a beautiful woman standing behind him. She seemed annoyed that he was blocking her way. He was stunned when he saw who she was. He realized that he'd seen her before. She was one of the women who he'd saved during the hijacking on the plane. Izzy had been one of them, and this woman was the other. At that time, she'd tried to persuade him to stay, but he left in a hurry without leaving any contact details. Naturally, he didn't know what her name was. He hadn't expected to meet her here. It was obvious that she didn't recognize him. After all, when he saved her, he'd worn a disguise. Why would she remember him when she'd never even seen his face? Why are you still standing there? You're in my way, she demanded. Beside her was another woman. This woman was also beautiful. She had short hair that just covered her ears. When the woman from the plane saw Damon looking at her friend, she became even more annoyed. She thought that he was too busy checking her friend out to listen to her. She crossed her arms and tapped her foot impatiently. Damon snapped out of his daze and frowned. He was just standing there, so how could she say that he was in her way? Tired of waiting, she glared and stepped around him. She went over to Quincy. The women from the plane went over to Quincy, but the short-haired woman stayed to talk to Damon. Who are you? Why haven't I seen you around before? It was not surprising that she'd asked this question. All the people here were old friends, but they'd never met Damon. He was a stranger to them. Damon smiled. Quincy and I met recently. We are newly acquainted. Oh. The short-haired woman nodded. She didn't know how the two guys knew each other, so she looked at Damon suspiciously. They didn't just let anyone join their circle. The longer she looked at him, the bigger her frown got. Although Nancy had bought Damon new clothes this morning, he'd chosen to wear the ones that Avery bought him. He felt more comfortable in them. Clearly, this woman wasn't impressed. Compared to what everyone else here was wearing, his clothes were cheap rags. The woman looked down on him for it. Thus, the woman didn't bother to talk to him any longer. She followed her friend and went to chat with Quincy. Quincy and the woman from the plane were chatting happily. The woman's icy expression had melted and she was beaming. At this moment, Quincy remembered Damon. He quickly brought his beautiful companion over and introduced her. The woman from the plane was named Victoria Cardiff. If Damon remembered correctly, this was the woman who Nancy had been talking about. It was a little funny, actually. He hadn't expected to meet her here. He couldn't help sizing her up. He found that she was indeed very beautiful and moving. However, her attitude today was completely different from when he met her on the plane. When he saved her life, she'd even tried to get his number. When he refused, she was utterly disappointed. However, at this moment, Victoria appears arrogant and cold. It made him feel very uncomfortable. He didn't mind, though. The colder this woman treated him, the better. If she rejected him, 
it would solve his problem with Nancy and Robert. As he sized her up, she swept her gaze over him. When she saw him checking her out, she wrinkled her brow. She already had a bad impression of him, and now it was getting worse. Come, come, Victoria, Quincy said. This is Robert Brokerton's son. His name is Damon. Damon, this is Harris Cardiff's daughter, Victoria. And this, he pointed to the short-haired woman on the other side, is Laura Van Dyke. We all run in the same circle, so we should get to know each other. Naturally, Quincy didn't know about the relationship between the Cardiffs and the Brokertons. In light of this, it was impossible for him to know about Robert and Harris's plan to get their children together. Victoria didn't know either. Laura exclaimed, Oh, so you're Robert's son. They finally found you. Recently, the news about Damon's return had been spreading like wildfire among LA's upper class. Everyone had heard the story about how he'd been living with an ordinary family in New York City for more than 10 years. Laura's tone was sarcastic. She wasn't being very friendly, which made Quincy feel awkward. Damon didn't care what Laura thought. He did grow up with an ordinary family in New York. What she'd said was true. However, it was obvious that she looked down on him for it. Damon recognized Laura's surname. If he remembered correctly, the Van Dykes were a prominent family in LA. That would explain why she was friends with Quincy and Victoria. Before the dinner started, Quincy gathered a group of his friends to sit together and chat. However, they all just talked about their elite lifestyles in LA. They talked about shopping in high-end stores and going out on yachts. They flew around on private jets and collected fine wines and racing horses. As such, Damon felt somewhat out of place. Not only was he unable to contribute anything to the conversation, but he also found it boring. If they wanted to talk about computer games for life in New York, perhaps he'd have something to say. However, he cared very little about these other topics. Additionally, there were people in the groups who were deliberately making fun of him. Laura asked, Hey, handsome, what kind of yacht do you have? Yacht? Damon shook over his head. I don't have one, and I don't want one either. Owning a yacht was too extravagant for his taste. Damon was a humble young man. Naturally, he wouldn't waste his money on something so ridiculous. What about watches? Do you own a Rolex? I just use my phone to tell the time. What about horse racing? Are you interested? You must like sports cars, right? Do you have an opinion on the latest model of Ferrari? What, you haven't even heard of it? Laura asked question after question, but Damon couldn't answer them. He heard quiet snickers all around him. People clearly didn't think that he didn't belong here. Some people even thought his mere presence here was an embarrassment. Quincy invited Damon to a charity dinner at a private club. He introduced Damon to all his friends, but many of them looked down on the newcomer. Laura, in particular, gave him a hard time. She teased him and the others laughed at his expense. Although they were afraid of the Brokerton family, it didn't stop them from ridiculing Damon. Clearly, they felt that he didn't belong. How were they supposed to like him? He knew nothing about being upper class. Although most of them were polite out of respect for Quincy, they secretly looked down on him. They questioned the judgment of the Brokerton family as well. In fact, most people didn't know how truly powerful the Brokertons were. Some people had heard rumors, but the Brokertons didn't have much of a presence in the city anymore. They weren't as influential as the other prominent families. The other families often displayed their strength in local politics and business. On the other hand, the Brokertons kept a low profile and they were almost never seen in LA. It was as if they were invisible. In short, most people didn't consider them to be big players in the city. At most, they were just a low-key wealthy family, right? They couldn't even be considered powerful, they were just rich. However, no one would say this aloud in front of Damon. Fortunately, Quincy had taken the initiative to strike up a friendship with Damon. He knew the true strength of the Brokerton family. He knew that Damon was the most important person here tonight, and he knew better than to underestimate him. Since Quincy respected the newcomer, no one dared to go too far. As the night went on, the charity auction began. After the host announced that 50% of the profits would be donated to save poor children, the auction officially started. Damon had no interest in this kind of auction. The items being sold were all extravagant luxuries such as fine wines, mansions, yachts, and jewels. Even though he was now a part of the elite crowd, he found these things ostentatious. The first item to be auctioned off was a special sword that had once belonged to a famous general in the Civil War. The moment it appeared, people began to bid like crazy. At this moment, people's wealth was on display. Bidders upped their offers by hundreds of thousands without even batting an eye. In the end, the sword sold for more than a million dollars. After that, there was a pink 10-carat diamond ring. 
It was many times more beautiful than the diamond that Damon had given Avery. Even he was quite moved when he saw it. When the ring appeared, many women exclaimed excitedly. Laura's and Victoria's eyes also lit up. Not many women could resist the temptation of such a beautiful diamond. When the auction began, the price climbed higher and higher. In the end, the last two bidders were Quincy and Hans. They were both determined to outbid the other, and they increased their offers in turn. In the end, under the constant urging of the women beside him, Hans gritted his teeth and placed the highest bid. Quincy said helplessly, I want to buy that pink diamond for my girlfriend, but Mr. Schimmel is richer. I can't compete. He sounded depressed. On the contrary, the woman beside Hans cheered. Seeing Quincy's helpless look, Hans grinned. It's not about money. It's about how much you want it. I value my relationship more than my wealth. It was obvious that he was trying to start a fight. However, Quincy completely ignored him. After that, the auctioneer held up a Swiss watch. Apparently, a European leader had once worn this watch. It was a valuable treasure, and the crowd started bidding on it as soon as it was put up for auction. However, not everyone was interested in it, and there were many other things being auctioned off tonight as well. An uncut piece of jade went up for auction next. To many, it looked quite tempting. However, the people weren't experts, so many guests were not interested in this uncut stone. The average person had no idea what a stone like this was worth, or what to do with it. But when Damon saw this uncut stone, a strange feeling suddenly overwhelmed him. It was as if it were calling out to him. Although he couldn't explain it, his intuition told him that he had to buy the stone. For some reason, he had to have it. At this moment, the bidding began. The auctioneer started the bidding low. Perhaps even he was not very optimistic about the likelihood of making a sale. Buying it would be a gamble. However, some of the rich people who were present dabbled in stones. They felt that the uncut jade had potential, so they started bidding. Soon the price doubled. Then it tripled. The person who bid most aggressively was one of Hans's friends, Oscar. This guy was wealthy, and he had connections with the jewelry industry. His bid scared off almost all the other bidders. Just when Oscar thought that the stone was his, Damon started to bid. Oscar raised his bid, but Damon immediately topped him. They went back and forth like this for some time. Wanting to put an end to the war, Damon doubled Oscar's last bid. Two million dollars. After he said this, the room was in an uproar. Everyone thought that he was crazy. The stone that they were bidding on was raw. It still had to be cut and processed. With a sky-high price like that, it was likely the buyer would lose money. Even if the stone turned out to be high quality, the profits from the finished product would likely only cover the costs. The buyer didn't stand to make any profit. More likely than not, the stone would turn out to be worthless, so it would be a complete waste of money. No matter how people looked at it, they thought that Damon was crazy to bid so much. Put it bluntly, he was simply shameless. He was squandering his money. Oscar was so angry that he couldn't help but curse. Damn, do you even know what to do with it? I wanted it for my collection. Why are you buying it? You're just messing with me, aren't you? Judging from Oscar's expression, he had given up. No matter how much he liked the stone, he wasn't going to pay that much for it. In the face of Oscar's anger, Damon remained cool and collected. Can't I buy it just because I like it? I have money and I want to donate to the fundraiser. If Oscar didn't like it, he could shove it. Two million going once, going twice, all right, sold. The auctioneer banged his gavel. Damon had just bought an uncut piece of jade that was almost guaranteed to lose money. Even Quincy, who was beside him, didn't understand. What was Damon playing at? Even if he had money, why was he squandering it like this? However, when he remembered that the money was going to a good cause, he felt relieved. Laura, who was beside him, couldn't help but look at Damon and ask, Are you knowledgeable about stones? No, I'm just having fun, he answered. Of course, he didn't tell anyone about the mysterious connection that he'd felt to the stone. Oh, Laura went on, you're pretty careless with your parents' money. In her opinion, he was throwing his money away. Only a buffoon would do such a thing. Damon had grown up with an ordinary family, so obviously he wasn't used to having money. He didn't understand its value. Now that he lived with the Brokertons, he'd become a billionaire overnight. He was probably still getting used to his new identity. Was he trying to redefine his own value by spending money? Around here, such behavior was pointless. People would only ridicule him for it. Perhaps ordinary folks found this kind of capricious money-wasting impressive. However, in the eyes of the true elites, this kind of behavior was embarrassing. They looked down on it. Only stupid people would do such a thing. 
Even those who knew who Damon was dared to comment. They were surprised that the Brokertons had such a useless child, he would inevitably drive their company into the ground. Victoria, who was sitting nearby, looked at Damon coldly. He wasn't one of them. He was wasting the Brokertons' money. Damon had no interest in bidding on any other items. He looked forward to picking up his uncut stone later. However, today, he'd earned a reputation. He was afraid that word of it would spread throughout LA. Last time he was in town, he'd bet big on a horse race. At that time, he hadn't cared about losing money, but in the end, he got extremely lucky. However, today was different. This was a charity auction. He wasn't throwing away money. He was donating it. Unfortunately, people didn't think he was doing it for charity. They thought that he was just showing off. They thought that he was an outsider who didn't belong. No one liked to see money being squandered. Later on, the bidding for the charity auction ended. Damon paid and took his uncut stone. Even the people who were running the auction looked at him as if he were crazy, but he didn't care. When he touched the stone, he felt a powerful energy surging through his body. His mind became even clearer. He tried to control the feeling, but he couldn't. So he decided to hide the stone until he figured out how to use it. Maybe one day, he could use it to strengthen his mental and physical powers. He took the stone to bed with him that night and hugged it while he slept. He savored the feeling it gave him. When he held it, he felt as if he was soaking in the sun. He could feel its energy resonating with his body's power. The next day, he and his family woke up early. They were going to visit the Cardiffs today. The butler got up early too and made all the preparations. After breakfast, the three of them got into their bulletproof Rolls Royce. Seven cars drove ahead of them and seven more drove behind. Their motorcade set off for the hotel where the Cardiff family was currently living. The Cardiffs were staying in a five-star hotel called The Boston. It was near the beach, and it was one of the Brokerton's businesses. The Cardiffs were based out of Las Vegas. Harris had come to LA for work, so naturally his old friend Robert insisted that he stay in the presidential suite at The Boston Hotel. Before the Brokerton set off, one of their staff members called Harris's assistant. After learning that his old friends were on their way with their son, who had been missing for many years, Harris called his daughter. Since she was in LA, he wanted her to come and say hello to Robert and Nancy. When Robert and his family arrived at the Boston Hotel, Harris and his wife, Thelma, were already waiting outside. Robert got out of the car and the two men hugged each other. It was obvious that they were very close. Harris was a refined looking man with kind eyes. His wife was similar to Nancy, graceful and luxurious. She was actually very beautiful. Although she was in her 50s, she looked more like a sister to Victoria than a mother. The Cardiffs and the Brokertons chatted amiably. Thelma even pulled Nancy aside, and the two began to whisper to each other. After they all exchanged greetings, Thelma and Harris noticed Damon. Harris laughed even more passionately. He patted Damon's shoulder and said, After so many years, you finally came home. Both the Cardiffs and the Brokertons knew the purpose of this meeting. Harris and Thelma looked at Damon and sized him up. Damon smiled and said humbly, Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Cardiff. The Brokertons were visiting their old friends, the Cardiffs. The two families wanted to introduce their children to each other. Damon and Victoria were the same age and their parents secretly hoped that the two might hit it off. Damon had a humble attitude, which Harris and his wife, Thelma, approved of. The boy had always had a good temperament. Today, he was wearing tailored clothing. He looked very handsome. Harris's and Thelma's eyes lit up when they saw this. Thelma smiled. Hi, Damon. You probably don't remember me but I knew you when you were young. I watched you grow up. I didn't expect you to be so tall now. Oh, when Vicky gets here later, she will definitely be surprised. Like the others, Thelma also secretly hoped that the two kids would fall for each other. She and Nancy had been talking about it since their children were born. However, she was a bit worried that Damon had changed over the years. He'd been missing for so long. What had his adoptive family taught him? What if they were crooks? Perhaps he'd learned bad habits like drinking or gambling. Thelma didn't want to see her daughter marry a person like that. However, Damon looked like he'd been brought up right. Although he'd been gone for so many years, he'd grown into a nice young man. He seemed polite and confident. All in all, at first glance, he passed the test. Now Damon just had to win their daughter's approval. With this thought in mind, the two families went into the hotel with smiles on their faces. Then, Thelma dialed Victoria's number to ask if she was back yet. She heard her daughter's voice on the other line. I'm almost there, mom, don't rush me. 
Before Thelma could say anything, Victoria hung up. Thelma put her phone away and smiled apologetically. Oh, Vicky is just so willful. Please don't take offense. Nancy smiled. She is busy with work and school. How can we blame her? Damon smiled to show that he didn't mind. Victoria no longer held any sense of mystery for him. He already knew that the two of them were not compatible. Seeing Damon smile, Thelma relaxed a little. To be honest, she was quite interested in getting to know more about him. When he was young, he was very polite. He'd been missing for so many years and she didn't know what he'd been up to. Since he was the heir to the Brokerton family, his future was limitless. In addition to this, she admired his self-restraint. All in all, she was very satisfied. Since their guests had arrived, Harris called to the kitchen and had the chef prepare some food. Originally, Thelma had wanted to cook for their guests, but Nancy pulled her aside to chat. In the end, she let the hotel kitchen make the meal. While Harris and Robert talked, from time to time, Mr. Cardiff would turn to Damon and ask him a question. His inquiries were all about finance. Unfortunately, although Damon studied finance, he'd been too busy with his business lately to attend many classes. In fact, he didn't know much about the topic. Realizing this, Harris frowned slightly. However, considering that Damon had been living with an ordinary family for many years, it wasn't surprising that he lacked knowledge on the subject. After all, ordinary people didn't have experience with these kinds of things. However, it didn't matter. If he didn't know, he could learn. At least this young man was a Brokerton. Thus, Harris changed the subject and found something that they could all talk about. After that, the conversation became lively. At this point, the food arrived and everyone took a seat at the table. However, Victoria had yet to return. Thelma frowned and called her again, but this time she didn't answer the phone. After Thelma hung up, she looked out the window and saw a motorcade slowly pulling up in front of the hotel. She broke into a smile. Vicky is back. So this convoy was escorting the Cardiff family's daughter. Sure enough, not long after, someone knocked on the door. The maid quickly went to open it and an extremely beautiful woman walked in. The woman was in her 20s, about the same age as Damon. She was extremely beautiful and she had an indescribable air about her. Her beautiful hair draped over her shoulders and the priceless earrings that she wore sparkled with a bewitching light. She looked like a goddess. Vicky gazed around the room with an indifferent expression on her face. She had a perfect figure. Most men would go crazy for her. Unlike the last two times they'd met, this time Damon was expecting her. He gave her a serious look. When Victoria saw him, she was stunned for a moment. After all, her friend Laura had teased this guy relentlessly the night before. Then he'd squandered an enormous amount of money on an uncut piece of jade. The memory of it was still fresh in her mind. A look of surprise flashed in her eyes, but her cold expression quickly returned. She didn't show any sign of recognition. It was as if they were two complete strangers. Nancy hadn't observed the minute changes in Victoria's expression, and she was secretly worried that her son would come off as rude. After all, he wasn't an extroverted person. Nancy was worried that Victoria's peerless beauty might intimidate her son. She was somewhat worried that Damon would be afraid of Victoria. Nancy had seen many outstanding young men rendered speechless when facing young Miss Cardiff. Fortunately, Damon was making eye contact. However, Nancy could see a trace of astonishment in his expression. Despite this, it didn't come off as rude. The butler pulled out Victoria's chair and the woman sat down. She greeted Robert and Nancy. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Brokerton. She didn't greet Damon. No one knew whether this was intentional or not. Victoria gave her parents a puzzled look. Obviously, she hadn't known that Damon was coming today, nor did she want him there. Harris quickly stretched out his hand and introduced Damon to his daughter. Vicky, do you remember your childhood friend? When you were young, you often played with him. Everyone smiled at Harris's words. However, Victoria smiled only out of courtesy. She looked at Damon. If she had known that he was going to be here today, she wouldn't have agreed to come. At the same time, memories from her childhood surfaced in her mind. However, that was a long time ago and her recollection was vague. Was this man the boy who she used to know? Was he her childhood sweetheart? This thought flashed in her mind and her beautiful face turned pale. Her mind was a mess. The memories of last night surfaced. She didn't know what to think at this moment. Harris, Robert, Nancy, and Thelma started to reminisce about things that had happened when the two children were young. For example, Victoria followed Damon everywhere he went, and Damon always shared his treats with her. They talked about how the two were childhood sweethearts. Victoria wasn't stupid. She knew what their parents were trying to do. She knew that they wanted to set them up together. 
This thought flashed through her mind. While the parents were chatting happily, Victoria suddenly turned to Damon. What are you doing now? Her tone was indifferent and it even carried a hint of aggression. Harris frowned. Nancy and Robert looked at their son. They were worried, but when they saw Damon smile, they relaxed a little. I'm starting my fourth year in September, he replied. Then what do you plan to do after you graduate? Start a business. Nancy quickly added, Yes, actually Damon already started a business. It's called KC Games and it's quite large. More importantly, he did this by himself. Robert and I didn't help him. She said this because she wanted Victoria to know how outstanding her son was. In their world, having a business sense was important. After all, no one wanted to see a large family-run company fall into the hands of someone inexperienced. However, Harris and Victoria frowned when they heard her words. Casey Games? They'd never heard of it. Victoria wasn't impressed. When she saw Nancy speaking for her son, her feeling for indifference turned to disdain. Hence, Victoria asked, Where do you study? Myerson University. Myerson University? Victoria looked confused. She was also in university. She went to Stanford. Although she was still in school, she was already the vice president of a successful company, too. Additionally, her university was one of the top schools in the country. As for Myerson University, to be honest, she hadn't heard much about it. Maybe it was some kind of state-funded school? Seeing Victoria's eyes narrow, Nancy quickly explained, Myerson University is also a top school. Hey, did you know that Damon aced his SATs? Oh, it must be a pretty good university then, right? Victoria smiled, but she sounded doubtful. She'd already formed her own impression of Damon. She'd always been a proud and arrogant person. She came from a prominent family, and all her friends were from the upper crust of society. Furthermore, she had a very discerning eye. Although Damon was the heir of the Brokerton family, she didn't think that there was anything special about him. Furthermore, judging from his behavior last night, he was simply a buffoon. As for the fact that he'd aced his SATs, what did it matter? He was probably just a bookworm with no practical experience. And who'd ever heard of Myerson University? Even if it was a top school, it wasn't Ivy League. To her, it was as unremarkable as a state-funded school. Frankly speaking, she'd seen too many spoiled rich kids abuse their family's power to do evil things. Although she didn't know what kind of character her so-called childhood sweetheart had, from what she'd seen yesterday, he had no taste. He'd been gone for too long, and he didn't belong in their world anymore. Who knew what sort of bad habits he'd picked up? Would he abuse the Brokerton's power and wealth? Was he a thief or a pervert? Did he have a bad temper? After all, he had grown up in a harsh environment. Who knew what he'd had to do to survive? He hadn't received a proper education, so naturally, he couldn't be expected to fit in among the elites. In short, Victoria had seen what the people who lived at the bottom of society were like. To be honest, she'd had many negative experiences with people like that. They came from two different worlds. They had nothing in common. Therefore, she wasn't interested. Damon knew what she was thinking, but he didn't care. The older people in the room seemed to have noticed the change in Victoria's expression. An awkward look flashed across Nancy's face. All mothers were protective of their children, even if those children were substandard. Therefore, at this moment, Victoria didn't voice her opinion. She didn't want to cause trouble. As for Thelma, naturally she'd noticed that her daughter wasn't interested in Damon. She looked somewhat embarrassed. In her opinion, he was an outstanding young man. Originally, she'd thought that playing matchmaker would be easy. She hadn't expected her daughter to be the problem, but soon, the four parents came to the conclusion that perhaps the two children just needed time to get to know each other. After all, they hadn't had much contact. Were there hard feelings between them? If that was the case, as long as the two of them spent more time together, they'd slowly gain more understanding and they'd eventually come to like one another. Thus, although they could see that Victoria wasn't interested in Damon, the parents were still optimistic. They continued talking about interesting things from the past. They wanted to jog the memories of these childhood sweethearts and indirectly increase the bond between them. Before they knew it, lunch was over. Afterwards, Robert and Harris talked about some business-related matters, and the women gossiped about their friends. Thelma urged her daughter to take Damon for a walk in the gardens outside the hotel. Although Victoria was unwilling, she didn't want to be rude, so she led Damon outside. The Boston was a five-star hotel, so the ground and facilities were all very posh. Victoria and Damon walked a few feet apart. During the stroll, they didn't speak. Damon felt bored, but he didn't have particularly strong feelings about Victoria one way or the other. He felt that he should take the initiative to strike up a conversation. Even if they didn't date, they could still be friends, right? So he smiled and said, 
I remember you. When you were young, you always came to play at our house. The Brokertons were visiting their old friends, the Cardiffs. At her mother's urging, Victoria took Damon for a walk in the gardens. At first, neither he nor her spoke. Eventually, he tried to strike up a friendly conversation. Initially, he'd assumed that even if she didn't like him, she would still be polite for her parents' sake. However, when he tried talking to her, she didn't answer right away. She looked at him for a while, then finally said, It's impossible. Don't even bother trying. When she said this, her eyes were cold and emotionless. Clearly, she had a lot of contempt for him. This sentence stunned him. He wasn't insulted, but he asked in surprise. Why? We are not from the same world. Her words were blunt. I'm not talking in terms of wealth. Our lifestyles are very different. We didn't grow up in the same world, so we have nothing in common. As she spoke, she avoided his gaze. He was getting annoyed. Vicky continued, My parents told me that you were only recently reunited with Nancy and Robert. I heard that you grew up with a poor family. Seeing the look of disdain on Victoria's face, Damon was curious to know what else this proud young woman had to say. He nodded and said, Yes. I knew it. Victoria sighed. Before they found you, you were probably just happy that you'd gotten into university. You probably thought that your life couldn't get any better, right? And then you found out that you're the heir of the Brokerton family. You must have been overjoyed. It must have been a big change, right? She'd already made up her mind about him. Last night, Damon had squandered a fortune on a worthless stone. This was Victoria's ironclad proof. Damon opened his mouth, but she didn't give him a chance to speak. Don't quibble, and your so-called KC games? Frankly speaking, I've never heard of it. Feeling Victoria's prejudice against him, Damon didn't try to speak again. She continued, I'm studying at Stanford University, and I'm now the vice president of a successful company. If you can prove that you're as successful as me without relying on your family's help, I will consider dating you. Otherwise, forget about it. Victoria was worried that Damon didn't know about her company, Season Capital, so she explained, Season Capital is one of the top private investment firms in the country. We manage billions of dollars. If you are ever that successful, then I will agree to date you. In her opinion, that was impossible. The discussion was over. Damon said quietly, Well, I guess we'll have to see what happens then, right? He had no interest in dating Victoria. He was just trying to annoy this proud and arrogant woman. As for her so-called company, Damon hadn't heard of it before. Although Everbright's current market value was down, at one point it had also been worth billions. Additionally, he had Astronet, which had more than 600 million users and was still growing rapidly. It was shaping up to become a social media giant. Given time, Damon was confident that his company would be more successful than Victoria's. Furthermore, it would likely happen soon. Sure enough, when Victoria heard his comment, a flash of anger appeared on her pretty face. She sneered, Hmm, what's there to see? Don't be naive. After saying that, she wouldn't even look at him. She just turned and started walking back. Damon had an unhappy expression on his face. Since she was leaving, he followed her back. She walked ahead of him the whole way back to the suite. The two of them walked into the room one after the other. Seeing them, Thelma stood up and asked, Why are you back so soon? Nancy also stood up. She looked at them in confusion. She noticed their strained expressions and her heart fell. Sure enough, Victoria cast a glance at Damon and said casually, I don't want anything to do with him. When Victoria said this, the older women's expressions changed drastically. Harris, who was chatting with Robert, stood up and said angrily, Vicky, why are you being so rude? His daughter narrowed her eyes. Father, I'm sick of you meddling in my life. Why are you forcing me to hang out with someone who I don't like? Harris's expression turned extremely ugly. He found Victoria's behavior very rude. She was insulting the Brokertons. It was an embarrassment. Harris was angry now. How can you behave like this in front of our guests? Unexpectedly, Victoria argued back. She coldly replied, Father, stop trying to play matchmaker. It's never going to work. This guy is a loser. She'd gone too far. Nancy and Robert tried their best to suppress their anger, but their expressions changed drastically. After all, they never thought that Victoria would openly insult their son. Harris was even angrier. His face turned pale. He raised his voice and shouted, Shut up! Thelma was scared. She quickly went over and held Victoria in her arms. She turned on her husband. What are you doing? Don't yell at your daughter! Harris ignored his wife and daughter and said to Robert, 
I'm sorry, I think the kids must have had some sort of misunderstanding. I will talk to Vicky later. Victoria was seething. Her father had always loved her, and he never raised his voice in anger. A look of embarrassment flashed in her eyes, but soon a look of hatred replaced it. Let me tell you something. I'll never date your son, she said to Robert with her head proudly raised. She continued, Mr. and Mrs. Brokerton, I have a lot of respect for you, but I'm not interested in your son. I'm sorry, if one day Damon becomes more successful than me, perhaps I'll reconsider. Robert's and Nancy's expressions turned extremely ugly. It was unlikely that their son would outshine Victoria. They knew all about season capital. The company's success shocked even Robert. Victoria's proposition was basically an outright refusal. Although Damon was a capable guy, it was unlikely that his business would ever be as successful as Victoria's. Even if it did, this likely wouldn't happen for many years. Clearly, Victoria had no interest in Damon. Furthermore, it seemed as if she strongly disliked him. Although Harris knew that his daughter was proud and arrogant, he hadn't expected her to be so stubborn. The parents were all shocked. Nancy wanted to stand up for her son and tell Victoria that his future was bright. However, this seemed pointless. The woman had already made up her mind about him. What, you don't think you can do it? Or would you rather just spend your parents' money instead of earning your own? Victoria looked at him proudly. She couldn't conceal her disdain. But at this moment, Damon was so angry that he laughed. He didn't care if this woman looked down on him. However, she was insulting Robert and Nancy. He wouldn't tolerate it. Despite his tense relationship with his birth parents, he wouldn't stand there and listen to this woman insult them. He smiled. When he had everyone's attention, he growled. Don't worry, I'm not interested in you either. You are just rotten. You're a waste of my time. Also, I really don't care about your achievements. Two years from now, my company will be much more successful than your little investment firm. Two years from now? The older people in the room gasped. Even Nancy, who was on her son's side, didn't know where Damon got the courage to say such a thing. Nancy tugged her son's arm, wanting him to stand down. Victoria looked at him with surprise. Where did this guy get his confidence? How dare he say such words? But soon she laughed and softly said, I don't know why you dare to say such a thing. Maybe you don't know very much about season capital. How about this? I will give you five years. If you are more successful than me in five years from now, I'll date you. Do you think I need that long? You think too highly of yourself. Two years is long enough. You don't even know what you're saying. Damon looked proud and his tone was overbearing. He continued, Two years from now, I'll be looking down on you from a pie. All right, let's wait and see. If in two years' time you are more successful than me, I'll agree to date you, Victoria said coldly. She had a mocking look on her face. She didn't want to talk to him anymore. She'd met plenty of arrogant and conceited fellows like him before, and she wanted to put him in his place. At this point, Robert and Nancy decided that they didn't want to stay any longer. Their children had driven a wedge between the two families. After saying goodbye, Robert led Nancy and Damon out of the hotel. They got into the car together and headed for home. On the way back to the mansion, the mood in the car was a little dull. The unhappy meeting had cast a shadow on them all. They felt low. Robert finally said, Damon, when are you going to start working for the Brokerton Group? Our headquarters is based in Meyerson. Damon was stunned. He instantly understood Robert's intention. Victoria's words must have hit on something. Robert wanted to start grooming Damon to take over the family business sooner than planned. Now that Damon was back in their lives, Naturally, Robert wanted to train him as his successor. Although Silas was currently in charge of the Brokerton Group, Damon was Robert's biological son. No matter how capable Silas was, Damon still had a leg up on him. Silas would continue to be a core member of the team, but he was no longer Robert's heir. In the future, Damon would be the true leader of the Brokerton Group. However, he'd lived with an ordinary family for many years. He definitely didn't understand the rules of the game, especially in the finance industry. Therefore, Robert planned to wait until his son had familiarized himself with the world of business before handing over the reins. He planned to first send Damon to further his studies. After all, the boss of the company couldn't appear nepotistic. If Damon was promoted just like that, many people would object. But time waited for no one. Damon had two years to surpass Victoria. Without Robert's help, how could he possibly achieve this? Mr. Brokerton felt that he had something to prove. He wanted to wipe the smug look off Victoria's face. He was proud, and he wouldn't tolerate anyone embarrassing his son like that. Therefore, he decided to speed up his plan. He'd let Damon take over the business in Meyerson first. After his son got the hang of it, he would eventually transfer control of the entire empire to him. This way, 
Damon would learn faster. If Damon agreed, he might actually be able to succeed at Victoria's challenge within two years. When the time came, he would be invincible. He'd be in control of the entire Brokerton group. It was obvious that Robert had put a lot of thought into this plan, but Damon shook his head. You don't have to worry about me. I can handle things. Although his voice was calm, it carried a trace of unquestionable confidence. Nancy took this for arrogance, and she couldn't help but anxiously say, Honey, don't be stubborn. Do you know who Vicky is? She is the vice president of Season Capital. You... Damon interrupted her. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I have my ways. Let's talk about something else. Knowing their son's personality, Nancy and Robert knew better than to say anything else. After all, they'd only recently been reunited, and they knew better than to push him. If he got annoyed and left again, then the gains wouldn't make up for the losses. Therefore, Nancy remained silent. A few minutes later, she said, Honey, do you remember your grandfather? It's his birthday in a few days. I heard that he's been having some trouble recently, so your father and I want to take you to see him. It's my grandfather's birthday? It was Damon's grandfather's birthday soon. Nancy wanted Damon to come with them to see him. Hearing this, Damon frowned. His memories of his grandfather were unpleasant. The old man was very strict. Nancy's relationship with her father-in-law was often strained. It was hard for Damon to describe how he felt about the man. He didn't want to see him. When Nancy talked about him, her expression seemed somewhat unnatural. However, when Damon told her that he didn't want to go, it was obvious that she was a little taken aback. Therefore, Damon thought for a moment and said, I haven't seen him in years. He probably doesn't even remember me. At this moment, Robert spoke up. Your grandfather has been in the hospital recently, so it's a good time to go and see him. Furthermore, this is only a family dinner. It's not a big event. Nancy added, Honey, it's time to get to know your grandparents. Damon hesitated for a moment and then nodded. All right. In fact, he didn't want to go, but he couldn't stand to hear Nancy beg, so he gave in. But then he remembered that his grandparents lived in D.C. When he thought of this, his heart skipped a beat. That meant he'd be close to Fiona. If he went to her school, he might be able to see her, even if just from afar. Although Damon knew that he should forget about his ex, it wasn't that easy. He knew that he was being disloyal to Avery, but the temptation to see Fiona was just too great. He needed closure. He still missed her. Perhaps he couldn't get over her because he hadn't said goodbye properly. Perhaps if he saw her from afar, then he would realize that she didn't love him anymore and he would feel at ease. Then he could finally let go of her and completely devote himself to Avery. Nancy and Robert were overjoyed when they heard their son agree to come along. This further proved that Damon was gradually accepting them as his family again. The next day, the three of them boarded their private jet and set off for the capital. On the plane, Damon felt both excited and worried. Other than meeting his grandparents again, it was also very likely that he would meet Fiona. He was worried about seeing her. She hadn't recognized his voice or his number when he called. That night, the three of them stayed in a five-star hotel in D.C. called The Upton. This hotel was one of the Brokerton's group's properties. Robert and Nancy had private rooms on the top floor. Only the family could stay there. When they arrived at the hotel, the manager held a grand welcoming ceremony with all the employees. He was honored to meet the head of the Brokerton group. He wanted to make a good impression. Perhaps it would help him get a promotion. Damon stayed in a room with a balcony. His room had a stunning view of the capital. He looked up the location of the DC Academy of Music. He planned to go there tomorrow so he could set his mind at ease. He didn't want to spend the whole trip worrying about Fiona. After breakfast the next day, he said goodbye to Nancy and Robert and went out alone. The DC Academy of Music has produced many famous celebrities. Damon had heard that the school was full of handsome men and beautiful women. He wanted to see this for himself. When he got to campus and started looking around, he found that the rumors were indeed true. This was no ordinary school. The men were tall and handsome, and the women were slim and graceful. The academy really lived up to its reputation. However, as Damon walked around the campus, he realized something. He didn't have any information about Fiona. How was he going to find her? Furthermore, when he thought about the phone call, his blood ran cold. What would he do if he ran into Fiona and her new boyfriend? Although the likelihood of this happening was low, what would he do if he did see her? However, he knew he was overthinking things. It was more likely that he wouldn't find her at all. After all, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. 
However, he found it comforting to walk around and see the places where Fiona lived and studied now. Damon saw a bulletin board and went over to have a look. Some posters about the school's most influential students were posted on it. Damon read the posters and found that these students were quite famous. Many of them had signed contracts with big recording labels. Some had even made names for themselves in the music industry. The most outstanding among them were even on the verge of being as famous as Avery. They were known nationwide. However, one of the pictures caught his eye, and he froze. Perhaps it was fate. Although he thought it would be difficult to find Fiona, here she was, staring him right in the eye. Her picture was placed in the most prominent position on the entire bulletin board, as if to let everyone know that she was the brightest star in the school. In the picture, her smile was even more beautiful than he remembered. She was unforgettable. He took a step closer to get a better look. In his memories, she always had a mischievous expression on her face. She liked to act like a bit of a princess. However, in the photo, she looked like she'd grown up. She was even more beautiful and moving than before. Her demeanor reminded him of Veronica. She was absolutely beautiful. However, she still looked approachable. She looked like a fairy that had fallen into the mortal world. Their lives were like two parallel lines. Damon hadn't thought that their paths would cross again. However, now it seemed that their lives were destined to intersect. Right when Damon had almost given up hope of finding her, she appeared in front of him. He had his own life at Myerson University now, and Fiona had a fulfilling and wonderful life here in D.C. Damon? He was lost in thought when he heard someone calling his name behind him. He turned around and saw a beautiful woman standing there. She greeted him enthusiastically. Janice? They'd gone to high school together. Back then, Janice was the class president. She was the one who always organized their high school reunions. He'd heard that she was studying in the DC Academy of Music, but he hadn't expected to run into her here. Fate had brought them together. Damon laughed. <laughs> what a coincidence. I knew you studied here, but I didn't expect to see you today. Yeah, what a surprise. Janice nodded and smiled sweetly. Aren't you studying at Meyerson University? What are you doing here? Myerson is pretty far away. I came here for business, Damon replied, looking at his watch. Running into an old friend like this is such a coincidence, and it's time for lunch. Why don't we go eat together? Janice was happy to have run into him, so she nodded. Okay, since this is my territory, I'll treat you. Damon didn't refuse. It was good to see her again. It was lunchtime, so the two walked to a restaurant. Janice was familiar with the campus. She brought Damon somewhere nearby. The atmosphere was pleasant, and the prices were fair. The food here was also very good. Janice often ate here. The two of them sat down and ordered. Damon smiled. You've been studying here for a few years, right? After you graduate, you'll probably become a big star. I should get your autograph. If you really become famous, it will be worth a lot of money someday. Do you think so? I'm not sure about that. Janice spoke in a low voice. Getting famous is easier said than done. When I was in high school, I was confident that I could make it happen one day, but now I'm not so sure. The world is full of outstanding people. I'm just a single drop in an ocean of talent. I'm insignificant. In high school, Janice had been at the top of her class. She was from a well-off family and she was pretty and smart. Her personality was cheerful and upbeat. However, the DC Academy of Music catered to the most elite talents in the country. Everyone here wanted to become a star. Back in high school, a lot of guys had crushes on Janice. But when she got to the Academy, she was no longer popular. She couldn't help but feel a little disappointed. The world was a big place. At the end of the day, most people were just average. After catching up on each other's news, Damon finally asked, By the way, do you know a woman named Fiona? Fiona? Janice blinked her eyes in surprise. You must mean Fiona from the music program, right? Damon thought for a moment. He thought that she was in the music program, but he wasn't sure. He elaborated. She transferred from Meyerson University not long ago. Then it must be her, Janice affirmed. Why do you ask? Before he could say anything, Janice exclaimed with surprise. Don't tell me that you like her. Why do you say that? I know what guys are like, Janice looked at him with disdain and continued. But let's put it this way, a lot of guys like Fiona. It's no exaggeration to say that everyone knows her. She's one of the most popular women in our school. Ever since she transferred here, hundreds of guys have confessed their love to her. Want to know something else? She's reputed to be the prettiest woman on campus. Earning such a reputation was not something that could be achieved with looks alone. One also needed to have extraordinary talent, 
and the personality to go with it. In short, it was impressive. Damon's heart began to beat faster. He remembered the photo of her that he'd seen on the bulletin board. She did indeed look more perfect than before. They'd split less than a year ago, but she'd already been reborn. She had grown into an elegant young woman. However, everyone was changing. They were all growing up. Didn't the same go for himself? Damon shook his head in response to Janice's question. No, it's not about that. Janice nodded and went on. That's lucky. Otherwise, you'd have to wait in line. You probably wouldn't stand a chance either. Those who dare to pursue her are all top students. Some of them are even famous celebrities already. I heard that Fiona is performing in a big concert next year. The show will tour to several different cities. She is one of the headliners. She has admirers all across the country. She's already famous. Ordinary people continued living their ordinary lives, while those destined for greatness flourished. Fiona's career was already taking off. Why did you ask about her? Janice inquired. When she was still at Myerson, we knew each other. We used to be very close. Oh, I see. Janice trailed off. She already knew that Fiona had transferred from Myerson University. She pursed her lips and smiled. Luckily, you seem like a smart guy. You know your limits, right? Fiona is out of reach now. You can dream about her, but you don't stand a chance with her anymore. Damon's heart sank. He knew that he had talent, but after listening to Janice's words, his confidence began to waver. Feelings faded with time. Moreover, it sounded like Fiona had changed a lot since leaving Myerson. She was probably surrounded with guys who were all more outstanding than he was. Did she even still remember him anymore? Sometimes Damon felt like their time together had all been a dream. His memories of her were already fading. Therefore, his expression was somewhat confused. Janice patted his shoulder. Don't be upset. I'm not trying to attack you. It's just that Fiona is on a whole different level now. Ordinary people like us can't compare. It's easier if you just accept it. Focus on what you can control and strive to do your best. In Janice's eyes, Damon was still the same guy he had been back in high school. He'd aced his SATs so clearly he was an intelligent guy. However, compared to someone like Fiona, he was in a different league. Janice didn't think he stood a chance with women like Fiona or Avery. Little did she know that he was also a legend in his own right. One day, he'd be even more dazzling than Avery and even more brilliant than Fiona. Thank you, Damon nodded. He knew that Janice had good intentions. Regardless of whether he was willing to let Fiona go or not, she had her own life to live. Damon had to focus on himself. Perhaps one day, fate would bring them back together. Feeling melancholy, Damon said goodbye to Janice and quietly left the DC Academy of Music. He returned to the hotel. At noon, he, Robert, and Nancy ate together. The hotel staff arrived at the Brokerton's private suites with the food. There weren't many dishes, but each one was exquisite. The food was delicious. In fact, although the Brokerton family had a huge fortune, they usually lived quite modestly. They wanted to preserve their wealth, so they were thrifty. When the Brokertons first reunited with Damon, Nancy often cooked sumptuous meals for him. She hadn't known what he liked to eat, so she always made a variety of dishes. Now that she knew his tastes, naturally she didn't need to make a big fuss. She just ordered the things that he liked. Our company is starting a huge real estate project in Myerson soon. When we go back, do you want to go and take a look? Robert suddenly asked while they were all eating. Damon was stunned. He thought for a moment before replying. I'm going into my fourth year and I'm nervous about my studies. I'm not sure if I'll have time. Robert frowned slightly. If you do, you should go and see it. Let me know when you are free. I can ask Silas to bring you. Since you live in Myerson, you should learn about our projects there. It will be beneficial to you in the future. Actually, Robert was a little anxious. He was getting older. In the past, he'd planned to let Silas take over the company. However, now that his son was back, naturally he wanted to groom him as his successor. Damon had to learn about the industry. But more importantly, Damon had to achieve a lot in the next two years if he wanted to start a relationship with Victoria Cardiff. Robert had his heart set on this, but he knew that the gap between his son and Harris's daughter was huge. If Damon was to succeed, there was no time to waste. Not only did Robert want his son to date and potentially marry Victoria, but he also didn't want to see his son humiliated. No one looked down on the Brokertons. Robert had to help his son rise to the challenge. He didn't want to see him embarrassed. Therefore, 
When Robert saw that Damon didn't seem to care about getting involved in the family business, he felt anxious. Damon seemed unbothered. He smiled at his father. I am not interested in real estate. There's no need to show me the project. Nancy listened to this exchange. She hadn't expected Damon to reject the offer. Hearing this, she felt a little anxious too. Honey, don't be so stubborn. You should get more involved. In the future, you will take over your father's business. Damon didn't seem to be listening, so Nancy went on. Besides, do you remember the agreement between you and Victoria? You said that you needed only two years. If you don't apply yourself, it will be very difficult for you to achieve this. Even though she knew that their son would continue being stubborn, she felt like she had to say something out loud. In reality, it was unlikely that Damon would be able to surpass Victoria in just two years. Such a thing was practically impossible. But Nancy didn't want to hurt her son's self-esteem, so she didn't say this aloud. She was trying to be tactful. Even so, she still felt anxious. Damon, on the other hand, looked calm. He picked up his fork and knife and started eating his steak. He said slowly, I know what I'm doing. You don't have to worry about it. I won't embarrass the family. His words were calm and steady. Even though Nancy and Robert were anxious, they felt calmer after hearing this. Although they didn't know where he got his confidence, his claim wasn't entirely baseless. The Brokertons knew that their son had talent. However, they still wanted to help him realize his full potential. If Damon succeeded, Nancy and Robert would be very proud. They'd be able to hold their heads up high. Robert's father, Everett, and his mother, June, valued their grandchildren a lot. Although they hated Nancy, they weren't stupid. They knew that for their family to prosper, they had to rely on the younger generation. Robert had an older brother named Arnold, a younger brother named Simon, and a sister named Denise. He also had many cousins. The Brokerton family was huge. Robert, Arnold, Simon, and Denise weren't young anymore. Their children were already grown up. The grandparents would do anything for these grandchildren. However, Robert's son had gone missing at the age of five. For this reason, Robert's mother, June, was cold towards Nancy. She blamed her for what happened. June had even asked Simon to get his son Silas to help with Robert's business. However, now that Damon was back, Robert couldn't let his business fall into someone else's hands. As such, Robert's relationship with his parents was also somewhat strained. Nancy hoped that since Damon was back, Everett and June would let bygones be bygones. Perhaps they could wipe the slate clean. After lunch, Nancy, Robert, and Damon left the hotel and headed to the hospital where Everett was. Along the way, the family rode in silence. Damon looked out the window in a daze. When they got to the hospital, the nurse led them to a private room. This wing of the building was extremely elegant. Apart from family and friends, no one else could enter. The wing was heavily guarded. People who stayed here were all influential figures, so security was tight. Everett was staying in one of the last rooms in the wing. His room even had a small garden outside. It was very peaceful. The family had hired a private security firm to guard him. He was a very important person and they had to take the utmost care. After Robert showed his ID to the guard at the door, the man told them to wait. Then he went in to report. Not long after, a bald middle-aged man came out of the room. It was Robert's older brother, Arnold. Arnold's son, Tyson, was in the military. He was a sergeant, and like Silas, he was one of the most successful grandchildren in the Brokerton family. As for Robert's other brother, Simon, he had two sons. Apart from Silas, there was also Sawyer, who'd also made great achievements in the business world. He'd already started a successful company. He and his brother Silas were prominent figures in the Brokerton family. Naturally, their grandparents, Everett and June, loved them a lot. In the future, these grandchildren would carry on the Brokerton name. Damon's three cousins, Silas, Tyson, and Sawyer, were all very successful. In the middle generation, Robert was the most successful among his siblings. Although his big brother Arnold was an important member of the government, his success still couldn't compare to Robert's. The Brokerton Group was one of the biggest corporations in the world. Regretfully, Robert had lost his son. However, now it seemed that the boy had returned. Some people had doubts about this. Grandparents Everett and June were among the skeptics. Apart from the fact that they hadn't seen him for so many years, Damon had been living with an ordinary family all this time. Who knew what they'd taught him? He could have picked up all kinds of bad habits. People were limited by their circumstances, after all. In short, their grandson was no longer the same person who he used to be when he was young. He was a stranger to them. Arnold was extremely polite to Nancy. He welcomed her warmly. In fact, out of the whole family, he was perhaps the only one who hadn't turned against her after Damon went missing. 
After greeting Robert and Nancy, Arnold finally turned to Damon. His nephew was all grown up now. He looked very different from the last time that they'd met. Therefore, Arnold shot his brother an inquiring gaze. Robert smiled and said, Yes, this is your nephew, Damon. After confirming that his guess was correct, Arnold became excited. He quickly went over and looked his nephew up and down. After realizing that this wasn't an illusion, he finally laughed out loud. <laughs> Good. I didn't expect to see you again. You finally came back. Wow, I really missed you. As he spoke, Arnold got even more excited. He looked to be on the verge of tears. Seeing his uncle's reaction made Damon feel a little sad. Of course, he remembered his uncle. The members of this family could be considered somewhat cold. This was a rare moment of warmth. So Damon smiled back. His uncle Arnold kept nodding. It's good that you're back. Your mother said that you aced your SATs and got into Myerson University. Congrats. Damon nodded slightly. Arnold went on enthusiastically. When your mother told me, at first I didn't believe her. I do now, though. Oh, you really are a Brokerton. Unlike Victoria, Arnold knew all about Myerson University. He knew it was a top school, and he was honored that his nephew attended. Everyone stood at the door and chatted for a while. Finally, Arnold led them into the room. Naturally, the hospital that Grandpa Everett was in was the best in the region. It was fully equipped and staffed with the best doctors in the world. When Robert and his family walked into the room, they saw Grandpa Everett lying in bed reading a newspaper. A woman, who was about Damon's age, sat beside him reading a book. The old man seemed to be in good health. Damon looked at him and found that he looked much older now. He hadn't seen his grandfather in more than a decade. The man's back, which used to be straight, was now slightly hunched. He had white hair at his temples. It went to show that time marched on for rich and poor alike. Although they hadn't seen each other in a long time, Damon still remembered the man. He didn't have a good impression of him. He remembered how the man had treated him and his parents. Because of this, he didn't feel a strong connection with him. The woman who was sitting beside the bed was dressed very fashionably. Her long red hair draped over her shoulders, and she looked curiously at Damon's family with her big eyes. She must be his cousin, his Aunt Denise's daughter. What was his cousin's name again? Was it Charlotte? Yes, that seemed right. They met when they were very young. He remembered her as an unruly and stubborn girl. In short, he didn't have a good impression of her either. He saw Charlotte looking at him, so he smiled back. Since it was like they were meeting for the first time, he was trying to be friendly. However, Charlotte frowned at him. She had a look of disdain on her face as if she didn't care about him at all. He wanted to comment, but in the end, he decided against it. Although he was annoyed, he kept his expression neutral. Charlotte stood up. She smiled sweetly at Everett and said, Grandpa, it's a little stuffy in here. I'm going to go out and get some fresh air. Everett put down his teacup and said kindly, Fine, don't go far though. We are going home to eat soon. Okay. Charlotte nodded and turned to Arnold. Uncle, I am going out for a breath of fresh air. Come back soon, he replied with a nod. Charlotte hesitated for a moment. Finally, she smiled at Robert. It's nice to see you, Uncle Robert. He gave her a nod too. She didn't have any intention of talking to Damon or Nancy. It was as if they were strangers passing each other on the street. She was being very rude. It wasn't surprising, though. Her grandma June had likely influenced her opinion of them. The Brokertons were a proud, aristocratic family. Damon was a stranger to them, and they weren't going to just welcome him with open arms. After Charlotte left, Everett put down his newspaper. He looked at Robert and his family. Finally, his gaze landed on Damon, who he hadn't seen for more than ten years of his life. Everett's eyes were full of vigor. He stared at Damon for a few seconds before nodding in relief. He addressed Robert. You're here. He didn't cry or get upset as Robert had expected. The old man remained calm. Yes, I heard that you're sick, so I came to see you, Robert explained. And you're Damon, right? Your dad called and told me about what happened. He tells me about you every time that we talk. Damon smiled politely. Yes, sir, that's me. His tone wasn't distant, but it wasn't friendly either. Nancy urged. Honey, call him Grandpa. Everett waited with anticipation, but Damon just continued looking at him. He wasn't going to call him Grandpa. Perhaps one day he would, but not today. Damon was meeting his grandfather again for the first time in more than a decade. 
He refused to address the old man as Grandpa. At this, Grandpa Everett's eyes dimmed a little. He sighed. It's fine, don't force him. He's all grown up. I don't expect him to call me that anymore. Unfortunately, I wasn't around to watch you grow up. I wish I had been. Child, have you suffered a lot since you disappeared? Damon shook his head. Thank you for your concern, but I've had a good life. Oh, that's good. The old man blinked back tears. Arnold stepped in. Your grandpa never forgot you. He still looks at your childhood photos. He expected you to still be chubby like you used to be. None of us expected you to be so tall and handsome. Damon's expression remained calm. He didn't have any intention of replying. The atmosphere was a little awkward. To lighten the mood, Nancy took some pill bottles out of her purse and put them on Grandpa Everett's side table and smiled at him. Everett, since you've been having heart problems recently, I brought you some supplements. These pills are good for heart disease and the like. After saying this, Nancy instructed him on how to take them, Arnold said. Thanks, Nancy, that's very considerate. He smiled and continued. Dad has been talking about you guys a lot lately. He's especially happy that Damon is back. Later on, after you all visit, we can have dinner together. Damon had no desire to spend more time with these people, but Nancy quickly answered for all of them. Okay, sounds great. It was obvious that she was eager to bring their family back together. As for what they'd done to her in the past, she was willing to let bygones be bygones. She was wise and gracious. Grandpa Everett and Arnold both nodded. Back when Nancy and Robert first met, Grandpa Everett and Grandma June hadn't liked her. They thought that she was with their son only for his money. They had even tried to stop the marriage. Everett and June hadn't even attended the wedding. However, with time, it became obvious to them that Robert and Nancy were deeply in love. The couple had stayed together despite their parents' objections. Grandpa Everett finally realized that no matter how much he opposed their union, he couldn't keep them apart. Furthermore, after so many years, they came to know Nancy. Although Everett and June were cold to her, she never complained about the way they treated her. Moreover, she did her best to please and accommodate them. She wanted them to like her. But the harder she tried, the more Grandma June looked down on her. This caused Nancy a lot of pain. Has Grandpa Everett finally come to his senses? Today, the old man felt a little regretful, especially when he saw how Damon had returned. This, combined with how nice Nancy was being, made him feel guilty for how he'd treated her in the past. However, Grandpa Everett was old-fashioned. Although he felt guilty, he was too embarrassed to admit his mistake and apologize to her. However, at this moment, his demeanor towards her was undoubtedly much better. The adults started chatting. Damon was worried that they would drag him into the conversation. Furthermore, he didn't really like most of them, so he excused himself and went to the bathroom. The hospital wing had a pleasant atmosphere. Damon went to the bathroom, and then he wandered around. Suddenly, he heard someone talking on the phone in a corner. Damon looked to see who it was and saw his cousin Charlotte. He didn't want to eavesdrop, so he turned to leave. Just as he was about to walk away, he suddenly heard her laugh. <laughs> Sawyer, just wait till you meet our new cousin. He's a loser. Ugh, why did he even bother coming back? He's been gone for so long. He doesn't belong here. Anyway, I definitely won't call him my cousin. It's so embarrassing. Charlotte listened as the person on the other line talked, but Damon couldn't hear that half of the conversation. His cousin laughed again. Mm, okay, then it's a deal. I will embarrass this loser and send him running back to New York City. She listened as the other person spoke, nodding eagerly the whole time. All right, all right, I'll try your idea. It will embarrass his parents, too. Are you talking about me? Damon interrupted. Charlotte, who'd had her back to him the entire time, turned around when she heard his voice. Oh! She was shocked and her face instantly turned red when she saw him. What are you doing here? Why are you eavesdropping on my conversation, loser? Damon could hear the person on the other line asking what was wrong. Charlotte said, Sawyer, I'll talk to you later. That loser heard our whole conversation. After saying this, she hung up and put her phone into her pocket. Her expression changed drastically as she turned to face Damon. She shouted, Don't you have any morals? Don't you know the rules? You've been gone for too long. You can't just come waltzing back in here like nothing happened. It doesn't work like that. Damon smiled. He took a deep breath and said, I may not have morals, but I'm still better than a two-faced bitch like you. I heard you scheming against me. What did you call me? How dare you? She was so angry that her entire body was trembling. But thinking about it, she realized that she had indeed been in the wrong. 
there was no point in denying it. However, she was still angry that Damon dared to look down on her. Well, it's true. Damon gave her a cold look. Charlotte suppressed her anger. She stared at him for a long time. Finally, she retorted, Just leave me alone, okay, loser? After saying this, she stormed off. Damon smiled coldly. After walking around for a while longer, he returned to his grandfather's room. The mood inside was lighter now. Grandpa Everett probably knew that Robert was still upset with him, so he chatted with Nancy instead. He asked her many questions, and she answered them one by one. But when Damon returned, he saw that Charlotte was there too. She was smiling, but now Damon knew how she really felt. She was a hypocrite. Seeing Damon return, Grandpa Everett warmly introduced him to Charlotte. This is your cousin. When you left home, she was only three years old. Do you remember her? Damon nodded and shook his hands with Charlotte like nothing had happened. His cousin acted like a perfect angel in front of the rest of the family. No one else had any idea about the fight. Grandpa Everett sighed. Nancy, I really regret all the mistakes that I've made. If your father was here, I would apologize to him. Unfortunately, my father is not here. He's away on a trip, she replied. Grandpa Everett stroked his beard. Your father is an impressive guy. Twenty years ago, I didn't realize it. Now I'm willing to admit that he's a better man than me. He sounded humble. Naturally, the conversation was going well. The sky outside the window was gradually getting darker, so Arnold interrupted. Dad, I'm going to pick up Simon, okay? Grandpa Everett nodded. Okay, drive safely. Due to Grandpa Everett's physical condition, he couldn't join them for dinner. Around six o'clock in the evening, everyone bid farewell to the old man and went to Arnold's house. Arnold's house had a high brick wall around it. To passers-by, the house behind the wall seemed strange and mysterious. Damon remembered coming here when he was young, but his memories of it were fuzzy. It had been more than ten years since he'd stepped foot in this place. Now, everything seemed unfamiliar. When Damon, Robert, and Nancy arrived at the house, no one came out to welcome them. As they stood at the entrance, the only living thing that came to greet them was a dog. The little thing curiously stood up on its back paws and looked out the window. Then it barked loudly. Robert tried the door and found it open, so they let themselves in. Inside, the living room was crowded and lively. Many people were chatting. No one noticed the three of them entering. Then, Arnold walked in behind them. Everyone stood up to welcome him. After all, Arnold was the man of the house. He was also the oldest son. As such, he was the head of the family after Grandpa Everett. Grandpa Everett and Grandma June had a total of four children, three sons and one daughter. Damon's aunts and uncles had many children and even a few grandchildren. The Brokerton family had four generations of relatives. However, most of these family members weren't very friendly to Damon's family. Although they smiled and chatted with Robert, they were cold to Nancy and Damon. They seemed to look down on them for some reason. Although Grandpa Everett's attitude toward them had slightly improved, Grandma June's remained the same. After Robert and his family arrived, Grandma June took Robert aside to have a word with him. Everyone heard her yelling at her son in the other room. She'd heard that Nancy and Damon had gone to the hospital to visit Grandpa Everett. After she finished yelling, she went into the guest room and refused to come out. She was avoiding Damon and Nancy. It was obvious that she didn't like them. Their mere presence upset her. Naturally, Arnold was the host. He had a close relationship with Robert and Nancy. However, this didn't mean that others felt the same way. Although Robert was family, many of them disliked his wife. As such, they were cold toward her and Damon. Robert was the middle son. He had a younger brother and a younger sister. His younger brother was Simon, and his sister was Denise. They hadn't seen Robert in quite some time. They invited him to sit with them so they could catch up. Because there were so many guests, the older people sat at one table and the younger generation sat at another. Damon sat at the kids' table. Charlotte sat there too, as well as many other cousins. Silas hadn't come. Now that he was managing the Brokerton group, he usually stayed in Meyerson. Because Damon had been gone for so many years, he didn't know a lot of the people here. He saw many new faces. In addition, Charlotte was trying to make things difficult for him, so when he sat down, people got up and moved their chairs away. Soon, he was sitting alone at one end of the table. The other cousins would rather squeeze together at the far end than sit next to him. It was as if he had a contagious disease. This was obviously planned. As for who planned it, Damon already knew. Arnold's son Tyson was almost 30 years old. He was already a sergeant in the military. Apparently, he was up for a promotion soon as well. 
The whole family was very proud of him. Not surprisingly, he was usually the unspoken leader of the cousins. Seeing everyone avoiding Damon, Tyson frowned. What are you doing? This is your cousin. Go and greet him. However, the cousins just looked at each other in dismay. Then they turned to look at Sawyer, Uncle Simon's son. Sawyer was only two days younger than Damon. Unlike Tyson, Sawyer had started a business. Although he was still in university, his company was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. His own shares alone were worth tens of millions. Although his family had given him the startup cash, he'd built the company by himself. As such, Sawyer and Tyson were much admired. The other cousins usually followed their lead. After Tyson and Silas, Sawyer held the most sway. Because Tyson was slightly older and his personality was so serious, many of the younger cousins were closer with Sawyer. Unless Tyson lost his temper, the younger cousins weren't afraid of him. Therefore, they all looked at Sawyer and waited for him to say something. Sawyer glanced at Damon. Then he slowly said, So he's our cousin, huh? Why don't I remember him? Charlotte nodded. That's right. Grandma never said anything about him before. Since when do we have a new cousin? I don't know him. Tyson's expression changed. Sawyer, why are you acting like this? This is no way to treat Damon. I'll act as I please. If you aren't happy, talk to Grandma. See what she says. With Grandma June backing him up, Sawyer was confident. He wasn't going to listen to Tyson. He looked at Damon with contempt. Sawyer knew that Grandma June had always disliked Damon's family. She especially hated his mother, Nancy. She thought that by marrying her, Robert had disgraced the Brokerton family. As long as Grandma June felt this way, Damon would always be an outcast. It didn't matter how smart he was. June thought that he'd likely picked up bad habits while living with an ordinary family for so many years. In her eyes, he was no different from a hooligan. Naturally, she was very prejudiced against him. Therefore, when he came up in conversation, she always spoke poorly of him to the rest of the family. In contrast, Grandma June loved Sawyer, Silas, and Tyson with all her heart. After all, they were the future of the family. They had already achieved great things. As long as they were nurtured, their prospects were very bright. Damon, Nancy, and Robert were at a family dinner. Damon was meeting many of his cousins for the first time, and it wasn't going well. A lot of them, including Sawyer, were being very rude. Tyson was stunned. He turned to Damon and apologized. I'm sorry about these guys. Try not to take them too seriously. Although Tyson was the oldest among the cousins, he couldn't force his relatives to be friendly. The rest had chosen to distance themselves from Damon. It was their choice, and Tyson couldn't do anything about it. Damon didn't blame him. He knew why Sawyer and Charlotte were being so unfriendly. Grandma June had turned them against him. She hated Nancy, and by extension, she hated him as well. She was prejudiced against him because he'd been raised by an ordinary family. She thought that he had no morals. Charlotte's comments earlier further proved this point. On top of this, he'd called Charlotte a two-faced bitch, so she was angry with him now. She'd plotted with the other cousins to try to embarrass him. Additionally, his reappearance in their lives directly threatened Silas's position as Robert's successor. In light of all this, it wasn't surprising that everyone hated him. It was impossible for him to enjoy himself at this dinner. The other cousins chatted and laughed at the far end of the table. From time to time, they would point at him and whisper. It was as if he wasn't even there. He didn't belong here. He was a commoner, and they weren't going to just accept him as one of their own. However, other than Tyson, who occasionally came over to chat, another girl also seemed interested in getting to know him. She was quiet, but she occasionally glanced over at him. Tyson saw that the girl wasn't sitting with the other cousins, so he introduced them. It turned out that she was his younger sister, Miranda. Damon remembered her. She was a few years younger than him. When he'd gone missing, she was still learning how to speak. It had been many years since he last saw her, and she'd grown into a beautiful young woman. He greeted her, and unexpectedly, she smiled back. She struck up a conversation with him. What are you doing now? Are you still in university? Yes, I study in Meyerson. How about you? What are you studying? I'm in my first year at the DC Academy of Music, she quickly replied. Why didn't you come to DC to go to university? The schools are good and our grandparents live here. Damon smiled. I think Meyerson suits me better. I really like the atmosphere there. As soon as he finished speaking, he heard Charlotte ridicule him. Miranda, you are too naive. The Academy doesn't let people like him in. It has standards. The cousins around them snickered. 
They all doubted that Damon could get into a school in D.C. Damon couldn't be bothered with them. He turned back to his plate and answered Miranda. The schools in D.C. are good, but other cities have good schools too. He was surprised to hear what school Miranda went to. He hadn't expected her to attend the same school as Fiona. He'd have to find an opportunity to ask her if she knew his ex. When Miranda heard that Damon didn't want to go to school in D.C., she asked curiously, Then what university do you go to? Myerson University, he replied casually. Hearing this, many of the cousins fell silent. Those who'd heard of Myerson University before knew that it was one of the top schools in the country. Only the best students were accepted there. Those who'd heard of it also knew that their own grades weren't good enough to go there. That's why they'd applied to universities in D.C. Charlotte hadn't mentioned this point to them. Now they felt a little embarrassed about making fun of their new cousin. Charlotte was also shocked. She'd been trying to humiliate Damon, but instead she'd humiliated herself. The school that she attended was inferior to Myerson University. However, she still wasn't going to change her mind about Damon. Hmm, what's so great about Myerson University anyway? She declared. Sawyer studies at Georgetown? That's a much better school. Shut up, Charlotte, Tyson snapped. Do you know how high your grades have to be to get into Myerson University? Do you know how hard it is? Georgetown is a good school, but Myerson is on par. Besides, we all know that Sawyer got into Georgetown only because Uncle Simon made a big donation. Initially, Tyson wasn't going to interfere. However, Charlotte had gone too far. He couldn't stand to listen to her anymore. This was getting a little ridiculous. Sawyer was able to attend Georgetown because his family had a lot of connections. His father and the president of the university were old friends. On the contrary, Damon had been living with an ordinary family all these years, so he didn't have the same connections. He'd gotten into Myerson University on grades alone. He'd worked a lot harder than Sawyer. Charlotte was unhappy. Tyson, don't defend the outsider. Anyway, I know that Georgetown is better than Myerson University. If he was really that smart, he'd be a student at Georgetown. I'd like to see his grades. I bet they're not good enough. The other cousins laughed. This was a huge insult to Damon. It was obvious to them that the guy's grades weren't good enough. If they were, he would have gone to Georgetown. Why would anyone go to Myerson University if they had the option of going somewhere better? Miranda turned around and asked Damon, Tyson says that it's difficult to get into Myerson University. What score did you get on your SATs? Damon thought for a moment and realized that he'd actually forgotten what his score was. I don't remember. Hearing this, Charlotte Sawyer and the others laughed. They thought he was lying because he didn't dare to say. He probably knew that his marks weren't high enough to get into Georgetown. Perhaps he was lying about how good a school Myerson was. Perhaps it was actually quite lousy. However, what Damon said next shut everyone up. I don't remember my exact score, but it wouldn't have been a problem for me to get into Georgetown. I aced my SATs. I had the highest marks in my state. As soon as he spoke these words, the entire table fell silent. Everyone was staring at him. Seeing their stunned expressions, Damon felt satisfied, but outwardly, he remained calm. Wow, for real? You're not pulling our leg, are you? Miranda asked in surprise. Tyson, who was also shocked, added, Did you really do that well? That's really impressive. If it was true, it meant that Damon was the most intelligent person here. Even those who didn't like him looked at him in shock. Some of the cousins were poor students, but there were also a few bright ones as well. However, none of their marks were as good as Damon's. After seeing him nod his head, everyone at the table began to talk at once. Charlotte watched him with panic in her eyes. Hm, he probably just made that up. I've lied about my grades before too. Remember when I told everyone that I got into Harvard? However, everyone could see that her confidence was wavering. After all, Damon didn't look like he was lying. At this moment, the commotion at the kids' table caught the attention of the older generation. Sawyer's mother, Tanya, had been bragging about how her other son, Silas, was helping Robert manage the Brokerton Group. Without Silas, the company wouldn't be as successful as it was today. She was even more proud of her second son, Sawyer. After all, Silas worked for Robert, but Sawyer was the boss of a huge company, and he'd started this company by himself. In fact, everyone knew about this. The key was to make sure Robert understood. Even though his biological son had come back, the boy wasn't fit to run a company. The family's future still depended on Silas and Sawyer. Tanya wanted everyone to recognize how capable her two boys were. Although Robert's family was rich, her sons showed more promise. She didn't want to see Silas unseated from his position at the Brokerton Group. After all, Damon was practically a stranger to them. Who knew how that poor family had raised him? 
No, the company was safer in Silas's hands. Tanya thought that her son deserved to inherit the Brokerton Group. If Damon ousted him, she'd be very upset. Tanya was extremely annoyed about being interrupted. What are you guys arguing about? She demanded to know. Miranda pointed at Damon. He aced his SATs. He had the highest test score in his state. Everyone looked at Damon blankly. Was it true? Arnold suddenly remembered hearing this before. He stood up and announced, I forgot to introduce you all to Damon. It's true, he did ace his SATs. Now he studies at Myerson University. This news shocked everyone. They all looked at Arnold in bewilderment. Could they trust him? All the cousins had expected Uncle Arnold to say that this wasn't true. Not many people were willing to believe that Damon had actually done so well on his SATs. As such, Uncle Arnold's words were a huge blow to them. After all, they considered themselves superior to Damon and his family. Tanya was especially upset. If it turned out that Damon was smart and capable, Robert would likely put him in charge of the Brokerton Group. If that happened, Silas would inherit his uncle's fortune. Arnold nodded his head. He was telling the truth. He confirmed his statement about Damon acing his SATs. Those who didn't like Damon felt deflated. It sounded like he was the most intelligent person here, and they were having a hard time accepting it. They didn't want to admit it. Doing so would seriously damage their self-esteem. Charlotte's face was especially red. When she realized that Damon's claim was true, she felt a chill run down her spine. After thinking for a long time, she finally said, hm, So what? No matter how smart he is, he's still not as successful as Sawyer. Sawyer runs a huge company. She didn't mention Silas. After all, everyone knew that he worked for Robert. Yeah, Damon can't compare. You're right. <laughs> he's just an ignorant nobody who doesn't know anything about our world. Many people echoed these statements. Although Damon was obviously intelligent, he still couldn't compare to Sawyer. Robert and Nancy were proud of their son. His achievements proved that he was a smart and capable young man who'd been raised right. However, when they heard that Sawyer was now the boss of a large company, they felt that their son fell a little short. Damon didn't say anything. It was meaningless to argue with these people. After eating a few more bites, he went outside to smoke. Since Damon had left, the conversation was over. However, the cousins all laughed and whispered to each other. They were probably mocking him for running away. By the time Damon came back inside, the family dinner was coming to an end. Robert wanted to stay in D.C. for a few more days. After all, he didn't often get the chance to visit. It was his father's 70th birthday, so he and his siblings sat down together and planned the celebration. However, Damon stayed at the hotel. He was tired of listening to his cousins mock and ridicule him. At least they'd shut up after hearing that he aced his SATs. However, with Grandma June backing them up, they'd soon find something new to dwell on. However, Damon didn't care. He'd never had a good impression of Grandma June. He knew that he should respect his elders, but if his grandmother went too far, he had no problem telling her. He wanted to help Nancy regain her dignity. These days, Everbright's share price was skyrocketing once again. Old and new century continued to gain popularity around the world, at the same time, the team at Everbright had been working hard to make improvements. The update had finally been released. This update was very important. All along, the two games, Old and New Century, ran separately. However, now that Will was out of the picture, Everbright was working with Silly Goose to integrate the two games into one. The team had finally achieved a major breakthrough. They'd merged the maps of the two games into one big map. Players could now travel seamlessly between the world's continents the world of Astromar was finally complete. As a result, there was renewed interest in the game. Users could now travel all around the world without even leaving their houses. These improvements undoubtedly made the game a lot more fun. Even when people who didn't normally play computer games were giving it a try, the multitude of users only added to the gameplay. Now that Old and New Century had been integrated into one, the games were attracting renewed attention. This increased Everbright's revenue, which directly impacted the share price. The company was now worth more than ever. Along with this, its games were attracting attention from media outlets all over the world. After all, until now, no game had ever connected people like this before. The servers were scattered across every continent. People didn't need to buy plane tickets to travel anymore. They just had to log into the game. The Everbright team had even developed translation software that allowed users to communicate regardless of their native language. 
This allowed the players to not only interact with each other, but also communicate. At this moment, Everbright was paving the way for the future of online games. All sorts of tech columns were reporting on the company's success, as well as its wonderful contributions to the future of the industry. Everbright's partner companies were also benefiting from its growth. Their share prices were rising too. As the founder of Everbright, Damon was once again making headlines. He had countless admirers. Because of all the hype around Everbright, Damon received many requests to be interviewed. Reporters wanted him to appear on their programs to talk about his success, experience, and values. In addition to the requests from American reporters, he received invitations from international media outlets as well. People around the world were all interested in interviewing him. They wanted to know more about the creative genius behind Everbright's success. How had he come up with the concept for New and Old Century? The reporters were all waiting for Damon to respond to their interview questions. Damon personally read them all. He didn't reject any of them. After all, these interviewers would improve his company's reputation and draw more investors. People in the business world would pay more attention to Everbright. In return, this would have a lot of benefits. Recently, Damon had rented an office building in Washington, D.C. as well. Everbright now had two brick-and-mortar locations. However, Damon's other company was facing problems. Although Everbright was making good progress, Astronet was under constant attack from hackers. The company was in big trouble. A similar thing had happened to Everbright in the past. Because Astronet outsourced its data storage to China, people were asking questions. Until now, Astronet had been growing rapidly. It officially had more than 600 million users. This large number attracted the attention of many politicians. Last time, when the government tried to crack down on Everbright, millions of people around the world took to the streets to protest. The governments of various countries had witnessed just how influential these games actually were. Now the same people are coming for Astronet. Representatives from different countries were openly calling for Astronet's social media software to be banned. They were concerned about security issues because the data was being stored on Chinese servers. This tested Astronet's PR capabilities. The app was successful because it had a lot of users. If countries started banning it, the business would definitely fall apart. Damon began to worry. Astronet was facing the biggest crisis it had ever encountered. However, Damon and his employees weren't the only ones who were anxious. The site's users loved Astronet, and when they heard the news, they were shocked and outraged. They didn't want the app to get banned. Astronet had become a part of their lives. They were all furious. They posted angry messages and encouraged their fellow users to get out and protest. Influential users, such as celebrities, billionaires, scientists, entrepreneurs, and even many politicians openly opposed the ban. The app was diverse, equal, free, and democratic. It gave people a voice. As for banning Astronet, the politicians should have known better than to try. History repeated itself. Faced with the storm of public opinion, politicians who had previously supported banning Astronet changed their minds. They put their tails between their legs and dropped the issue. For the time being, they didn't dare to make any more statements against the company. However, although these politicians didn't make any more claims publicly, it didn't necessarily mean that they'd given up. Damon was watching the crisis play out. Furthermore, he knew how it could harm his company. In fact, the politicians were worried because Astronet had a huge amount of power. So this group of shameless politicians secretly came up with a plan to get rid of the social media company once and for all. Although the voters' opinions were most important, the issue of national security had to come first. Therefore, although the storm had calmed for the time being, Astronet still needed to prepare for the worst. Damon planned to put Quinn in charge of PR. If necessary, he would even send him to meet with the representatives in government who opposed them. This was also a chance for Quinn to get some experience. Damon had a lot of matters to attend to right now. He trusted Quinn, and he wanted to give him more responsibility. He hoped that his friend would rise to meet the challenge. Before that, he had to test him. This PR crisis was the perfect opportunity. However, Damon already had full confidence in Mitch's abilities. He was a genius with computers. The team he led had quashed countless cyber attacks. Thanks to them, Astronet could operate normally. During this time in DC, apart from visiting his father, Robert also visited many important politicians. Damon was very bored. He spent most of his time in the hotel. The day before their flight back to LA, Damon decided to make another trip to the DC Academy of Music. The first time that he'd gone there, he hadn't seen Fiona. 
If he didn't see her while he was in DC, he knew he'd regret it. Although it seemed that she had moved on, he yearned for one last look at her, even if just from afar. As long as she was happy, he'd finally be able to let go. He didn't plan to come back to DC. Perhaps after this, he'd never see her again. Moreover, this time he went to the campus, he could contact Janice. He had a plan. Fiona and Janice were in the same year. Since everyone knew Fiona, it should be relatively easy to find her. Damon made up his mind. That afternoon, he'd go to the DC Academy of Music. At noon, Nancy cooked a delicious lunch for Robert and Damon. Whenever her son was around, she liked to cook for him. She cherished every moment spent with him, and she wished that she could spend time with him every day. They had to make up for lost time, so she showered him with motherly love. However, she knew that she was being unrealistic. Her child had grown up and left the nest. He had his own life to live. His mother knew she had to cherish every moment that they spent together. At lunch, Robert said to Damon, I've hired someone to stay by your side to protect you. In short, he was talking about a bodyguard. His son frowned. There's no need. I don't need to be protected. Damon wasn't used to being rich. Besides, why did he need a bodyguard? He didn't want anyone following him around. If he encountered real danger, he might have to protect the bodyguard. Nancy, who was beside him, said hurriedly, Honey, listen to your father. Your life is different now. You need protection. In the past, Damon was just an ordinary guy. No one cared enough to want to hurt him. Moreover, he couldn't afford to hire bodyguards. But now things were different. His identity had changed. He was the successor of the Brokerton Group, and many people had their eyes on him now. He was the heir to an enormous fortune. What if someone tried to assassinate or kidnap him? Even if this seemed unlikely, Robert and Nancy wouldn't take any risks. He'd already been gone for many years, and it hadn't been easy to find him. If they lost him again, Nancy didn't think she could go on living. Damon frowned. He knew Nancy and Robert were worried, and he also appreciated their concern. However, he wasn't used to having a bodyguard by his side all day long. It would make him feel very uncomfortable. So he explained, I don't like the idea of having someone follow me around all the time. Besides, if I were really in danger, what could a mere bodyguard do? Robert laughed. Don't worry, the guard is responsible for only your safety. He won't interfere with your life. As for whether it's an effective form of protection, frankly speaking, you are overthinking it. Your guard is very strong. He won't have a problem keeping you safe. Nancy hurriedly nodded. Honey, trust your father. The man who he's talking about is his best guard. He's worked closely with your father for many years. Now to ensure your safety, he's agreed to protect you instead. Damon felt touched. Nancy and Robert clearly loved him a lot. They were worried that something would happen to him, so they'd prioritized his safety over theirs. He still wanted to refuse, but he didn't know what to say. They took his silence as tacit agreement. Robert went on, And there's one other thing. From now on, if you encounter any difficulties in Meyerson while your mom and I aren't around, I want you to call my old friend. This is his phone number. He also has yours. He will be in touch. In the future, if you have any problems that you can't solve on your own, he can help you. As Robert spoke, he handed Damon a business card. The name on the card read Oliver Jonesburg, and his phone number and address were written underneath. The name didn't have a title. It all seemed rather mysterious. Nancy explained, Honey, your dad's friend Oliver is quite capable. Furthermore, he's helped us before. We owe him a lot. He is a loyal friend and you can trust him. Seeing how serious Nancy and Robert were, Damon guessed that this Oliver guy was someone very important. Anyone who Robert regarded highly must be pretty extraordinary. After having lunch with his parents, they chatted a little more. Then, Damon said that he wanted to go for a walk. It was his afternoon in DC and he wanted to look around. Naturally, Nancy instructed him to be careful. Then, she reluctantly watched him leave. It was Damon's last afternoon in DC. He still wanted to see Fiona before he left, so he took the bus to her school. He had high hopes for today, and he wondered if he would really see his ex. However, after spending two hours wandering around the campus, he found no trace of her. Without realizing it, he'd ended up in front of the bulletin board again. The posters were still the same. Fiona's beautiful image was still in the most prominent position on the board. She was smiling sweetly, she looked like a star shining in the sky. Damon couldn't help reaching out to touch the picture, 
it was as close as he could hope to get to her right now. For a moment, it was as if she'd never left him. She was still his girlfriend, calling him Cupcake and gazing at him adoringly. However, the bulletin board had a pane of glass over it, so Damon was unable to actually touch her picture. Was there a way to remove the glass? He tried to slide it aside. What are you doing? Someone suddenly reprimanded. Damon turned his head and saw a pretty woman standing behind him. She looked upset. He was a little embarrassed. Um, I'm... Are you one of Fifi's admirers? I've seen a lot of guys like you. You're shameless. Why are you trying to touch her picture, you weirdo? The woman scolded. She wasn't going to give him a pass just because he was handsome. Damon was speechless. She was right. He was being a weirdo. The woman came closer and inspected the glass. After seeing that it was still in place, she asked, Are you from the school? No. She smiled coldly. So you are an admirer from another school, huh? Don't you have any shame? Fifi already has a boyfriend, so why are you still pestering her? Clearly, the woman wasn't interested in hearing his side of the story. Damon felt like he'd been hit with a hammer. He looked at the woman and asked, What are you talking about? At the same time, he was thinking about the man who he'd heard in the background when he called her on the phone that day. Did Fiona really have a boyfriend? But why hadn't Janice mentioned it to him? What, are you heartbroken? The woman smirked disdainfully. I hate guys like you. You don't even know her. I'm not afraid of hurting her feelings, so I'll tell it like it is. Wyatt Jakes is already planning to ask her out. Do you think Fifi dates clowns like you? You should just give up and go home. So they weren't dating yet. Hearing this, Damon relaxed a little. He wasn't surprised that Fiona was attracting a lot of attention at her new school. He was also very curious about who this Wyatt Jakes was. Who was Wyatt Jakes? Go home, loser. The pretty young woman rolled her eyes at him. She was done with this conversation. She warned him not to destroy public property again. After he nodded, she left with her head held high. Damon looked at Fiona's picture behind the glass. Then, he reluctantly left. Damon was starting to get hungry again, so he called Janice to invite her out to eat. He was hoping that he could get her to tell him Fiona's address. Furthermore, she was an old friend and he wanted to see her before he left town. Since he was already on campus, he might as well see if she was free. When he called to invite her out, she agreed readily. However, she and her best friend were already on their way to a restaurant, so she asked him if he wanted to join them instead. He agreed and went to meet them. After walking a short distance, he saw Janice waiting for him on a corner. She was with someone who looked familiar. As Damon got closer, he realized who it was. It turned out that Janice's friend was the pretty woman who had scolded him in front of the bulletin board. Damon couldn't help but smile bitterly. Hello, I didn't expect to see you again. Janice looked at them in surprise. Do you two know each other? The pretty woman got over her initial surprise at seeing him again. She wasn't as mean as she'd been before. Instead, she smiled. What a coincidence. I didn't know that you were Janice's classmate. Then she explained how they'd met earlier. Janice pursed her lips and smiled. Damon, I didn't know. Before, you told me that you were over Fiona. However, it turns out that you were still in love with her. He was a little embarrassed, so he didn't comment. The three of them chatted about other things as they walked. Janice introduced her to her friend. The woman's name was Mia, and she was Janice's roommate. She had a fiery personality, so it was no wonder that she'd called Damon out earlier. After Damon expressed that the meal was his treat, Mia said mysteriously, Seeing that you care so much about Fiona, how about this? Since you were treating us, I don't mind giving you the scoop about her. This was exactly what he'd been hoping for, so he nodded eagerly. Okay, in that case, let's go wherever you want to eat. Don't worry about the price. It's not a problem. He could easily afford it, and he was keen to get some insider information. Janice, however, didn't know about his current financial situation. She knew that he was from a poor family, so she said to Mia, Don't take advantage of him. Everything is so expensive these days. He needs to save his money. <laughs> What's wrong? Mia replied. It's not your money. Why do you feel sorry for him? Don't tell me you have feelings for him. <laughs> his heart belongs to someone else. She rolled her eyes. Hearing this, Janice's face turned red. She wanted to smack her friend, but instead she just turned to Damon. Don't listen to her, she likes to joke around. Mia giggled. She led them to a mid-range restaurant near campus. The food here wasn't that expensive. When Damon encouraged the women to order more, Mia shook her head and declined. If she ordered too much, it would go to waste. While they were eating, Mia said, Damon, on the way here, Janice told me about how you aced your SATs. He nodded and Mia went on. Wow, 
you're pretty talented. When Janice told me, I didn't believe it. But you seem like a pretty honest guy. I believe you. Since that's the case, why didn't you apply to Georgetown? I liked the atmosphere in Meyerson. She nodded and went on. I understand your desire to pursue Fiona, but I'm not afraid to tell you like it is. You don't stand a chance. There's no hope. Mio was just speaking the truth. After Fiona transferred from Meyerson University to the DC Academy of Music, her music career had really taken off. Not only was she touring the country later this year, but she was even playing a concert at Carnegie Hall. Additionally, she was even more beautiful and moving than before. Countless men admired her now. Mia obviously admired her a lot too. She went on to tell Damon about Fiona's latest love interest, Wyatt. He was a talented student. Additionally, he was tall and handsome and he came from a good family. On top of this, Wyatt was just one in a long line of suitors. Ordinary guys like Damon didn't stand a chance. It didn't matter how well Damon had done his SATs. Fiona was in a whole different league now. Even without knowing him, Mia already knew that he didn't stand a chance with Fiona. He would only end up hurt. You needed more than just smarts to get a woman like her. Fiona was a goddess now. Janice patted Mia's shoulder. She felt that her friend's words were too cruel. Even though she secretly agreed and she had previously advised Damon against pursuing Fiona, she still didn't want to hurt his feelings. People always needed to have hope, right? Otherwise, life would be too depressing. Even if it was unrealistic, people were still allowed to dream. Damon frowned. He felt that Mia's description was somewhat vague. He couldn't help but ask, Is Fiona really that different now? Janice and Mia nodded at the same time. Mia said, She is the goddess of the new generation. Next to her, we are just mortals. Damon knew that his ex was brilliant, but he hadn't thought that she would attract so much attention at her new school. His remaining confidence began to waver. Mia asked mysteriously, Damon, do you really want to pursue Fiona? What do you mean? He replied non-committally. If you do, you should get to know your competition. Do you want to see Wyatt? That way you can prepare yourself. You will know what you're up against. Damon felt moved. He'd been searching for her all this time. This seemed like the perfect opportunity to finally find her. But he was also a bit worried. Now that he'd heard how outstanding she'd become, he wanted to see her shine. This wouldn't be a normal encounter. He still remembered the words she'd written in her letter, and he was worried that he wasn't outstanding enough for her. He was worried that her feelings for him had faded with the passing time. Perhaps, when they met, she would just turn around and walk away. Perhaps he was too ordinary for her now. What if she'd forgotten all about him? However, he still wanted to see her, even if just from afar. He nodded and said that he wanted to see Wyatt. Hearing this, Mia said, then it's settled. When the opportunity arises, I'll let you know. The meal lasted an hour. Afterwards, they went their separate ways. Before leaving campus, Damon couldn't help quietly sneaking back to the bulletin board for one last look at Fiona's picture. She looked so perfect, but she was out of reach. After returning to LA with Nancy and Robert, Damon made plans to go back to Meyerson. He'd been gone for a period of time and he had many things to do when he got back. He began to make preparations. First, he arranged for Quinn to launch a PR campaign tackling the crisis facing Astronet. He had to suppress the rumors about the security concerns. He even arranged for Quinn to meet with all kinds of politicians. All in all, this would be a huge test of his friend's capabilities. Furthermore, Quinn wasn't used to dealing with people in political circles. He'd grown up in a much different world. However, he'd have to get used to it if he wanted to succeed. If he could do it, his future with Damon's company was guaranteed. If he couldn't, it was unlikely that he'd get promoted. This was a huge test, but Damon had faith that his friend could do it. Damon wanted to push Quinn. He wanted to give his friend a promotion, but first Quinn had to prove that he could handle it. Perhaps one day he'd be a top executive at the company. Damon, on the other hand, preferred to work behind the scenes. Mitch was doing a great job managing the IT department. Damon was even thinking about letting him take charge of Everbright's entire North American operations. One day, Mitch would also be a top executive at the company. Damon took advantage of this opportunity to begin building his core team. After returning to Meyerson, he also had a chance to meet his new bodyguard. The man was only 5'5", five five and his face didn't have any discerning features. He was the kind of person who could disappear in the crowd. Occasionally, the man's expression changed, and he looked fierce and terrifying. When Damon saw this, he was shocked. He knew better than to underestimate this man. He'd seen many bodyguards before. However, none had as ferocious an expression as this man. 
Although Damon had only caught a brief glimpse of this, it wasn't something that he'd soon forget. If this man didn't work for him, he would be extremely dangerous. Fortunately, the man was on his side. Thinking of this, Damon heaved a sigh of relief. At the same time, he was amazed to meet a better fighter than himself. Until now, he'd considered himself invincible. Thinking back, he realized how young and arrogant he'd been. Fighting Silas's bodyguards had been a challenge. Furthermore, his new guard's strength was even more unfathomable. While Damon sized up his new security detail, the bodyguard, Axel, also quietly took stock of his new charge. This was the first time he was meeting Damon, but he already knew all about him. He knew that the boy had been missing for many years. The fact that he'd been assigned to protect him just went to show how important Damon was to Robert and Nancy. They didn't want to see anything bad happen to their son. However, Axel realized that he had a problem. In Robert and Nancy's eyes, their son needed to be protected. They thought that danger could strike at any time. But in reality, Damon was a strong and capable young man who Axel had a hard time reading. He was almost as strong and skilled as the bodyguard himself. After returning to Meyerson, Damon's life was leisurely. It was summer vacation. However, he felt bad that he hadn't had a chance to meet Avery while he was in LA. For now, Bubba wasn't causing him any trouble either. Wilder, who was still recovering from his stab wound, was also living a peaceful life for the time being. However, Damon found it strange that Bubba hadn't come looking for revenge. He'd heard that the guy retaliated over even the smallest of grievances. Given his character, it was surprising that he hadn't come looking for trouble. Furthermore, Bubba had also warned Damon to be careful. Damon was sure that he'd come calling sooner or later. However, a long time passed and Bubba didn't show his face. Had he just been blowing hot air? This seemed unlikely though. He was known as the King of Meyerson and he had a terrifying reputation. Surely this was built on more than just words alone. However, before long, Damon discovered the reason behind Bubba's absence. The gangster had been busy dealing with an even stronger enemy. This explained why he hadn't had time to worry about a minor character like Damon. He was currently battling someone he considered tan equal. The underworld was full of players vying for power. It had always been like this. Bubba's new challenger was a gangster called Titus. Damon hadn't heard of him before. After all, although he dabbled in the criminal underworld, Wilder took care of most of their business. Therefore, he didn't know many of the major players. If not for Drew, he wouldn't know about Bubba, this so-called King of Myerson either. According to the rumors, Titus had risen rapidly among the local ranks. Not only had he chased Bubba out of his former territory, but he'd even taken the initiative to attack the King's hideout. This had greatly damaged Bubba's reputation. Therefore, he planned to take revenge on Titus and reclaim his position. After that, he could deal with Damon. Bubba knew how to prioritize. First, he would deal with the most urgent matter. A small fry like Damon could wait. Bubba hadn't expected to encounter such a troublesome enemy. Damon hadn't expected it either. It turned out that the king wasn't as invincible as people had thought. As the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Lately, Damon had been making inquiries about Bubba's current strength. Although the law didn't sanction his rule, he was still in charge of this territory. Bubba hadn't attacked when Damon challenged Drew. In his eyes, their conflict was just small potatoes. He didn't want to interfere. After all, regardless of who came out on top, Bubba was still in charge. However, the situation is different now. The gangster was greedy for Damon's wealth. Furthermore, the guy had unseated the crown prince, so Bubba had a grudge against him. Even though Damon was extremely confident, he still had to be wary of the gangster's powerful influence in the city. The man needed only to lift a finger, and hundreds of men would rally to his cause. Damon wasn't capable of fighting him at this point in time. After returning to Meyerson, he went to check on Wilder. His friend had been stabbed, and he was still recuperating. Damon had heard from Bruno that Wilder was now able to get out of bed. His body was slowly recovering. However, the attack had been really ruthless. If Wilder wasn't so strong, he might not have survived. He might never fully recover. When Damon visited Wilder, he found out that there hadn't been any more trouble recently. Hearing this, he nodded and asked about the conflict between Titus and Bubba, as well as the origins of the newcomer. Are you planning to form an alliance with Titus? Wilder looked a little shocked when he realized what Damon intended to do. Shouldn't I? Wilder frowned. This Titus only showed up on the scene two years ago. Of course, 
His existence is a challenge to Bubba. He's much stronger than us. Although Wilder admired Damon a lot, this didn't stop him from praising Titus as well. In all the years that Bubba had ruled over Meyerson, this was the first time that anyone had truly challenged his position. Comparatively speaking, Damon was only challenging Bubba's power in one part of town, Ziggy's old territory, Riverside. Even if Damon was unusually good at fighting, he was still just a small player. Wilder and Bruno felt that Damon didn't stand much of a chance in a real fight against Bubba. The gangster was a force to be reckoned with. Wilder was a smart guy, and he knew that Bubba had a lot more resources. If Damon hadn't encouraged them, they never would have risked angering the king. After all, some people were too powerful to defeat. Even though Titus had challenged Bubba, it would still be difficult for him to win the war. As the king of Myerson, Bubba's position was deeply entrenched. Furthermore, he had countless loyal followers. By challenging the king, Titus had also challenged the natural order of the city. I suppose it's possible, Bruno said with uncertainty. He'd come to visit Wilder as well. After all, siding with Titus is the only way to fight Bubba, but I'm afraid that Titus won't take us seriously. It would be great if they could team up with Titus. However, they were on two completely different levels, and Bruno was afraid that Titus wouldn't give them the time of day. According to the rumors, Bubba had brought in backup from out of town. Apparently, the man who'd enlisted was even more powerful and domineering than he himself. Bubba was the king of Myerson, and he was a legend in the underworld. However, compared to this other man, he was nothing. In fact, he owed his success in Myerson to this man. This mysterious gangster had helped Bubba rise up and take control of the city. In fact, this man was the most powerful gangster on the eastern seaboard. Although he'd been semi-retired for many years, he was still a legend. If he came to help, Titus would have no chance at all. However, these were just rumors. The only thing Damon knew for sure was that he had offended Bubba. Given his current strength, his only choice was to join forces with Titus. Titus's headquarters were in a private club on the west side of town. It was an extremely high-end establishment. After getting the gangster's contact information, Damon personally went to the club to discuss the matter of cooperation. When Damon found Titus, the gangster was holding a meeting. He'd recently challenged Bubba's status in Myerson. Taking down the king was no mean feat. Although Bubba was definitely stronger, Titus had a lot of connections. Many men would fight for him. Bubba hadn't done anything all that impressive for a few years now. His power was in decline. That was why he was so keen to take Damon down and steal his money. Many people in the underworld were growing dissatisfied with the king. Titus was taking advantage of the situation to consolidate power. Many people rallied around him. This was a huge challenge to Bubba's status, and it was only natural for him to strike back. However, Titus was a fierce man who had the courage to fight. Despite being in his early 30s, he was still physically strong. He was a born leader, and he was intent on seizing power. But today, the meeting that he'd called was somewhat dull. He wanted to discuss the fight against Bubba, but the meeting was proving very stressful. It turned out that his men weren't very confident when it came to dealing with the king. Bubba was a legend in the underworld. However, in recent years, his strength had deteriorated. His control over Myerson wasn't absolute anymore. He was losing his touch. The fact that he hadn't yet retaliated against Damon further proved this. If Bubba was acting on his own, Titus's gang would feel confident about taking him down. However, to protect his dominance and authority, the king had partnered with someone more powerful. He'd enlisted the most powerful gangster on the East Coast to back him up. In light of this, Titus's people had their doubts. During the meeting, a bald man slammed his fist on the table and said, Boss, I heard that Bubba is bringing in backup. If his mentor really comes to help, then we have no chance of winning. A rather coquettish woman glanced at the bald man and retorted, Cash, are you suggesting that we should just surrender and beg for mercy? The woman's nickname was Black Widow. She was also a prominent gangster in Meyerson. She had once been loyal to Bubba, but he'd turned on her. He'd caused a lot of trouble for her gang. For this reason, she'd joined forces with Titus. She was now one of his most loyal followers. She knew the consequences of offending Bubba. The king was ruthless, and he always got revenge. They had to fight if they wanted to survive. Yeah, that or run away. I'd rather stay alive, thanks, Cash replied. He was afraid of the mysterious gangster who backed Bubba. Run away. 
Do you think that's an appropriate way for a gangster to act? How can you call yourself a boss? Black Widow looked at him with disdain. It was hard to imagine how a coward like him had survived in this world for so long. Why not? Do we really have to sit around and wait to get killed? Cash rolled his eyes and went on. Or do you think we have the strength to defeat that guy? As Cash said this, a look of fear flashed in his eyes. He was not the only one who was worried either. Everyone around the table looked concerned. They were used to fighting battles, but going up against someone as strong as Bubba would only harm their interests in the future. Now that they were potentially facing an even more powerful enemy, they felt a lot of pressure. Cash was having a hard time even catching his breath. Only one man could instill such fear in people, and his name was Riker Black. In fact, Titus felt the most pressure out of everyone. He was the one who had confronted Bubba head on. When he first challenged the king, he had no idea that Riker might interfere. Furthermore, changes in leadership were all part of the game. Now that Titus had made his move, he was finding out about this mysterious, all-powerful gangster. Would he really support Bubba? This complicated the matter. Even if Titus was facing Bubba alone, he wasn't guaranteed to win. However, if this legendary figure made a move, then Titus was in trouble. If Riker got involved, they were all screwed. He was rumored to be the most powerful gangster on the East Coast. Anyone who went against him would perish. At this moment, all the gang leaders who were loyal to Titus were panicking. This caused Titus himself to feel even more uncertain. They couldn't fight such a person. It was a bad omen to be afraid before the battle even began. They would definitely lose miserably. However, Titus's odds of winning weren't high to begin with. Thinking of this, he pounded the table and said, If you are afraid, you can run. However, you've already betrayed Bubba, and we will never forgive you. No one liked traitors. Disloyalty was a despicable thing for a gangster. Cash's expression turned ugly. Titus was right. It was too late to change sides. Bubba would never forgive him. His only choice was to bite the bullet and stick with Titus. The atmosphere around the table was a little gloomy. Suddenly, a staff member came in and whispered something to Titus. The gangster frowned and waved his hand. Keep him out front for now. The employee nodded and went out. Black Widow couldn't help but ask. Who is it? Titus was having a meeting with his top people. They were trying to decide how best to deal with Bubba. During the meeting, Damon arrived at the club wanting to meet with Titus. An employee asked him to have a seat at the bar while he went to inform the boss. In light of the recent situation, Titus was wary of visitors. After the employee gave him the message, he turned to his companions. Do any of you know a gangster named Damon Walker? Supposedly, he's the guy who took over Ziggy's old territory, Riverside. The other bosses looked at each other in dismay. They didn't know much about the new boss of Riverside. Although Damon had fought a fierce battle against the crowd prince, they didn't know anything else about him. He was a brave and fierce fighter, but he wasn't on their level. Black Widow had heard about him. What does he want? She asked. He wants to cooperate with us. He wants to form an alliance against Bubba. As soon as Titus finished speaking, Cash slammed his fist down on the table and said fiercely, Who is he? I've never heard of him. Where did he get the guts to make such a request? All the bosses, including Black Widow, laughed out loud. Nowadays, these youngsters were all so ignorant. They didn't know what they were up against. This new boss was only in his early 20s. Just because he had a few lackeys, he thought he was their equal. Well, it took more than just defeating the crown prince to get a seat at this table. He had no idea. Boss, have your people send him away, Cash said disdainfully. Titus nodded and casually waved his hand. One of his lackeys went out to the bar. They didn't respect Damon. In their eyes, a newcomer like him didn't have the qualifications to negotiate with them. They were all famous gangsters who'd worked hard to build their reputation in Meyerson. Who was Damon? He was just a little prick. When Damon realized that Titus had sent his lackey to deal with him, he frowned slightly. This showed that the gangster didn't respect him, otherwise he wouldn't be so rude. I was hoping to meet Titus, he requested calmly, suppressing his anger. The lackey hesitated for a moment and nodded. He didn't say anything rude. Instead, he just went to the back again. Not long after, he returned and led Damon to the meeting room in the back of the establishment. Titus and his underbosses were all sitting around a table. They were drinking and smoking. When Damon entered, they looked at him with high and mighty gazes. 
To them, he was just a good-for-nothing brat. Damon was mentally prepared for this. He expected Titus to look down on him. These people didn't think that he had the experience or qualifications to belong here. When he appeared, no one stood up to greet him. This really pissed him off. Axel, who was following behind Damon, had an ugly expression on his face. He looked fierce and murderous. The looks of disdain on the people's faces infuriated him. How dare they disrespect his charge? He couldn't stand it. If Damon gave the order, Axel would certainly massacre them all. You're that little prick from Riverside, right? Why did you come barging in here? Cash asked. His expression was full of contempt and hostility. Damon's mere presence here annoyed him. What do you want? Titus asked. I came to see you because I want to discuss an alliance. Although everyone looked down on him, Damon didn't show any signs of anger. He was at a disadvantage, and it was he who wanted to form an alliance with Titus. Besides, he knew that these people were stronger than him. He'd expected them to treat him this way. It only made sense. However, as soon as Damon finished speaking, everyone started laughing. Cash laughed the loudest. He pounded the table and pointed, Who do you think you are? Go look in the mirror. You aren't qualified to discuss cooperation with us. Damon's expression turned ugly. He growled, Is this the way you welcome guests? Even if you think I'm weak, you shouldn't be so rude. Hey kid, we don't mean to laugh at you, Cash replied. We just want you to understand the reality of the situation. What makes you think you're worthy of cooperating with us? Titus coughed lightly and added, You can work with me, but what can you offer? You have to convince me first. He didn't refute Cash's words. It was obvious that he agreed. Titus didn't think that Damon was qualified to discuss an alliance with them. If you let me work with you, I can create a huge problem for Bubba. He's our common enemy, so we should join forces against him. Damon sounded very confident. He didn't know that Riker was backing Bubba, but he was confident that he had the ability to defeat the king. What can you do? Cash asked disdainfully. You think just because you defeated the crown prince you can defeat Bubba too? Do you really think you are invincible? Young man, you shouldn't have come here today. You will have further offended Bubba. You aren't qualified to discuss an alliance with us. If you want, you can submit and work for us. That's the only option. To put it bluntly, if Damon didn't submit to Titus, only death awaited him. All he could do was wait for Bubba and Titus to fight it out. If Bubba won, he would crush Damon like an ant. So you're saying that you won't work with me? Get lost! Throw him out! The bosses roared. A group of lackeys surrounded Damon and escorted him out. After Damon was gone, the atmosphere in the room became very dull. Titus had clearly stated that fighting was the only option. Some of the braver people stood firmly beside him. There wasn't much hope of defeating Bubba, and the chances of defeating Riker were even slimmer. However, fighting was always better than surrendering. Otherwise, they'd have to sit back and watch Bubba take his revenge. In this world, loyalty and courage were important qualities, otherwise who would respect them in the future? Surrendering would ruin their reputations? They'd rather die fighting. For this group of unruly and violent gangsters, submitting was a fate worse than death. Although they hadn't come up with any new ideas during the meeting, at least they'd reached a consensus. After the meeting ended, the bosses each went home. When they left the clubhouse, they saw someone familiar waiting outside. It was the little punk who'd barged into the meeting earlier. He was leaning against his car, smoking. He appeared to be deep in thought. Black Widow looked at Damon. She found him quite handsome. Cash had been too harsh earlier. Although this young man wasn't their equal, he was right about something. At this moment, they needed all the help they could get. They needed to join forces with all of Bubba's enemies. Titus was at a disadvantage. Besides, this young man wasn't completely useless. After all, he defeated Billy, the crown prince. This proved that he was capable. Black Widow smiled faintly and walked over to him. Hey, handsome. Are you still thinking about how to form an alliance with Titus? Damon watched as she approached. He recognized her. She was one of the bosses from the meeting. The fact that she had a seat at Bubba's table proved that there was more to her than beauty alone. This woman was one of the few who hadn't mocked him during the meeting, Therefore, he nodded to her. Hello. Let me introduce myself. My friends call me Black Widow. You're Damon, right? I admire your courage. You are the first young man who has ever dared to speak like that in front of all the bosses. Thank you for the compliment. Don't take what Cash said to heart. Afterwards, Titus told me to chat with you if I saw you again. He welcomes anyone who shares our ideals to work with us. Together... We can achieve great things. If you want to join us, we welcome you. Also, 
After we deal with this matter, we will treat you fairly. Damon didn't speak, so Black Widow paused for a moment, then she went on. However, no matter what, you mustn't be arrogant. Some of the things that Cash said are right. You are young, you need to face reality and adjust your attitude. Damon smiled. You don't think I'm qualified either, do you? Black Widow looked at him in surprise. She couldn't believe that this kid still considered himself their equal. He was young and arrogant, and he didn't know his place. This kind of attitude was common among people of his generation. However, being young also had its upsides. Despite this, countless good men died young because they thought themselves invincible. When he saw Black Widow's surprised expression, he knew the answer to his question. He smiled coldly and growled. It's your loss if you don't want to cooperate with me. Trust me, you will regret it one day. Before Black Widow arrived, he'd been on the phone with his father's friend Oliver Jonesburg. His father had told Damon to call the man if he encountered any problems that he couldn't solve on his own. Of course, Damon was too proud to take the initiative to call Oliver himself. Oliver had called him. On the phone, the man was very polite. From his demeanor, Damon guessed that this man wasn't just Robert's friend. He got the feeling that the man worked for his father. He was loyal to Mr. Brokerton. Damon was even considering asking Oliver for help dealing with Bubba. Robert had said that he could trust the man. Obviously, he was no ordinary person. The only thing Damon was worried about was Nancy and Robert finding out about the trouble that he was in. By the next day, the news of Titus rejecting Damon's proposal had spread across Meyerson. Damon was the laughingstock of the criminal underworld. Everyone was mocking him. He'd crossed the line. Who did he think he was? How dare he try to cooperate with Titus as if he were an equal? That's the biggest joke I've ever heard. Who does he think he is? He really doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he sure thinks highly of himself. I suppose he did defeat the Crown Prince, though. Ha! If the King of Myerson wasn't busy dealing with Titus, he'd crush that clown. Well, that little punk thinks he can cooperate with a famous boss like Titus, huh? He really doesn't know what's good for him. Even Bubba heard about this news. After all, everyone was laughing about it. Soon, rumors began to spread that Bubba was planning to deal with Damon first. Then, he would deal with Titus. He wanted this ignorant brat to know who the boss of Myerson was. What right did that kid have to negotiate with his enemies? That punk needed to be put in his place. If he didn't learn some respect, everyone on the street would hate him. He would come to a bad end. However, soon, jokes about Damon became old news. After that, rumors about the impending battle between Titus and Bubba spread like wildfire throughout the city. A new leader was challenging the king's reign. Everyone in the criminal underworld knew about Titus and Bubba. Now, the two of them were poised to fight each other. Everyone was wondering who the victor would be in this battle for Meyerson. What would the outcome be? After much speculation, the rules of the battle were finally announced. Both sides would gather all their men and meet on the outskirts of town. Then they would battle. The winner would get the title of king. This battle was against the law. If the gangsters got caught, they would all be sent to prison. However, Titus and Bubba were the most powerful gangsters in the city. If they fought, the battle wouldn't end until one of them died. Neither would surrender. Both parties agreed to the rules of engagement. They each had one week to bring in backup from all over the country. Each of them could choose five fighters to participate in one-on-one -on -one battles. The last man standing would win. The winner would deal with the loser as he pleased. Bubba and Titus were preparing to fight. The consequences of losing would be terrible, so both sides were going all out. When news of the battle began to spread, many people got excited. Such a fight was unprecedented in Meyerson. Everyone was curious to find out who would win and who would lose. The city's future hinged on this battle. Waiting was always the hardest part. During this time, all kinds of rumors spread. Damon was paying attention to the rumors as well. He believed that regardless who won, it was likely that they would come for him next. Both Bubba and Titus thought that he needed to be put in his place. On top of this, Damon didn't belong to any of the big gangs. However, he was still strong. Defeating him would add to the prestige of the new king. Besides, he seemed like an easy target. After all, he was just a useless bum without any connections. Or so they thought. Was that really the case, though? Perhaps they were all wrong. In fact, Damon did have connections. Additionally, his connections were incredibly powerful. He could easily ruin people's lives. Damon planned to go and watch the fierce battle. Perhaps today, 
neither Bubba nor Titus would come out on top. Perhaps he himself would be the winner. It was a clear night, and the moon had risen. The city had a thriving nightlife, and neon signs flickered on every street. It was a warm summer night, and the city was still bustling with people. Tonight, the future of Myerson's underworld would be decided. No one would get any sleep. Titus was challenging Bubba for his title. It would be a fight to the death. Regardless of who won, it would shake Myerson's underworld. The order would change, and there would be chaos in the streets. Naturally, Damon wanted to see the battle. He had his own plans. Furthermore, everyone regarded him as a good-for-nothing brat now. He had to seize this opportunity to re-establish his reputation. It was going to be a bloody battle. The fight was being held in an illegal boxing venue on the outskirts of town. To Myerson's elites, the existence of this venue was an open secret. In fact, places like this existed in most large cities. It was a place where the dark side of humanity was revealed. No one dared to cause trouble here. Even the police turned a blind eye. It was the perfect location to stage the bloody battle for Myerson. According to the rumors, all the crime bosses in the city were attending. Many of them had stakes in the fight. Apparently, even some high-ups from the local government would be attending. However, this was likely just a rumor. No well-known politician would dare to appear in person. However, none of the spectators were worried about being arrested by the police. Anyone who knew about this illegal boxing venue had connections to the criminal underworld. Most of the patrons at this venue were men. Few women dared to come here. Chloe was one of the few. However, she was afraid to go along, so she enlisted her cousin Ben to come along. Chloe's father worked for the government in Meyerson. She was staying with him for the summer. She was bored, and she'd heard about the battle. Chloe was intrigued, and she wanted to check it out. However, after she arrived, she immediately regretted her decision. She'd never been to a fight like this before. It was cruel and bloody. She'd lived a pampered and sheltered life, but she was curious about the criminal underworld. After hearing about the important fight tonight, she urged her cousin to take her. Her cousin Ben had underworld connections, so he could get her in the door. Originally, he hadn't wanted her to come. He'd been to the place before and he knew how terrifying it was. Even he himself was afraid to go there. Although he had underworld connections, he didn't want to have anything to do with the fight tonight. Going there was just asking for trouble. However, Chloe wouldn't stop pestering him, so eventually he gave in and brought her. When they arrived, he repeatedly reminded her that she had to stay close and not wander off. It was a dangerous place for a woman on her own. After Chloe agreed, they entered the venue. Today's bloody battle had drawn twice as many people as usual. As a result, the place was so crowded that it was hard to move around. Chloe grabbed onto her cousin's arm and followed him to look for seats. She listened to the chatter around her and gleaned a shocking piece of news. The loser of this battle would most likely lose his head. Hearing this, she started to regret her decision to come here. However, it was too late to back out now. Just as Chloe was starting to worry, she suddenly noticed a familiar figure near the front of the stands. Was that Damon? She hated that guy. He thought he was so cool. At this moment, he was walking with a short, cold-looking man. Damon was smiling. He looked like he was used to being in places like this. What bad luck. Why did she seem to bump into him everywhere she went? Damon and Axel found seats at the front. Damon was smiling. He had an arrogant and disdainful demeanor. Axel's expression was cold and he had his arms crossed over his chest. An overweight man squeezed into the seat beside him. The man wanted to tell Axel to move over, but when he saw his expression, he decided against it. The guy had eyes like the devil. Damon didn't notice Chloe glaring at him. In fact, the people beside him were glaring too. Only the most important gangsters got to sit at the front. He was surrounded by crime bosses from Myerson's underworld. Black Widow was among them. A few of them knew Damon. They thought he was just a good-for-nothing brat who'd won several battles in Riverside. What right did he have to sit in the front? Damon didn't seem to know his place. But no one took the initiative to call him out on it. What was the point? He was about to die anyway. Everyone was focused on the upcoming battle. Today's battle between Titus and Bubba would determine the future leadership of Myerson's underworld. Damon was on Titus' side. Right now, almost everyone on this side was frowning. A dark cloud hung over them. Titus' chances of winning were extremely slim. Damon was the only person on this side who seemed to be in a good mood. He was talking and laughing with the short, muscular man beside him. His demeanor seemed out of place in the tense atmosphere around the ring, but he didn't care. In the eyes of the bosses, he was arrogant and shameless. 
Everyone glared at him. Being arrogant was okay, but a person needed the strength to back it up. Arrogance without strength was just posturing, and it would send one to an early grave. Black Widow was the closest boss to Damon. She noticed everyone else's dissatisfaction. In fact, she also despised this young punk's behavior. She frowned, leaned close to him, and whispered, Today, Bubba and Titus are fighting a life and death battle. If you think you are on Titus's side, you should be concerned about his safety. I'm not worried, Damon smiled faintly. Why should I be worried? Is Bubba really that powerful? He is, and the man who backs him is even stronger. Black Widow furrowed her brow. She felt that Damon wasn't being very appreciative. He was new on the scene. He'd won some impressive fights, but who here hadn't? He was just a little bastard who thought too highly of himself. He was asking for trouble. If not for the fact that it would be inappropriate for Titus's side to fight amongst itself at this moment, Black Widow wouldn't hesitate to teach this loser a lesson. He needed to learn his place. Are you talking about the man behind him? Damon didn't seem to notice her annoyance. He smiled again. You mean the godfather of Meyerson? Yes, the woman nodded. She had a look of rare reverence in her eyes, but there was also a touch of fear. Riker had a terrifying reputation. No one could surpass him, and everyone looked up to him. Oh, that guy? He's not that strong. Axel, who had been silent the whole time, suddenly interrupted. His expression was full of contempt. He'd heard of the Godfather before, but in his eyes, the guy wasn't that impressive. Black Widow looked at him in shock. She didn't say anything. Her expression changed from one of anger to one of disdain. Then it changed to pity. Clearly, this guy had no idea what he was talking about. She thought that the men beside her were both being rash. Only hotheads would speak so casually of such a powerful figure. They were just trying to flaunt their own strength, but in reality, they were weaklings, so they had to make up for it with arrogance. Unfortunately, all this would get them was a beating. If they were really unlucky, someone would chop them up and throw them into the sewers. Their ignorance wouldn't save them. Nothing would. Black Widow left Damon and Axel and went to sit far away. She felt that sitting next to the two men was an insult. She'd heard that this young man was cruel and merciless. He'd made a name for himself in Riverside. She was afraid that he would come for Titus in the future. However, she now realized that this was unlikely. The guy wasn't very clever. He knew only how to fight. Damon smiled coldly. He saw the look of disdain in Black Widow's eyes. He didn't care. To him, she was just an ant. Axel sneered, but he didn't say anything. The woman wasn't worth getting upset about. Compared to the atmosphere on Titus' side of the ring, the atmosphere on Bubba's side could only be described as calm. The king himself sat in the front. He had his eyes closed. He seemed confident about the outcome of the match. Today, Titus would die. Bubba felt this way because he had Riker on his side. It didn't matter if he lost his own one-on-one -on -one fight tonight because Riker had everything under control. The man was like a hurricane. He would personally take Titus's life. Titus walked into the boxing ring. His lackeys and bodyguards followed behind. He was talking and laughing, and he didn't look nervous at all. He was still as cool as ever. Only men who had weathered real storms had this kind of composure. A muscular man walked next to Titus. Many people knew him. He was a prize fighter in the criminal underworld, and his name was Spike Bones. A few people knew how strong he was. However, the real reason why people were so shocked to see him was because he was the right-hand man of the biggest crime boss on the West Coast. Clearly, Titus had invited him here today to send a message. He wasn't a pushover who could be easily bullied. Bubba had strength behind him, and so did Titus. Each side had five fighters. The last man standing would win the competition for his side. The winning boss could deal with the losers however he pleased. The match was about to begin. The doors closed and the lights dimmed. The people in the crowd began to cheer. In the midst of the roar, the match began. Chloe's cousin Ben was cheering loudly. The testosterone levels in the venue were through the roof at this moment. Chloe felt somewhat afraid. She'd lived a sheltered life and she felt a little uncomfortable. Part of her wanted to go home. However, the doors to the venue were now closed. It was difficult to leave midway through the match. The sound of fighting filled the entire arena. The battle had begun. The first of Bubba's fighters was a muscular man over six feet tall. His eyes glinted with a fierce, predatory light. He wasn't American, he was Mexican, and he was the strongest wrestler in that country. He was a true pro, and he'd fought in illegal fights all around the world. He'd never lost a fight before. In his eyes, the competition was a joke. His fists were deadly weapons. 
on Titus' side. The first person to fight was an old pro. It was rumored that he was one of the three best fighters in Meyerson. The Mexican wrestler knocked him out with just a single punch. No one could tell whether he was still alive. Although this old pro was supposedly strong, he'd been taken down with a single punch. This proved how much stronger the Mexican was. Titus' expression turned ugly. Spike, who was standing beside him, looked serious. That guy is a real pro. His attack was fierce. Any ordinary person would be dead after a blow like that. That knockout was no coincidence. Riker brought that man here to bring you down. Riker invited him? Titus's voice sounded somewhat panicky, but his expression remained stony. Yes. The battle between Titus and Bubba had begun. Bubba's Mexican wrestler had just knocked out Titus's fighter with a single blow. Spike told Titus that he knew about the Mexican. Are you saying that Riker invited him here? Titus asked. His voice sounded a little panicky. Yes. Spike nodded. Everyone around them immediately stopped talking. They were all wondering how Titus's next champion would fare against the Mexican. In fact, his next fighter was much stronger than the old pro who'd gone first. However, in the face of such a ferocious opponent, he still fell a little short. Furthermore, at this moment, the other fighters were all watching. Seeing the Mexican fight had surely dealt a blow to their morale. They were worried about losing now. Hopefully, the Mexican wrestler would exhaust himself. Titus had done his best to prepare for this life and death battle. He'd invited a few of the best fighters in Meyerson to take part in the battle. Additionally, he and Spike were also planning to enter the ring. He would fight with his life for the title of king. Titus and Spike were evenly matched when it came to strength. Titus believed in Spike's capabilities, and he also believed in himself. In recent years, he'd rapidly risen through the ranks of the criminal underworld in Meyerson. Now, he was strong enough to challenge Bubba. This proved how powerful he was. Titus had a plan. After his first three fighters were defeated, Spike would enter the ring and take down all of Bubba's men. If Spike failed, Titus would fight. He wasn't afraid of losing. The Mexican wrestler was the most powerful fighter that anyone had ever seen. Although Titus and Spike hadn't fought him yet, they knew that the man was stronger. No matter how confident Titus was, he still felt a bit nervous at this moment. After all, if he wasn't careful, he would get knocked out too. However, he wasn't afraid. He'd rather die in the ring than give up. Some things were more important than living. Chloe, who was sitting behind Damon, knew that the losing side was in trouble. No matter how ignorant she was, she could still see that the other side's fighters were all extremely terrifying. The current winner had knocked out his opponent with a single punch. She didn't think that anyone stood a chance against him. When she saw the blood stain in the ring, she felt afraid. She looked at her cousin. He seemed shocked too. His eyes were filled with a look of fear and admiration. Chloe's chest felt tight. This was no ordinary fight. A bell rang and the second battle began. Titus's next fighter went into the ring. He was a young man who'd won the world's heavyweight boxing championship. However, the Mexican wrestler knocked him out in three moves. Seeing this, Titus's people scowled. The young fighter was highly respected in the world of pro fighting. However, he'd lost miserably. Things weren't looking good for Titus. Bubba was slaughtering him. Was the king really that untouchable? Titus and his people were all shocked. Their eyes were filled with fear. Only Damon remained confident. He still had a smile on his face. Black Widow glanced in his direction and saw his smug expression. She took it for ignorance and even pitied the guy. She was glad that he wasn't fighting today. It would only add fuel to the fire. On Titus' side, no one had any reason to be unhappy. So far, none of their fighters had stood a chance. Axel's expression was cold. He wasn't interested in a lousy fight like this. I've seen this man fight before. Although he's not the strongest fighter out there, he's definitely the fiercest and one of the most brutal. I haven't seen him in the ring for several years, though. I didn't expect to see him here today, Axel told Damon. He seemed to have a good understanding of this man's abilities. Perhaps he's losing his touch, so he doesn't fight as much anymore. That's one way to remain undefeated, Damon replied. His father's bodyguard seemed to have a lot of experience with this sort of thing. You're right, Axel continued. If he loses, it will ruin his reputation. No one will bet on him anymore. That's the reality of the situation. Mexican wrestlers usually start training from a young age. They have to fight many intense battles. Only the victors go on to become true pros. That so-called heavyweight champion didn't stand a chance. 
Damon expressed as they watched the unconscious boxer being dragged out of the ring. He has a terrifying reputation, but in the end, he's all bark, no bite. He's just here to intimidate the enemy. He can't win against a real pro, Axel growled. Are you interested in going up to fight? Damon asked him with a smile. He could see that Titus was in trouble. It was time for him to make a move. I will do as you command. As a bodyguard, Axel lived to serve. If Damon told him to jump, he'd ask how high. Let's wait and see. You think the third fighter stands a chance? Damon hesitated for a moment and decided to hold off on sending Axel up for now. At this moment, the third competitor had already jumped into the ring. The man was as thin as a pole. He had an angular face. He was wearing brass knuckles, and it was obvious that his specialty was speed. Although the Mexican wrestler wasn't exactly slow, he wasn't as fast as his new opponent. As expected, when the skinny man began to fight, his speed and ferocity caught the Mexican wrestler off guard. The reigning champion, who until now had been very imposing, stumbled around clumsily. It was likely that the skinny boxer would win this round. He's going to lose too, Axel stated. Even though everyone thought that the new opponent had the upper hand, Axel was still skeptical. The skinny man was indeed fast, and at first, the Mexican wrestler had a hard time keeping up. However, although the opponent was speedy, he wasn't very strong. On the contrary, the Mexican had strength and endurance. He was an outstanding fighter, and the skinny man's brass knuckles didn't leave a mark on his muscular body. Axel was right, everyone on Titus' side was unhappy. When the skinny fighter first took to the ring, they felt hopeful. However, this hope was fading. Everyone who had heard Axel's words turned around and glared at him. Even Titus and Spike, who were sitting up front, had heard. Spike was furious. Axel, on the other hand, remained calm and composed. He ignored all the murderous gazes. Axel was perhaps one of the few people here tonight who had the ability to defeat the Mexican. Titus saw that the man was sitting next to Damon and he scowled. In the end, he didn't say anything though. He couldn't let his emotions affect his decisions. Too much was at stake. No, he had to deal with Bubba first. The match was temporarily at a stalemate. Everyone was nervous. However, at this moment, Damon suddenly heard someone exclaim behind him. Although the voice wasn't loud, it seemed out of place, so he noticed. It was Chloe. Damon turned around to see where the strange noise had come from. Although the stands behind him were packed, he could still pick Chloe out among the crowd. She looked scared. She was hiding behind a young man while a fierce-looking thug advanced on her. Obviously, his intentions weren't good. Chloe backed away and he cursed at her. Damn it, what are you scared of? Get over here! Situations like this were common in this place. Usually, no one interfered. Chloe was panicking. It was obvious that she was afraid of the man. After all, she was a sheltered young woman. She didn't have any experience dealing with situations like this. Her cousin Ben was also a little confused. Usually when he came to places like this, no one bothered him. If he was unlucky, he might get beaten up. However, it was different for Chloe. She was a beautiful woman. He should have expected that this would cause problems. Countless men had their eyes on her. He thought that since they were here together, she would be safe. However, he was wrong. Very wrong. He'd misjudged the situation. Now this sleazebag was targeting his cousin. Seeing the fierce-looking man advancing on Chloe, Ben bit the bullet and stepped forward to protect her. Hey, bro, don't do this, okay? This is my cousin. It was obvious that Ben was trembling with fear. The situation looks hopeless. The aggressor saw the timid look on Ben's face. He wasn't worried about him. Here, you had to be tough. It didn't matter how important a person was. If someone was perceived as weak, they didn't stand a chance. Screw off! As expected, the man punched Ben in the face. Chloe's cousin saw stars and he went flying. He fell to the ground unconscious. His attacker was a gangster named Grizzly. Although he wasn't as powerful as Titus or Bubba, he was still a high-ranking boss. In his eyes, Ben was a nobody. Since Ben opposed him, Grizzly had no problem putting him in his place. The punch was so ruthless that it knocked Ben out. Now, Chloe was left to face the gangster on her own. She cried for help. Tears streamed down her face and she looked very pitiful. Several bystanders wanted to help her, but when they saw how fierce her attacker was, they gave up on the idea. Grizzly laughed loudly as he approached her. He was smiling like a hungry wolf. Chloe was undoubtedly a delicious morsel for him. She was desperate, and she scanned the crowd for someone who could help. Finally, her gaze landed on Damon. He was the only other person who she knew here. Even though she didn't like him, she had no one else to turn to. She doubted he could save her, though. Unfortunately, he was her only hope. Damon saw Chloe's desperation and his heart softened. He stood up and went to help her. He pushed through the crowd and confronted them. 
Leave her alone, he asserted coolly. Who are you? The gangster demanded. When he saw Damon blocking his path, his expression immediately became serious. He was annoyed that this guy dared to try stopping him. Anyone who got in his way would die. Scram, Damon spat. He was still smiling, but his eyes shone with a dangerous light. He looked confident. Axel came to Damon's side and assumed a defensive posture. Didn't stand a chance. Damon's expression was disdainful and arrogant. A violent storm of energy swirled inside him, waiting to be unleashed. Axel was on guard. It was his duty to protect his charge. Anyone who wanted to hurt Damon would have to do so over his dead body. Damon stared his opponent down. Suddenly, Grizzly's confidence disappeared and he felt naked. He felt ashamed of his behavior. He breathed heavily through his nostrils and glared at Damon. Then he roared, You are the one who should scram. Get lost. If you dare to say another word, I'll kill you right now. As if responding to the gangster's words, another man stepped out of the crowd. He was Grizzly's lackey and he was holding a knife. Is that so? Damon replied. He was still smiling as if he wasn't concerned at all. However, in truth, he felt a little nervous. Grizzly looked like the devil himself. Damon gave the man a disdainful look. Try it if you dare. I guarantee that you'll be dead within seconds. You have a death wish. I'll kill you. Grizzly was furious. He'd been a big player in Myerson's underworld for many years, but he'd never met such an arrogant young man. He was so angry that all he could do was laugh. He had forgotten all about Chloe. Now he cared only about teaching this arrogant little prick a lesson. However, in the end, Grizzly didn't get the chance. Recognizing Damon, the lackey with the knife tapped his boss on the shoulder and said, That's the new boss of Riverside. You should be careful. This sentence stopped the gangster in his tracks. It also saved his life. Although Titus and Bubba were a lot stronger than Damon, lesser bosses like Grizzly or the Crown Prince didn't stand a chance. If he attacked, he'd soon regret his choice. However, Grizzly was even more afraid of Axel, who was standing beside Damon. The man looked sinister, fierce, and vicious. The boxing match was a dangerous place for a beautiful young woman like Chloe. A gangster named Grizzly spotted her among the crowd and went to make a move. Her cousin Ben tried to stop him, but the gangster punched him in the face. Luckily, Damon stepped in to help. The veins on Grizzly's neck bulged as if they were going to explode. His eyes had a wild look in them, like he was a beast that was about to go berserk. However, Damon just quietly watched him. Chloe, who was hiding behind him, was completely stunned. She was panicking and she didn't know how Damon could be so confident. Did he actually dare to face this powerful monster? Perhaps it was his arrogance that made him so bold. However, she couldn't deny that he was her savior at this moment. For this, she was very grateful. Grizzly thought about what his lackey had just told him. Was this punk really the new boss of Riverside? The gangster decided to play it safe. He growled. Damn it, watch your back. I'll get you one day. Then he sat down sulkily. Backing down was difficult to bear, but this decision had undoubtedly saved his life. Axel's fists were clenched and he was ready to strike at any time. Follow me. Damon motioned to Chloe, who was hiding behind him and strode back to his seat. She trailed behind him. Regardless of whether Chloe wanted to hang out with him or not, he was the only person who she felt safe with here. Despite this, she still looked down on him. Damon, Axel, and Chloe sat down. The intense battle between the skinny man and the Mexican wrestler was still raging. As Axel had foretold, the terrifying Mexican was winning. He was exerting his strength and gradually forcing the skinny man into a corner of the ring. Although his opponent was extremely fast, his speed wasn't much of an advantage. The Mexican wrestler was a born killer. Furthermore, the skinny man's brass knuckles weren't causing much damage. He grew weaker with every strike he made. Furthermore, the Mexican was very cunning. His opponent's chance of winning was getting slimmer and slimmer. How much longer do you think this battle will last? Damon asked Axel with a smile. Within a minute, that boxer will be finished. The bodyguard politely replied. Oh, you have a good eye for these things, Damon commented. He looked at Chloe and realized that she was still scared. The men around them were eyeing her up, so he put his arm around her to send them a message. What are you doing? She exclaimed. She didn't think that he would dare to touch her, and she was shocked. She turned to glare at him. Did he think that he could do whatever he wanted just because he'd saved her? Just because he'd helped her didn't mean she had to like him. Unfortunately, Damon wasn't very perceptive when it came to women. He thought that she was just playing hard to get, so he didn't move his arm. 
What a scoundrel. How could he be so shameless? Chloe silently cursed him. She glared at him and spat. Let go of me, otherwise I'll tell everyone we know. Damon smiled and pretended not to hear her. Suddenly, he heard the heavy thud of a fist making contact in the boxing ring. Axel's guess was very accurate. Before everyone's astonished eyes, the skinny boxer took a blow right to the face. He grabbed the Mexican's thigh as he fell, but the man punched him again. Everyone heard the sound of bones breaking, and the skinny man's face contorted in pain. He spat out a mouthful of blood. He used his last bit of strength to beg for mercy. Let, let me go. I admit defeat. However, his opponent answered him with an even more powerful blow. He struck the man in the head again, killing him. The Mexican wrestler's eyes were red like an enraged bull. He pounded his fists on his chest to show his strength. After a moment of silence, people began shouting. The skinny boxer's death sent the crowd into a frenzy. Everyone was wild with bloodlust. Are you interested in fighting? Damon asked Axel. I will do as you wish, the bodyguard replied. Chloe saw how respectfully this man was treating Damon, and she wondered what was going on. Damon was just a nobody from a poor family. Why was this guy being so polite to him? It was laughable, really. However, this fierce-looking man seemed genuine. These people were all crazy. Chloe had had enough. Damon was beyond redemption. Didn't he realize how ridiculous he was? Go and have fun, Damon commanded with a smug expression on his face. He looked incredibly arrogant as if victory was certain. Remember, kill him. He added indifferently. He just sentenced the Mexican wrestler who was still jumping around on the stage to death. Yes, sir. Axel stood up and walked towards the ring with big strides. When the skinny boxer fell to the ground dead, Titus's and Spike's face turned ashen. They were shocked and angry. Their fighter had admitted defeat, but the Mexican killed him anyway. He was showing off his strength. This was an insult to Titus. Titus and Spike looked at each other. Spike said gloomily, Let me go next. This is not a simple fight anymore. This guy has openly insulted us, and someone needs to put him in his place. Titus nodded. His confidence was wavering. He knew how powerful the Mexican wrestler was. The man was a pro. He was just as strong as they were. The most they could hope for now was a draw, and it would happen only if they got lucky. For the first time, Titus felt death approaching. His opponent was too strong. After fighting Bubba for so many years, no one knew his strength better than he did. Additionally, there was still Riker to contend with. Against him, no one stood a chance. Spike stood up and took off his shirt. His eyes were daggers and his muscles were rock hard. He was trying to intimidate the Mexican wrestler. However, just as he was about to step forward, a short but well-built man got up and walked past Spike. He was heading for the ring. When Axel suddenly walked into the ring, everyone, including Spike, Titus, Black Widow, and Bubba, looked at Damon in confusion. Then, their surprise gave way to fury. Black Widow was so angry that her whole body trembled. She shouted, Damon, what are you trying to do? Call him back. He was gambling with Titus's life. This was no joke. Titus's eyes were cold. What was this clown trying to do? Damon just smiled at them. His expression was confident and disdainful. He sat up straight in his seat. Damn it. Cash was so angry that he cursed aloud. However, it was impossible for them to stop Axel now. The bodyguard was already exchanging blows with this terrifying Mexican wrestler. He had unleashed a violent fury of strikes upon the man. He came in hard and he didn't let up. This time, the Mexican seemed at a disadvantage. He was no longer as calm and composed as he had been. Axel seemed to have everything under control. His opponent seemed scared. He could only defend and wait for an opening to strike. However, the bodyguard didn't give him one. No one knew better than the Mexican how terrifying Axel was. The bodyguard could strike fear into his opponent's soul without even lifting a finger. Perhaps the onlookers couldn't sense it, but the Mexican wrestler sure could. He'd never faced such a terrifying opponent before. If he didn't make a move, then it would be too late. Thus, he spotted his chance and went for it with all his might. He was using his trump card. His punches were packed with destructive power. Titus and Spike had no doubt that the power contained within the man's fists was enough to shatter steel. He was terrifying. However, Axel wasn't afraid. He even absorbed the force of the blows with his own body. When his opponent's fists struck him, it sounded like explosions going off. But no matter how many times Axel got hit, it didn't slow him down. He was a tank. While Axel was being bombarded, his face contorted with fury. 
He looked like a fierce man-eating beast. He steadily advanced, absorbing the force of every powerful strike with his body. Even the devil trembles when he sees me. Do you dare to challenge me? He roared. His words shocked everyone, but they didn't slow his opponent's fierce attack. In fact, the wrestler fought even more ferociously than before. No one was more afraid of Axel than he was. If he lost, he'd never be able to raise his head again. He was starting to worry. His opponent was too powerful. Axel had just claimed that even the devil himself was afraid of him. Regardless of whether it was true or not, it was enough to intimidate his enemy. The wrestler would either live or he would die. There was no other option. He attacked with all his might. Axel struck back. He shot forward with a sudden burst. His fists were terrifying. Time seemed to slow, but in fact, Axel was moving at an astonishing speed. Bang! Everyone except Damon was surprised. Axel's strike shattered his opponent's hand. The wrestler fell backwards heavily and quickly got up again. His eyes shone with an unyielding light. He quickly reached for the bodyguard's throat with his other hand. Unfortunately, he was doomed to fail. His opponent was faster and fiercer. Axel was so fast that he was a blur. Only Damon could see him clearly. The bodyguard struck the wrestler's other hand and sent the man flying. However, as his opponent fell backwards, he grabbed the man's legs. The man roared in shock and fear. Axel exerted his strength and slammed his opponent into the ground. Just like that, he defeated the Mexican wrestler. His strength was terrifying. Axel was like a devil incarnate. He was unstoppable. Bubba could no longer sit still. His face turned red with fury. He, better than anyone, knew what this meant. That's right. The Mexican wrestler was one of Riker's men. The Godfather had arranged for him to fight here today. Without Riker's help, Bubba couldn't have found such a world-class prize fighter. Bubba was smart when it came to battle strategy. To crush his enemy's confidence, he'd purposely sent his most powerful fighter into the ring first. He'd been sure that no one would defeat him. However, he'd miscalculated. It was a ridiculous mistake to make. Not only had Axel defeated the Mexican wrestler, but he'd even killed him. There was no lack of strong men in the criminal underworld. To survive, one had to be prepared to fight at any time. Death waited around every corner. The wrestler was the perfect example of this. The second person Bubba sent into the ring was a young thug. He held an evil-looking hunting knife. However, his eyes were filled with fear. He was afraid of Axel's strength, and he didn't dare to take a step forward. Damon's bodyguard Axel had just defeated Bubba's best fighter. He was invincible. Bubba was shaken, but he sent his next man into the ring. The fighter was a young man with a knife. He hesitated, afraid to make a move. In the blink of an eye, Axel attacked. He was fast and strong. The young man had nowhere to go. There was no escape. Unless Axel took mercy on him, he was going to die. The bodyguard easily subdued his opponent. Then, he scanned the crowd. Finally, he fixed his gaze on Damon, awaiting further instructions. Everyone followed his gaze and saw that he was looking at Damon. However, no one could understand why. Titus didn't understand, and neither did Chloe, Black Widow, or Bubba. Kill him, Damon said casually with a wave of his hand. He was smiling and he seemed comfortable being the center of attention. At this moment, he didn't look like an innocent young university student at all. He was overcome with bloodlust. The heartless Mexican wrestler had awakened something within him. He was intent on getting revenge. Bang! Axel punched his opponent in the throat. Damon had sentenced a man to death with a casual wave of his hand. His power was superior. The others could only look up to him. He was mercilessly trampling Bubba's dignity. He was powerful and terrifying. Everyone was shocked, however, they weren't looking at Axel. They were looking at Damon. After receiving his boss's order, Axel killed his opponent. No one doubted Damon's capabilities anymore. He was strong enough to move mountains. No one knew who Axel was. He was Damon's trump card. Even Titus furrowed his brow. His expression had changed drastically. Until now, he'd considered Damon a joke. However, the show of power that the young man had just displayed was simply astounding. With Axel on his side, he wasn't afraid anymore. Titus relaxed and he began to wonder who this little hoodlum from Riverside really was. Why was the stone cold killer in the ring listening to his orders? Titus finally realized that Damon was no ordinary person. If he was, he wouldn't be so calm and confident. Everyone's eyes were on him. 
No, only someone incredibly powerful could remain so cool under such circumstances. When Bubba saw his fighter fall to the floor dead, he lost it. He jumped up angrily and began to shout. He'd underestimated Damon, and he began to regret ever offending him. Perhaps this was the biggest mistake of his life. He wanted to teach the kid a lesson, but then he locked eyes with Axel and thought better of it. The bodyguard looked murderous, so Bubba quickly shut his mouth. After Bubba's remaining fighters saw Axel's strength, they didn't dare to face him in the ring. The young man sitting at the front had spoken. There would be no mercy. Axel was ruthless and he wouldn't hesitate to take their lives. This was no joke. Everyone's eyes were fixed on Damon. They looked at him with expressions of respect, fear, and hate. Damon, on the other hand, was calm and composed. He looked at Chloe, who was frightened, and smiled gently. What's wrong? Are you scared? Oh, she nodded. She had good reason to be afraid. After all, she'd lived a sheltered life and she was out of her element. Although she was occasionally rebellious, she'd bitten off more than she could chew this time. Chloe wished that she was hanging out with her friends right now, going for a walk or playing golf. She simply couldn't stand being the focus of so many malicious gazes. If Damon hadn't been at her side, she would have fainted from fright long ago. If you are afraid, stick with me. With my protection, no one will touch you, Damon said confidently with a smile. Although Chloe was still annoyed that he had his arm around her, she couldn't deny that he made her feel safe. Finally, her heart rate slowed to normal. She nodded and looked up at him. She had to admit that she felt comfortable with this guy. He was something special. Bubba suddenly stood up. He was furious. He'd been about to crush Titus. He'd been about to secure his title as the King of Meyerson once again. However, now the tables have turned. Not only had he failed to kill Titus, but he'd even put his own life in danger. His self-restraint was gone. He picked up the phone and dialed a number. If he wanted to live, he needed backup. Bubba was ready to throw caution to the wind. It was time to bring out the big guns. He needed Riker. In fact, Bubba didn't even need to call. Riker had already arrived and he had a large group of people with him. This battle was about to get bloodier. The doors to the venue swung open with a bang. The newcomers threw the men who were in charge of guarding the doors into the crowd. The whole place instantly descended into chaos. The doors were open and a cold wind blew in. The spectators felt chills creep up their spines and it wasn't because of the draft. No, it was because the people who just arrived were very intimidating. Everyone in the group was tall and well-built, and they all looked terrifying. They wore their battle scars like badges of honor. Their expressions were grim and brutal. People felt the terrifying energy radiating from them and trembled with fright. Riker, the godfather of the East Coast, and a true legend of the underworld had finally arrived. He walked to the center of the arena and his entourage followed. He was like the sun, and his men were like planets orbiting him. The spectators watched in awe. Titus and Spike stood up. Their faces turned ashen, and the joy that they'd felt at winning disappeared. The arrival of this man was undoubtedly a great threat. No matter how confident Titus was, he wasn't arrogant enough to think he could defeat this legendary figure. Bubba and his group of lackeys stood up. Their spirits renewed. They weren't worried about losing the competition anymore. In fact, Bubba had never taken this competition very seriously. He was no gentleman, and he'd never planned to follow the rules. Black Widow also stood up. Seeing this imposing group of people arrive shocked her too. The man in the lead was even stronger than Titus. He made everyone else here look weak. Chloe didn't stand up, but she did turn to look at the newcomers. When she saw their leader, she was shocked. He was domineering, arrogant, and unstoppable. Damon didn't stand up either. He smiled faintly as he watched this legendary figure walk into the ring. Except for Damon, Chloe, and Axel, almost everyone else was standing. It was as if they all wanted to get a better look at the Godfather. Only a man like him got this kind of attention. The fact that everyone else was standing made it even more obvious that Damon had remained in his seat. He looked cool and aloof. Since Damon hadn't moved, naturally Axel wouldn't move either. He acted on Damon's orders. Without his boss's say-so, the bodyguard wouldn't lift a finger. Damon didn't move, and neither did Chloe. Since this terrifying newcomer had arrived, more people were looking in her direction. They were all glaring at her. She felt the pressure to stand up, but in the end, she didn't. This was mostly because her legs felt weak and she was scared. Someone reached out and took her hand. It was Damon. He realized that she was terrified, so he held her hand and gave her a gentle smile. Don't be afraid. I will take care of everything. His smile was warm and soothing. To her, he was like an oasis in the desert. He was her savior, and with him, she didn't feel afraid. Then she suddenly felt shy, and she lowered her head. Thank, thank you. 
Her attitude toward him softened. She felt unexpectedly calm and comfortable in his presence and she no longer had to fear. Riker was a true legend in the criminal underworld. He was the godfather of Meyerson and the entire East Coast. However, Riker was only a nickname. In the criminal underworld, it was common for people to use aliases. Riker's real name was Oliver Jonesburg. He was the man who Robert told Damon to call if he needed help. Oliver had an arrogant expression on his face. He looked around at the crowd and then at Titus. When his gaze fell on Titus, the gangster trembled. Oliver had eyes like a shark. A chill ran down the gangster's spine. However, Oliver soon looked away. In the end, his gaze landed on Damon, who smiled at him. Chloe started to feel afraid again. The newcomer was walking towards them and he was very intimidating. Titus was also frightened. He thought that Oliver wanted to cause trouble for Damon, so he immediately shouted, Damn it, stand up. Although Damon's bodyguard had won the match just now, it was unlikely that he could defeat the Godfather. If the man got upset, Damon and his companions would end up dead. Bubba smiled. That little bastard is finally going to pay for his arrogance. Axel didn't move. He looked at Oliver with disdain. Sorry I'm late, sir, Oliver apologized. He nodded respectfully to Damon. His arrogant demeanor was gone. To Damon, he was humble and polite. Had he actually called him sir? Although Damon already suspected the reason for this, he was slightly surprised that the man was being so respectful in front of all these people. No one knew about the history between him and Damon's father. Robert had helped the Godfather out of a desperate situation. He'd saved Oliver's life. From then on, the gangster had sworn loyalty to Robert. In his eyes, Mr. Brokerton was his benefactor. He did whatever the man asked, even if people looked down on him for it. He didn't care. He lived to serve the Brokertons. You're not late, Damon replied with a nod. He stood up and Axel and Chloe followed suit. Damon had a smile on his face, and he looked calm and relaxed. However, his eyes glinted evilly. This made him look both bewitching and charming. He responded to Oliver as if it were the most natural thing in the world for this man to respect him. He was the heir of the Brokerton family. He held a position of authority. At this moment, the entire world was in his hands. Seeing all this play out, no one doubted his status anymore. Everyone looked at him with a kind of reverence. They couldn't believe their eyes and they felt a bit afraid. Titus didn't understand. How did this good-for-nothing punk know the godfather of the East Coast? Who was he and why was Riker submitting to him? Bubba and Black Widow didn't understand either. Who was this Damon guy? They couldn't figure it out. Suddenly, Bubba lost his nerve. He was afraid and his face turned deathly pale. He remembered now he'd wanted to put Damon in his place. Now it seems ridiculous. Chloe also didn't understand. How did this powerful man know Damon? Why was he being so polite? And why was Damon so calm and aloof? He was acting like he owned the place. At this moment, Chloe's preconceived image of Damon was falling apart. In fact, everyone had misjudged him. People looked at him with expressions of shock, panic, disbelief, and confusion. But he just smiled calmly. His natural, noble demeanor made him stand out among the crowd. Oliver, also known as Riker, the godfather of the East Coast, stood respectfully in front of him. Axel, who was standing beside him, asked, Duh, what should we do next? Damon turned to Oliver. Do you know the rules of the competition? Yes, Oliver replied. A cold light flashed in his eyes. The loser dies. Bubba lost. What should we do? Damon didn't intend to make things difficult for Oliver. In fact, if not for him, Titus would be dead. The Godfather's word was law here and no one would dare to go against him. Kill him, Oliver growled. He was furious with Bubba for what he'd done to Damon and he wanted revenge. The king seemed to finally realize that he was in big trouble. He was stunned for a moment, then he roared furiously. Godfather, how can you do this? You said that you'd help me. Ugh! Bubba didn't have a chance to finish. He screamed in terror as a big man from Oliver's entourage stepped toward him. The man was fierce and terrifying. He was carrying a sickle and he slit Bubba's throat. It all happened so fast that even Bubba didn't know what had happened. He put his hand on his neck and felt blood gushing from the wound. Only then did he realize he was dying. Before everyone's terrified eyes, he fell to the ground with a thud. He had an expression of shock and disbelief on his face. Bubba hadn't seen death coming for him. After the king was dead, the doors of the venue were thrown open. The competition was over. Undoubtedly, Titus was the winner today. However, Damon was the person who everyone would remember. Despite his young age, he was a very capable man. His plan had worked, and he now held the entirety of Myerson's criminal underworld in his palm. The dust had settled.
Time passed quickly and the bloody boxing match between Titus and Bubba faded into the past. Except for the odd conflict here or there, Damon's life returned to normal. People gradually forgot who he was and his accomplishments became the stuff of legends. Damon finally agreed to do an interview on the news. He wanted to promote his company, Everbright. At the same time, Quinn and his team were meeting with politicians. Damon was testing Quinn's competence and his friend didn't disappoint. He met with many prominent government leaders and successfully reassured them that the company was not a threat to national security. Damon was even more satisfied to see that upon Quinn's return, he was more confident and optimistic than he'd been before. He achieved what he'd set out to do and it bolstered his self-esteem. After listening to Quinn's detailed report on the trip, Damon was very satisfied. He felt that his friend was ready to take on a more important position. Therefore, the next day, he promoted him to general manager. To Quinn, this was undoubtedly a huge step forward. He was now Damon's second in command, and he had 10,000 people below him. When he found out about his promotion, he was dumbfounded. Although he'd been with the company since the beginning, and he often assisted Damon in his work, he didn't feel qualified to hold such an important position. However, Damon assured him that he was more than capable. After the necessary documents were signed, Quinn's new position was official. After Quinn got his promotion, he was overjoyed. He'd been working for Damon for many years, so he knew just how powerful Astronet was. To be honest, he was happy to continue working for his friend. He wanted to do his best and help bring Astronet to new heights. Along with his promotion, he got a generous raise. He hadn't expected Damon to entrust him with so much responsibility. To a kid like Quinn from a small town, this was truly life-changing. Along with his new position, he also received a portion of company shares, which earned dividends. This meant that he owned part of the business. If Astronet was lucky enough to be listed on the market in the future, Quinn stood to make a lot of money. However, he didn't dare to think about this. After all, he was already earning more money than he'd ever made in his life. Just thinking about it made him feel dizzy. Quinn not only experienced an increase in wealth, but also in social status. Although Astronet hadn't been listed yet, it had a lot of potential. Anyone with good judgment could tell that the tech company was poised to become a behemoth in the industry. After Quinn became the general manager, news of this quietly spread. Soon it reached the headlines of all the major media outlets. Before long, everyone knew his name and he became a prominent figure in society. People worshipped, respected, and feared him. Countless people also tried to curry favor with him. He received many invitations to important summits and fancy banquets. All of Meyerson's elites wanted to get to know him. Comparatively speaking, few people had heard of the true founder and CEO of the company, Damon. He didn't receive any invitations to events. After all, Astronet hadn't been listed yet, so much about it was still a secret. As long as people within the company kept things to themselves, the general public wouldn't find out. However, after the initial excitement passed, Wynn felt a deep sense of responsibility and fear. He was afraid that he couldn't handle such an important position. It was a lot of pressure. What if he messed things up? Damon trusted him, and he didn't want to let him down. If he did, he'd never be able to forgive himself. After serious consideration, he even told Damon that he wanted to resign. He told him that he was afraid. He didn't want to ruin everything that his friend had built. However, Damon just patted his shoulder. Work hard and do your best. I believe in you. Besides, when a company goes under, it's never just one person's fault. You just need to have confidence in yourself and take your job seriously. After hearing Damon's encouraging words, Quinn calmed down. He finally had faith in himself. The summer vacation passed quickly. Damon traveled back and forth between LA and Meyerson a lot. He wanted to see Avery, but she was busy with her career. They didn't get a chance to meet during the vacation, but they often talked on the phone. While they were chatting one day, Avery told him a surprising piece of news. It was about Fiona. It turned out that his ex had signed a contract with Tony Music Entertainment. She and Avery would be performing a concert together this fall. It was going to be a stadium show in front of 100,000 people. Avery and Fiona were rising stars in the music industry. In terms of success, Fiona was making a bigger splash in the music industry than Avery. However, when it came to film, Avery was more famous. After telling Damon this news, Avery asked if he was happy for Fiona. She even said that she was okay with him meeting his ex to talk about things. However, despite Avery's good intentions, it was obvious that she still felt bitter. She said that she was fine with it, but in her heart, she was exceptionally nervous. Damon could only smile and comfort her. He and Fiona were finished. In his heart, he knew that it was really over between them. However, a part of him didn't want to believe it. Every day, he secretly hoped that Janice or Mia would call. 
Mia had promised to help him get a glimpse of the guy who was after Fiona. When a chance arose, she would let him know. It had been a long time now and he hadn't heard anything. He wondered if Mia had forgotten about this matter. In his heart, he really wanted to see Fiona one last time, even if just on stage at the upcoming concert. After that, he wouldn't have any more regrets. It was the end of summer and university was back in session. Damon was happy to be heading back to class. This was his fourth and final year. He was a senior now and he was a wily old fox. The campus was still the same as it had been when he was in first year, but Damon himself had changed a lot. When he thought about how he and his friends would soon go their separate ways, it made him feel sad. Compared to the new students, the senior students had a heaviness about them. They had lots of experience to impart upon the freshmen, but they were no longer in the mood to put it into practice. They felt nostalgic for a simpler time, and they already missed being in school. The setting was similar, but they were a year older now. Fourth year was extremely important. The seniors had to make life choices. Some would choose to continue their studies. They might go to study abroad or apply for grad school. Others were busy looking for work. There were even a few who weren't doing any of this. They were shirking responsibility while they still could. Comparatively speaking, fourth year students didn't have as heavy a course load as first, second, and third year students. The first semester of senior year was mainly dedicated to internships. In the final semester, students wrote their thesis and prepared to graduate. During this period, a national news network arranged to interview Damon. Surprisingly, the interview was being conducted at the DC Academy of Music. Everbright was expanding. Its games, Old and New Century, were still popular, and it had recently launched a new game called Global Hegemony. Once this game launched, it quickly became a favorite of countless gamers. It even became popular in the esports circle. Because so many people played Old and New Century, Global Hegemony was soon extremely popular as well. The strongest esports team competing at Global Hegemony was a group of students from the DC Academy of Music. The five man team quickly became the idols of all the esports fans in the world. They were just as famous as superstars in the music industry. Therefore, Damon was being interviewed at the DC Academy of Music. The reporters had arranged for the famous esports team to have a face to face conversation with the founder of Everbright. Undoubtedly, it would attract a lot of attention. When Damon heard this news, he was stunned. He hadn't expected global hegemony to be so successful. The game currently has hundreds of millions of players around the world. Additionally, many fans of the esports team were sure to tune into the broadcast. Countless students would likely also come out to support them. Damon even wondered if he would meet Fiona. When he thought of this, his heart filled with anticipation. He hoped that she would see how successful he was. While he was thinking about Fiona, he finally received the phone call that he'd been waiting for. It was Mia. She told him to come to the DC Academy of Music if he could. Wyatt was making a move on Fiona. He was planning to publicly declare his love for her. Everyone was talking about it and it was causing a huge sensation. Even students from other schools were discussing it. However, the news was making the biggest splash at Georgetown, Wyatt's alma mater. He was very popular there and he was at the top of all his classes. Georgetown was considered one of the best schools in the country and Wyatt was an influential person on his campus. He'd even started his own rock and roll band. On top of this, he was handsome and he was the captain of the basketball team. Countless women swooned over him. He was a rising star and many women dreamed of falling in love with a guy like him. However, he had his eye on Fiona. All the women who had crushes on him were heartbroken. Additionally, many people were curious to see what kind of lady had caught the eye of this handsome hunk. Guys and gals alike were all having heated discussions on this topic. They all speculated about whether Fiona would agree to date Wyatt. It was rumored that Fiona already had a boyfriend. Some people even said that he was her fiance. However, this was just talk. No one had ever seen another man by her side. The guys from the academy concluded that Wyatt didn't stand a chance with Fiona. She was aloof and no one had ever seen her go out on a date with anyone. Those who claimed they had were lying. If Fiona wouldn't date a guy from the academy, then she definitely wouldn't date a guy from Georgetown. If she did, it would be an embarrassment to the school. However, the women from Georgetown who blindly worshipped Wyatt were convinced that Fiona would agree to date Wyatt. Although they didn't want to see him taken off the market, they were still proud that he went to their school. He was the best of the best, and if Fiona had any sense, she wouldn't turn him down. Because this gossip involved the school beauty of the academy and the star student of Georgetown, it attracted a lot of attention. Eventually, word spread to other schools as well. Students in every major university in DC were discussing it. Some people were even betting money on the outcome. Speculation ran rampant. 
Before long, the time had arrived for Wyatt to confess his feelings to Fiona. On the day before this was scheduled to take place, Damon boarded a plane to DC and checked into a small hotel near the DC Academy of Music. When the day in question dawned, Damon was filled with anxiety and disappointment. That night, Fiona's campus was abuzz with excitement. Students ran around and informed everyone in the entire school what was happening. Mia and Janice called Damon and told him to hurry over. They wanted to see who he was up against. Even though Damon was a smart and talented guy, he didn't stand a chance with Fiona anymore. Damon heard that Wyatt was preparing to confess his love to Fiona, so he hopped on a plane and flew to DC. He checked into a hotel near the DC Academy of Music. That evening, Janice and Mia called him and told him to hurry over. Wyatt was preparing his grand gesture for tonight. When he arrived on campus, he found that there were more people on the roads than usual, especially around the women's dorms. Many of the students were hanging around nearby, wanting to witness this romantic gesture with their own eyes. Some students from other schools even began to arrive. They wanted to watch so they could report back to their friends on other campuses. Reporters from the school paper were there to cover the event too. Many women had brought boxes of tissues. If the grand gesture succeeded, they'd be moved to tears. However, what attracted the most attention was undoubtedly all the luxury cars that were parked on the street in front of Fiona's dorm building. The street was jam-packed with Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Porsches, Maseratis, Acuras, Mercedes-Benzes, and BMWs. The young people who were standing around these cars looked extremely cool. They watched the passers-by with lazy and proud expressions. They considered themselves above these other ordinary students. In fact, they did indeed seem extraordinary. The men were tall and handsome, and they even seemed a little dangerous. The women were incredibly beautiful, and they wore very fashionable clothes. People like this drew attention wherever they went. It was immediately apparent that they belonged to the upper class. One of them, an enchanting woman named Sylvie, tucked her hair behind her ears and asked, Do you think Wyatt will succeed in finding love today? The innocent-looking young woman beside her smiled sweetly. Yes, for sure. Don't you know who Wyatt is? Sylvie thought for a moment before replying, I'm not so sure. I heard that Fiona is quite full of herself. She has a lot of guys interested in her. That may be, but this is Wyatt. He's no ordinary guy. The woman's tone was filled with disdain. Clearly, she didn't like Fiona. Sylvie smacked her friend's arm. You always speak so highly of Wyatt. Don't tell me you have a crush on him. Tisk, tisk, what if I do? Didn't you write him an anonymous love letter? I know all about it. What a pity that Wyatt only has eyes for Fiona. He doesn't even know you exist. The two women with crushes on Wyatt started to fight. It was almost seven o'clock in the evening. The sunset painted the horizon red. More and more people gathered in front of Fiona's dorm. At the center of the crowd was an extremely tall and handsome guy. His eyes were dreamy and he looked like the main character of a TV show. At this moment, he was bending down and arranging candles on the ground. It was obvious that he was taking this very seriously. He was very precise about where he placed the candles. He'd even drawn out the pattern beforehand with chalk and measured it with a ruler. The candle holders that he was using looked antique and he had hundreds of them. Moreover, each candle holder had a cover to prevent the flames from being extinguished. The candlelight illuminated the surroundings and people's faces glowed in the flickering light. After setting up the candles, the man walked over to a gorgeous Lamborghini and opened the trunk. As soon as he did, countless beautiful roses spilled out. When the women in the crowd saw this, they exclaimed with excitement. He had red roses, white roses, and blue roses. His trunk was a sea of flowers. The owners of the other luxury cars opened their trunks too. Their cars were also filled with countless beautiful flowers. The bystanders smelled the delicate fragrance of the blossoms, and the women who were watching immediately took out their phones and began taking photos. Then, the guy instructed his friends on where to place the flower arrangements. He wanted to make a romantic heart shape with just a small path open to the middle. This was where he would confess his love to Fiona later. A handsome guy was confessing his love to a beautiful woman, surrounded by countless well-wishers. How romantic was that? This kind of thing usually happens only in fairy tales. In addition to the candles and flowers, Wyatt had prepared a large firework display. The fireworks were well hidden, ready to be lit the moment that he confessed. Under such circumstances, most women would be moved to tears. He also planned to give Fiona a brand new burgundy BMW. He'd bought it yesterday. In addition, he'd made dinner reservations at a certain five-star restaurant. Wyatt's preparations showed how determined he was. This was undoubtedly the grandest romantic gesture that the campus had ever seen. It would go down in the Academy's history. Everyone was talking about it. The show had yet to begin, but the women in the crowd were already crying as they took pictures of all the flowers and candles. It was touching. 
If Wyatt were to confess his love to them at this moment, they would undoubtedly throw themselves into his arms. Damon looked at Wyatt, who was fiddling with the flower arrangements, though this was the guy who was pursuing Fiona. He hadn't expected him to spend so much money on this gesture. Not only was he being romantic, but he was also showing off his wealth. He'd brought a huge group of friends and family to help him. He was rich, handsome, and popular. It was enough to make most women's hearts melt. However, Wyatt still wasn't sure if Fiona would agree to date him. Damon, who was already a little shaken, felt even more uncertain. He had to keep reminding himself that he had Avery now. He should be happy for Fiona, but he was selfish. Was he really going to watch this bastard confess to his ex? This was just too much. Fiona used to be his girlfriend. The thought of seeing her with another man was just too painful. So Damon thought about how he could ruin Wyatt's gesture. He really didn't want to see Fiona throw herself into this guy's arms. He looked around. His ex would arrive here later. He had to say something, right? At least he could try to give her something too. Should he steal one of Wyatt's flowers? No. What if he was discovered? After hesitating for a moment, he went to look around. Finally, he found some flowers growing in a pot not far away. They didn't seem to belong to anyone. They were perfect. Damon had been standing with Janice and Mia. The two women were also extremely excited to watch Wyatt confess his love. Mia wanted Damon to see the guy's passion for Fiona. He was rich, handsome, and powerful. On top of this, he was also a top student at Georgetown. Compared to Wyatt, what hope did Damon have? They were on two different levels. Mia turned around to ask Damon what he thought, but when she did, she found that he disappeared. Looking around, she finally saw him down the street picking some flowers. When he returned, Mia asked curiously, What are you doing? I want to confess my love to Fiona too, he replied as he carefully arranged the blooms and removed the dirt from them. They didn't look too bad. After all, they were very fresh. No matter what, he had to ruin that bastard's plan. Mia was stunned. You, you want to give those to Fiona? Yes, why are you looking at me like that? Mia felt a little embarrassed. Damon, what are you thinking? Are you purposely trying to cause trouble? He replied seriously. How do I know if I don't try? Maybe it will work. Janice, who was next to him, laughed. She didn't know if he was joking, but she found it quite funny. After she finished laughing, she said, All right, all right, I won't tease you anymore, but look around you. Look what Wyatt has prepared. What do you think? It's romantic, right? If you really want to confess your love to Fiona, don't you think you should try a little harder? Yes, Wyatt's gesture is quite romantic, Damon nodded. However, he wasn't concerned. Mia looked at him skeptically. Do you really think you stand a chance? Yes, he replied with confidence. She rolled her eyes at him. She was sure that he was just messing around. Waiting was always the hardest part. Damon looked calm and relaxed, but Wyatt, who was standing in the middle of the sea of flowers, looked very anxious. He kept glancing up at the building as if he was expecting Fiona to appear at a window. His friends stood by his side and comforted him. They told him that someone had gone upstairs to invite Fiona down. He just had to wait a little longer for her. Although he was confident that she'd agree to date him, his brow was still covered in sweat. He looked very nervous. Suddenly, Two women ran out of the building and shouted excitedly, She's coming! Wyatt, get ready, hurry up! Fifi is coming down! This sent the crowd into an uproar. People shouted, whistled, and hooted. Wyatt's chest suddenly felt tight, and his grip around the beautiful rose in his hand tightened too. Damon, who was standing in the crowd, also became nervous. Fiona, who he hadn't seen for a long time, was finally going to appear. He tightly clutched his bouquet of flowers. Was he doing the right thing, or was he just being shameful? When Fiona saw him, would she pretend she didn't know him? This was very possible. Mia saw that he was worried and asked, What's wrong? I'm nervous. What if she rejects me? Was this guy really going to confess his love with this stolen bouquet of flowers? Mia rolled her eyes. She was speechless. This guy was something else. Suddenly she thought of something. What if people recorded Damon's confession and posted it online? Would it go viral? What if students at Myerson University saw it? It would be a huge embarrassment. As they were talking, the people in the crowd suddenly began to cheer louder. The entire street was in an uproar. Damon, Mia, and Janice turned their heads and looked. They saw a woman standing in the middle of the crowd. She'd just walked out of the dormitory. It was the woman who Damon had been dreaming of, Fiona. At this moment, she was dressed casually. It didn't matter what she wore, though. She always looked beautiful. Compared to the last time Damon saw her, she looked more grown up now. She was intoxicating to watch, and everyone was staring. However, she still seemed approachable in a girl-next-door sort of way. This, combined with her beauty, gave her a unique charm. She was incredibly moving. She was five foot six, and her skin was fair and flawless. No wonder men went crazy for her. She was considered the most beautiful woman on campus. At this moment, 
She was the only woman who Damon had eyes for. He was finally seeing her again. She was the first woman who he'd truly loved, and he had many happy memories of her. He felt moved. Wyatt was also excited to see her. Everyone was moved by her beauty at this moment. She was out of this world. The two women beside Fiona were probably her roommates. From time to time, they pointed at Wyatt, who was standing in the middle of the heart of flowers. They were likely telling her to agree to Wyatt's proposal. After all, he was being so sincere. They told Fiona about how he'd bought a BMW for her. Moreover, the guy was rich and handsome. Most importantly, he was deeply in love with her. If she didn't agree, then she would surely miss her chance. Fiona smiled, but she didn't speak. She looked at Wyatt. How could she be so calm? Most women would give anything to be with a guy like him. He was a real catch. Wyatt was excited. Fiona's roommates led her into the middle of the heart of flowers, and Wyatt impatiently ran over. Then he knelt down on one knee and offered her the bouquet in his hand. Beefy, will you be my girlfriend? I am willing to do anything for you. Wyatt's friends were prepared. Just as he knelt down, they lit the fireworks. There was a loud bang and beautiful explosions blossomed in the sky. The display was stunning. Wow, it's so romantic, I'm going to cry. Some women screamed. <laughs> Wyatt, why aren't you interested in me? If I were her, I'd definitely say yes. Many women broke out in tears. They felt that the gesture was touching and romantic. Some women even shamelessly confessed their love. Wyatt, I love you. Wyatt, I love you so much. Unfortunately, he didn't care about any of them. Many people took out their phones to take pictures. Some even recorded videos. If Wyatt's grand gesture worked, other people would definitely imitate it in the future. His gesture was also bound to cause problems for other guys as well. Who knew how many women would break up with their boyfriends because they'd never done anything so romantic? Mia was also touched. She poked Damon, who was beside her, and said, Hey, look, that guy knows how to impress a lady. What about you, huh? Are you actually going to give her your tiny bouquet? You're just going to embarrass yourself. Janice looked at him and added, Damon, you should give up. In the end, we are just ordinary folks. Wyatt had just asked Fiona to date him. Everyone was anxiously waiting for her to respond. Damon was holding his little bouquet of flowers, preparing to confess his feelings to Fiona as well. Janice looked at him and whispered, You should give up. In the end, we are just ordinary folks. Unfortunately, his mind was a mess at this moment, and he didn't listen. He clutched his bouquet tightly and wondered if Fiona would accept Wyatt's proposal. Maybe she'd turn him down. Perhaps he was nervous for no reason. In his head, he silently repeated the words, Say no, say no, say no. Then, before the gazes of the people in the crowd, Fiona looked at Wyatt, then at the fireworks, and then at the sea of flowers around her. Just then, just when everyone thought that she was about to agree and start crying with joy, she opened her mouth and murmured, But I already have a boyfriend. Was she rejecting him? Was this really happening? The crowd was in an uproar. No one had expected Fiona to say no to Wyatt. However, soon people realized that she hadn't exactly refused. She'd said only that she had a boyfriend. Did this mean there was still a chance that she'd agree? Damon felt his heart skip a beat. Wyatt had a gloomy expression, but he wondered if she was testing him. If so, could he pass the test? If he gave up so easily, he'd be the laughingstock of campus. All this hard work would go to waste. Thus, he became even more resolute and he said affectionately, Beefy, I don't care if you have a boyfriend or not. I want you to be my girlfriend, all right? I promise that I will do anything it takes to get you to agree. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Hearing this, Fiona began to cry. Many women in the crowd began to cry as well. Countless people clapped and chanted, Say yes, say yes. The people in the crowd were overcome with emotion, and the applause became even more intense. It was like a tidal wave. People shouted, Say yes, say yes. Say yes, say yes, say yes, say yes. Even Mia and Janice took up the chant. Damon felt that something wasn't right. He was afraid that Fiona might give in to the pressure. So he threw caution to the wind and began to push through the crowd. He held his bouquet up and shouted, Beefy, don't do it. You are my girlfriend and I still love you. Everyone turned to look. Before the watchful eyes of the crowd, Damon stepped into the middle of the heart of flowers and held out his meager bouquet. Then, he looked around and realized how inadequate his own flowers were, so he picked up a rose from one of Wyatt's arrangements and offered it to Fiona instead. Everyone looked at him. They were stunned, shocked, and speechless. This was absurd. 
Was someone actually interrupting such a solemn moment? Was this guy crazy? On top of this, the guy was even presenting her with a rose stolen from Wyatt's arrangement. This guy was sure thick-skinned. Where did he find the nerve to do such a thing? Mia's mouth hung open. So did Janice's. Everyone was stunned. They'd never expected anyone to be so bold as to interrupt Wyatt's grand romantic gesture. Even more ridiculous was the fact that it happened in front of so many people. Did this guy have any shame? He was a huge embarrassment. Janice, however, felt that he was brave. Mia, on the other hand, simply turned her head away. If others found out that she knew this guy, it would be super embarrassing. Who is this loser? Someone muttered. I don't know, but he's a joke. What did he give her? It looks like he just picked those flowers from the campus garden. Oh my God, doesn't he have any shame? How can anyone be so clueless? Everyone was laughing, but Fiona wasn't paying attention. She was staring at Damon, who had suddenly appeared in front of her. Her mouth hung open and she felt dazed. No one knew what she was thinking. Damon stared back at her. At this moment, it felt like no time had passed. It was as if they'd never been apart. However, Fiona had written him that letter and disappeared from his life. Could they still turn back time? Could things be as they once were? Wyatt turned to see who was ruining his romantic gesture. He wondered which mental hospital this guy had escaped from. When did you get here? Fiona asked with a trembling voice, completely ignoring the shocked expression around her. Was she actually responding to this guy? What about Wyatt? This guy wasn't worthy of Fiona. How dare he interrupt? Everyone thought that Damon was crazy, but Fiona's attention was entirely focused on him. Mia and Janice were so shocked that their mouths hung open. They couldn't believe their eyes. Everyone was stunned. Fiona actually seemed to know this loser. On top of this, judging from her expression, it even seemed like they were close. Damon raised his bouquet of flowers. He knew he looked ridiculous. He kept his tone casual. I came here during the summer vacation and I saw your photo on a bulletin board. That's how I knew you were a student here. Then, a friend told me about what was happening today, so I came to find you. He saw tears well up in Fiona's eyes. She bit her lip and asked, Since you were at my school, why didn't you come and find me? I wanted to, but I didn't have your contact info. If I hadn't happened to see your photo on the bulletin board, I wouldn't have known you were a student here, he explained. Fiona suddenly shook her head. You don't have to lie to me. Her eyes were filled with tears. The onlookers couldn't believe that this untouchable goddess was actually shedding tears over a guy. However, people felt a bit insulted that her tears weren't for Wyatt. They were for a silly loser with a tiny bouquet of stolen flowers. What Fiona said next stunned everyone. I thought that we would never see each other again. Wyatt couldn't believe what he was hearing. Few people knew how much Fiona had suffered during the past year. Her mother had convinced her that she was doing the right thing, so she'd cut off all contact with Damon. She'd changed her number and her social media accounts. She'd even stopped talking to her friends at Meyerson University. At least, her mother had agreed to let her write that letter to Damon. When she wrote it, she felt as if her heart had been ripped out of her chest. She hadn't known if Damon would get it, and she wondered if she'd ever see him again. Would it be one year, five years, or ten years until they met again? When they finally did, would they still love each other? Fiona was a pessimist. She thought that their feelings would likely fade with passing time. Probably they'd never see each other again. When she thought of this, she felt as if her heart had been cut by a knife. Damon was the reason why she worked so hard to be outstanding. She didn't want him to forget her. If he did, she'd have to win him back. If she was famous, perhaps he'd fall back in love with her when they finally met again. They had both been afraid that their feelings for one another would fade with time. Despite this, Fiona cared more than ever. She'd also fantasized about what it would be like when they finally met. Perhaps she would give him a massage. They could stay in a luxurious hotel room together. Perhaps it would be winter and snow would be falling outside the window. They would keep each other warm. Since she'd left Meyerson, she often wondered how Damon was doing. Fiona had imagined many different scenarios in which they were reunited, but she hadn't imagined this one. At this moment, right when Wyatt was performing his grand romantic gesture, Damon suddenly showed up. He was the one guy who she was willing to give up everything for. Was this some sort of divine intervention? However, her Prince Charming hadn't ridden up on a white horse. He'd just sauntered out of the crowd wearing a smile and holding a meager bouquet of flowers. He was the total opposite of Wyatt. However, at this moment, Fiona was crying. She felt conflicted. Before, she thought that she cared about Damon's social status and his achievements. She hadn't expected him to appear in front of her in such a humble manner. However, when she saw him standing in front of her with his funny little bouquet of flowers, she suddenly realized that those other things weren't important to her. 
Perhaps to other people, he looked like a loser. Next to Wyatt, Damon seemed a little shabby. However, Fiona didn't care. When she saw him standing in front of her, her heart began to sing. For a moment, it was as if time had stopped. Nothing else was important anymore. Damon only had eyes for Fiona, and she only had eyes for him. Damn it! There were no need for words. Everyone, even the most oblivious person, could see who Fiona's heart belonged to, and it wasn't Wyatt. The onlookers cried out in alarm. Could this be her legendary boyfriend? He doesn't look like much. <sighs> look at his puny bouquet. He's ruining everything. Who is that guy? Is she really choosing him over Wyatt? Well, each to their own. I think Wyatt is more handsome. If it were me, I know who I'd choose. Many women were standing up for Wyatt. No matter how they looked at it, Damon couldn't compare. However, this was pointless. Love wasn't rational. Wyatt liked Fiona, but Fiona liked the guy who was holding the tiny bouquet of flowers. Mia and Janice watched in astonishment. They didn't say anything. They hadn't thought that Damon would dare to confess his love to Fiona. They thought that he was just joking. However, he'd done it. Surprisingly, Fiona seemed to care about him a lot. This completely blew their minds. Wyatt was in a pitiful situation. He was down on one knee with flowers in his hands. However, Fiona wasn't looking at him. She was looking at Damon. Wyatt felt like a clown. He wanted to crawl into a hole. This was too embarrassing. The surrounding students were shocked, but at the same time, they felt bad for Wyatt. This was really too tragic. <sighs> Despite the fact that he was tall, rich, and handsome, he still wasn't going to get the girl. There were no more fireworks. Wyatt's friends all watched with open mouths. This wasn't right. They'd imagined many possible reasons why Fiona might reject Wyatt's proposal. For example, she might say that she needed to prioritize her studies or that she'd been hurt before and couldn't love again. If this had happened, then they could have tried to reason with her. They were sure that they'd be able to convince her. Everyone would go home happy. Wyatt and Fiona would go out to dinner together and they'd live happily ever after. However, none of that happened. Damon had come out of left field. What the hell was going on? I tried to look for you, Damon explained. I asked Gwen, Maddie, and Tara, but they said that you'd cut off all contact. Despite this, he hadn't given up. He was determined and he finally found her. Tears streamed down Fiona's face. She had so much that she wanted to say. However, she didn't know where to start. It was only at this moment that she remembered Wyatt, who was still kneeling on the ground. The roses looked beautiful in the candlelight, but Wyatt's face was red with anger and embarrassment. She had only one word for him. Sorry. At this moment, Wyatt felt his heart breaking. He wanted to play it cool and say that it was fine, but he was so upset that he couldn't say anything. If it wasn't for the fact that there were so many people around, he would have cursed out loud. However, Fiona didn't bother with him. Instead, she fixed her gaze on Damon. Although there were still tears at the corners of her eyes, her expression had softened. Neither Damon nor Fiona said anything. Then, before everyone's eyes, he took her hand and they walked off together. After the couple left, Wyatt threw the roses in his hand onto the ground. After that, he started kicking his flower arrangement. After destroying the heart, he turned and left without a word. Wyatt had put a lot of effort into preparing a grand romantic gesture for Fiona, but Damon swooped in and stole his thunder. It was obvious to everyone that Fiona still had feelings for him. Damon took her hand and they left the crowd behind. They had a lot to talk about, but neither knew where to start. Today hadn't gone as expected. The onlookers watched as Damon and Fiona walked off into the distance together. However, the two weren't as close as they used to be. They felt as if there was an invisible barrier between them. After all, it had been a long time. You don't blame me for ruining your moment today, do you? Damon asked tentatively. However, he had to admit that he was glad that she'd rejected Wyatt. Fiona shook her head and an indescribable smile appeared on her face. How could I blame you? I should be thanking you. I don't like him. You being there gave me a good excuse to turn him down. After saying this, Fiona gave him a long, hard look. Damon seemed taller than she remembered. She hadn't seen his smile for a long time. His eyes were still as bright as stars. Even when he didn't speak, he still made her heart beat faster. She sized him up and he sized her up. To him, she was even more beautiful and moving than before. Additionally, she was even more stunning in person than in her photo. It was no wonder that she attracted so much attention. How have you been? Damon asked awkwardly. Clearly, he felt uncomfortable. They used to have an intimate relationship, but now they were like strangers. I have a good life here, she replied hesitantly. Was she doing well? She didn't know. Damon felt a slight pain in his heart, but he quickly smiled. All right, that's good, that's good. 
I won't have to worry about you anymore. He paused. Oh, hey, I heard that you were performing at Carnegie Hall. Is that true? Oh, yes. Her face lit up when she heard this. The upcoming performance was undoubtedly an affirmation of her success. This was her biggest achievement to date. Congratulations, you've come a long way since leaving Meyerson. Fiona nodded and accepted his praise. Since she didn't say anything, Damon didn't know how to respond. He felt a little awkward. Finally, he mustered his courage and asked the question that he'd been dying to ask. Earlier, you said that you have a boyfriend. Is it true? Actually, I lied before. Gwen gave me your phone number and I called you one time. When you picked up, I heard a guy in the background. You didn't realize it was me and you hung up. His question was so sudden that Fiona didn't know how to answer. She saw the disappointed expression on his face. She knew that from his point of view, her silence was undoubtedly an admission. Actually, Damon had asked her this because he was hoping that she'd say, aren't you my boyfriend? However, in the end, she didn't say this. So, do you have a boyfriend? She lowered her head. He couldn't see her expression, but the answer was clear. Damon forced a smile. Then, I wish you too well. If you found a guy who was even more outstanding than me, then I'm happy for you. Damn it, what luck, he cursed to himself, but he knew he had to pretend to be happy for her. He didn't want to lose face. Actually, he should have known that it was impossible for them to get back together. Fiona's mother opposed their relationship and she'd succeeded at breaking them up. This meant that the two of them couldn't be together. However, Damon still had feelings for Fiona. Did she feel the same? He didn't know. He even wondered whether she had ever truly loved him. He'd firmly believed that they were meant to be together, but now he was confused. Damon was the one who had taken initiative to come and find her. He had thousands of things that he wanted to tell her. He wanted to prove that he was worthy of her love. However, when he saw her expression, he decided against it. After all, he already had his answer. As time passed, her feelings for him faded. Now he realized that it was impossible for them to get back together. He hesitated for a while and then reluctantly said, Then I should get going. There's something I have to do. Surprisingly, Fiona didn't want him to leave. She tried to convince him to stay. Why don't we go and get something to eat? Forget it. Fiona tried to persuade him to stay, but he found this even more painful. From the tone of her voice and the expression on her face, he could tell that she was just being polite. When he turned to leave, he felt conflicted. He suddenly remembered the run that they'd gone on together on the mountain behind the university. Later, they quarreled and Fiona left. However, in the end, she'd come and asked him to get back together with her. She'd said that she couldn't let him go. At that time, he was touched. Now he was hoping that the same thing would happen. He wanted her to run over and hug him. He wanted her to say that she couldn't bear to let him go. Then the two of them would reconcile. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. Damon walked away into the night and he didn't hear her follow. She didn't even try to persuade him to stay. It seemed that their relationship was really over. However, he didn't know what she was thinking at the moment. In fact, Fiona had actually wanted to go out to eat with him she wanted to chase after him and tell him how she really felt. But in the end, reason defeated her. Unless her mother changed her mind, their relationship didn't stand a chance. Karen didn't think that Damon was worthy of her daughter. Fiona knew that her mother didn't like him. No matter how successful he was, Karen would never change her mind. Fiona knew that if she and Damon got back together, her mother would do everything she could to break them up again. Damon was a talented young man, but in the end, he wasn't so outstanding that her mother would see him in a different light. Fiona still had feelings for him, but she didn't have the strength to defy her mother. That's why she'd compromised and agreed to come to DC. She didn't have the courage to fight Karen. She was protecting herself and Damon the only way she knew how. Damon finally got to see Fiona again after more than a year. The next day, news about what happened went viral on campuses across DC. Some loser had swooped in and stolen Wyatt's thunder ruining his grand romantic gesture. In the end, Fiona had chosen this nobody instead of the dreamboat. People didn't know that Fiona and Damon's relationship was complicated. They simply discussed what they'd seen. Countless videos and jokes about that night were circulating online. Everyone knew all the details about the loser who'd stolen Fiona's heart with a tiny bouquet of flowers. When Fiona saw him, she got extremely excited. That proved that they knew each other. Could he be her legendary boyfriend? Who was he? Some people even speculated that the guy was actually just pretending to be low-key and humble. Perhaps in reality, he was incredibly rich. Other people said that he actually was just a loser. Some people even swore that they'd seen him at a construction site moving bricks. There were many rumors about him. A few people had heard that he was actually a student at Meyerson University. Apparently, he'd aced his SATs. 
This rumor was said to be based on fact, but there was no way to verify it. People couldn't believe that this guy had actually defeated Wyatt, who was a top student at Georgetown. It was undoubtedly a great humiliation. Countless students at Georgetown were upset. How had this loser won out over someone so rich and handsome? It wasn't right, and it was driving people crazy. There was no way to squash the rumors. Everyone was talking about it. After all, it was a huge slap in the face to Wyatt. The news that Fiona and Damon had left together quickly became a hot topic of discussion. People guessed that they'd gone to get a room together. This thought disappointed Fiona's countless admirers. They couldn't stand the thought of her being with that loser. Since Janice knew Damon, countless women began asking her about him. They wanted insider information. Janice was in her dorm chatting with Mia and a few other friends. A woman named Daphne asked, Janice, I heard that you know that guy. Is he really the son of a powerful CEO? Another woman whose name was Pippa tugged one of the corners of Janice's sleeve and asked, Someone told me that he's a construction worker. Is that true? Janice shook her head. He studies at Myerson University and he aced his SATs back in high school. Wow, her friends exclaimed. Then Pippa followed up. Is he really the son of a big CEO? Janice shook her head. I don't know him very well, but as far as I know, his parents are just ordinary folks. They don't have much money. Oh, her friends were very disappointed. So he really was a nobody. After thinking about this for a moment, Pippa went on. Hey, why does Fiona have such bad taste? How could she fall in love with a guy like that? In my opinion, Wyatt is 10,000 times better. Although Damon was a student at Myerson University and he'd aced his SATs, Wyatt was a top student at Georgetown. Not only was he rich, but he was also handsome. Additionally, he was the lead singer in a rock and roll band. Apparently, he was also a star player on the basketball team. Not only was he smart, but he was also wealthy. He had Damon beat. However, Fiona had chosen Damon instead. Mia, on the other hand, stood up for Damon. Actually, I think Janice's friend is quite handsome. He's my type. They'd hung out a few times now, and she had a good feeling about him. Pippa rolled her eyes at Mia. No matter how handsome he was, he wasn't better looking than Wyatt. Hmm. Soon, Pippa and Daphne posted their discoveries about Damon online. After that, the news spread to many different campuses. Wyatt's friends and admirers caught wind of it as well. People criticized Fiona for her decision. Everyone assumed that she would come to regret her choice. Countless people also messaged to comfort Wyatt. What was so good about Fiona anyway? He deserved better. Fiona had made her choice and now she was stuck with that loser. The school beauty had rejected a tall, rich, and handsome guy, and she was getting a lot of flack. When she returned to her dorm room the next afternoon, she felt that something wasn't quite right. Everyone was watching her. After she checked to make sure that there wasn't anything unusual about her outfit, she asked, Why are you all looking at me like that? Her roommate Florence walked over and looked her up and down. Then Florence took her hand and asked, Beefy, where did you go last night? We were all worried about you when you didn't come back. You were worried about me? Fiona's face turned red. After parting ways with Damon, she'd gotten a hotel room for the night. She hadn't wanted to see anyone. However, seeing her roommate's concerned expressions, she was quite touched to know that they cared so much about her. A few of them noticed her blushing, and they felt that she was holding something back. Florence asked, Beefy, that man isn't really your boyfriend, right? Fiona hesitated and finally nodded. She just hadn't wanted Wyatt to think that she was single. Moreover, Oh, thank God! A roommate named Jojo exclaimed. She'd been listening to their conversation. She shook her head and said resentfully, Beefy, I don't get it. If you don't have a boyfriend, why would you reject an outstanding guy like Wyatt? Why wouldn't you agree to date him? You are really... Jojo trailed off. She was disappointed in her friend. Sadie, who was beside her, chimed in. Jojo is right. What's so special about that guy? He's handsome, but he's not as good looking as Wyatt. Besides, there are many attractive guys at our school. Plus, Wyatt is actually in love with you. Right? Jojo added. Plus, Wyatt said that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with you. Do you know how much effort he put into that gesture yesterday? Oh, he looked so hurt. I feel really bad for him. She looked at Fiona and continued, Why don't you reconsider? Really, he's a great guy. Actually, Wyatt had asked Jojo to put in a good word for him. He was smart, and he knew that if he wanted to win Fiona over, he needed help. So he'd asked her roommate to help convince her. Perhaps Jojo could change her mind. Fiona usually listened to her roommate, so Jojo had thought that convincing her would be a piece of cake. She hadn't expected her to be so stubborn. However, she couldn't force her. However, she thought that Fiona would listen to reason. After all, she was an intelligent woman. It was obvious which man was more desirable. Wyatt had put a ton of effort into organizing his grand romantic gesture. Damon, on the other hand, had only a tiny bouquet of stolen flowers. 
the choice should be a no-brainer.